Halloween is unquestionably the best holiday of all time. You have the pleasant, cool, hoodie weather, costumes and decorations, the 50-foot skeleton from Lowe's that I'm totally going to buy one of these days. There's enough candy to put you into a coma, girls in sexy versions of the most random characters you can think of, and of course, there's horror movies. Films that splatter you with terror and gore and have you on the edge of your seat, either screaming for the main characters or rooting for the slasher. And alongside Halloween as a season, the Halloween film franchise is equally iconic, mostly for its main antagonist, Michael Myers. Not, not that Michael Myers. This Michael Myers. Michael fucking Myers. Fucking isn't actually his middle name, but it should be. The simplest premise that you could think of for a horror movie, a man in a mask with a big knife hunts down and murders his unsuspecting victims, has turned into a cultural phenomenon ever since its first release in 1978. It has spawned what is about to be 12 sequels in the process of over the last 44 years. It single-handedly pumped life into the slasher genre, and about a thousand imitators have popped up along the way since its original creation. Now, I like my horror movies to go as hardcore as they can at times, and I do love monster movies and all that, but sometimes the most simple idea is the most effective. The fact that Halloween takes place in this small little town in Illinois, and is just about some psychopath entering your home at night and killing you, is an absolutely terrifying idea. Any unsuspecting babysitter could fall victim to his madness, and with the silent, stalking nature that Michael is presented to have, well, without any warning, that makes it all the more terrifying. But what about that in itself solidified this franchise as one of the most iconic of all time? In this video, I am going to take you on a trip through Halloween memory lane in a series that I've never done before. Yeah, this video is something that I've had in mind for a very long time and is basically just a massive experiment that will probably fail. And when all is said and done, I will have probably wasted multiple days of my life for almost next to no views. But you know what? That's okay, because sometimes you just need to get something off your chest. And God damn it, I need to talk about Michael Myers and this entire franchise and talk about the highs and the lows of this entire series. And there are many of them. So I'm going to take you through each movie one by one, break it down, analyze what I think works, what I think doesn't, and just generally have a good time with it. I'm not going to go super deep into behind the scenes stuff, as in my channel I usually focus more on storytelling and the narratives, but maybe I just want to talk about how crazy the canon and lore gets for this guy with a white mask and a knife. No, really, it gets way deeper than it ever needs to be, and that's kind of the fun of it. How we slowly strayed away from the original idea and then circled back to it again. I also thought the timing of this video would be good as I wanted to do a specific video for Halloween this season and Halloween Ends is coming out this October and I will be including that movie in this video as well. Luckily, it's the last movie. Well, it probably won't be the last movie before it gets continued or rebooted again, but it's the last film to review since I'll be going in order. So I'll be spending through September and October working on this and then hopefully be ready for Halloween ends when it comes out and then be able to release the video. Before I get into any of that, though, or even get into the first film, I do have a couple more things to mention. Okay, so like I said, this is a video that I've been wanting to do for a very long time. Every year when fall sets in, the leaves start falling, I hear the crunch underneath my feet, I'm shoving a bunch of Reese cups in my face, and I'm watching a bunch of horror films. I keep thinking about how much I want to make this video, and I decided that this is the year that you are getting my full analysis breakdown of the entire Halloween franchise. And I know this might be weird to say, but... I was such a huge fan of the story of the Halloween movies when I was younger. Halloween has always stood out to me. It has been my favorite horror franchise ever since I was young, ever since I was first getting into horror movies. Back when I was like 13 years old, I all of a sudden just had the hankering to get into as much vile, fucked up, crazy movies as I possibly could. And so I went, I ran the gamut and I watched through all of the old school horror movies that I could possibly find, all the old Wes Craven stuff, Hills Have Eyes, Last House on the Left, um, you know, People Under the Stairs, all of that stuff, obviously the Nightmare on Elm Street series, the Friday the 13th series, uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, all that stuff. But for some reason, uh, even though I love all of those movies and I love the, the franchises of those movies, for some reason the Halloween franchise stood out to me. And I think the reason why it did is because 
I felt like it had like a thread line throughout most of the movies. Now, there are various timelines, and we're going to get into that in a moment here, but uh, throughout at least, you know, Halloween 1, 2, 4, 5, and 6, I felt like I was watching a journey happen, like something I was discovering along the way. And I realized that now as an adult that like the sequels, nothing ever will, of course, compare to the original film. The original film is a masterpiece. It's a 10 out of 10. And I I'm not going to ever deny that or ever take anything away from it. And I have a lot to say about the original film, but it delves into concepts after that that are a lot different than what the original film was intended with just a guy in a white mask stalking babysitters, right? Uh, but then as it went further, it was Michael Myers is going after his family and, you know, then the thorn stuff, which we will get into. Uh, but all of that, I was invested in it, man. And I think the thing that really made it stand out is unlike Friday the 13th and unlike Nightmare on Elm Street and unlike a lot of the other horror film franchises is that Halloween had returning characters film to film. And I, this is something that I thought was really unique about it and I really enjoyed. When you would get to that next movie and Dr. Loomis would show up again, you have this recognizable figure that's been through all the films. Not just the antagonist, not just Michael Myers, but you actually have protagonists. You have you know, more good-natured characters that you see from movie to movie, and it's fun to see how far they get, how far they survive, how long they're willing to go through this, like, how they come back, how they get reinvigorated to face Michael Myers over time, and I really, really like that, and, and it's something that I wish more horror films would do. I wish they would keep protagonists and keep them moving forward. Even in the first Friday the 13th film, uh, the main protagonist that survives, she gets killed in the first, like, two minutes of Friday the 13th Part 2. It's like, come on. Uh, Elm Street, you know, you have um, Nancy. She does come back in Part 3, but then she gets killed. And so, you know, it takes, uh, it takes something out of it when you constantly have to bring in new characters every single time. And also, when you do that... It gets to a point where you're no longer rooting for the protagonist and you're just seeing a whole new group of teenagers, you know, and then you're just waiting for them to die. And I want Michael Myers to kill people. I want to see the kills. I want to stack the body count up. Don't get me wrong. But when you get rid of every returning character and that's a whole bunch of new characters each film, you don't have the same amount of investment as if you watch them go through movie to movie or you watch them grow older or you see, you know, Laurie Strode, you know, become the person that she was was in Halloween H2O and everything that came full circle with that. So it's something about that that I really, really enjoy and appreciate about the Halloween franchise in itself. And also, like I said, it is funny to see something with such a simple premise of a guy stalking babysitters turn into, you know, 13 movies that we're going to have. Halloween Ends is not out yet as of the recording of this moment of the video, but it, it is astounding to me that something so simple can spawn something so great. And that's another, like, inspiring thing, in my opinion, is that, you know, if you're like a, a person that wants to create something or make films or whatever, like... Imagine you just create something to to do for the, the reasons that they did for the original Halloween, where it was like they just needed a horror movie centered around Halloween, had an extremely low budget, try to do something with this, and then John Carpenter just like works his fucking mojo and then all of a sudden creates the most I iconic horror film of all time. And it's not even the only one that he did. He also did The Thing. He also did uh, you know a bunch of other movies, Prince of Darkness. Like He's done so many like, iconic movies. And right before I get into talking about the original 1978 Halloween film, which obviously is the best in the series by far for many, many reasons, before we get into that, I want to take you over to what I like to call the timeline board. All right, I just want to make sure that everybody has their pumpkin spice latte ready before we start this because trust me, you're going to need it because this is absolutely ridiculous. This is the Halloween franchise timeline. And as you can see, it is quite extensive. I'll put an actual graphic on the screen for you guys so you don't have to look at my handwriting and take that for what it is. But I am here to give you a full breakdown of the Halloween timeline as we go along throughout this video. So I'm not going to be spending the entire first portion of the video trying to explain the timeline to you at all. We're going to review some movies. That's what we're here to do. But just for an example and just for sort of to give you guys a graph to see what we're actually working with here, Halloween, the most simple idea that you could possibly come up with, the babysitter murders, right, uh, somehow has spawned not not just 12 sequels since its incarnation, but it also has, as you can see, one of the most complicated timelines for its continuity and its sequels that has ever come across any other horror movie franchise. How does that happen with something as simple as Halloween? I really can't tell you, but that is the reality to it. And if you pay attention here, you can see we have actually one, two, three, four, 
five different timelines within the Halloween franchise. So it's not just sequel after sequel after sequel. We literally have alternate universes, alternate timelines. They don't connect. There is no, you know, Infinity War endgame of the Halloween franchise where they all come together, multiverse of madness. But there should be, and I have an idea for that in the future if they ever did want to decide to do this. Because, look, the Halloween movies have gotten as crazy as they have so far. Why not introduce some dimension hopping and have the fucking original Michael Myers and the Rob Zombie Michael Myers and then the Mask from Halloween 3. And let's throw it all together in one goddamn movie. But before we get to that, let's take a look at what the actual timeline is. So I'll start with what I call the original and, for me, the truest Halloween timeline, which is the original Halloween. We all base it from the original film. So the original film is where it comes from. That's what this is. This is the penultimate movie. It's the only one that really matters. It's where they all spawn from, except for these completely different tangent universes. But yeah, so we have the original Halloween, and of course, then it goes to the sequel, Halloween 2. But then in this timeline, we go down to Halloween 4. Halloween 5, and then Halloween 6, and that's the end of that timeline. Hold on, let me interrupt. <laughs> You'll have to excuse my friend here. He's a little slow. So if the Halloween timeline wasn't complicated enough, I wrote the board wrong the first time around, and I didn't notice until I was editing. So I am here to correct one quick little mistake that the second timeline that we'll get to, which is the H2O timeline, I drew coming from the original Halloween, but this is not accurate. It actually takes place after Halloween 2, which is connected into the same timeline. So I'm correcting that now. So if you saw that, I apologize. Obviously, I have not had enough lattes, or maybe I, I had too many. I don't know. But essentially, the second timeline goes Halloween, Halloween 2. Then we go into H2O and, and resur uh, Resurrection. The biggest absolute pile of human feces dog shit that I have ever seen in my goddamn fucking life. The worst movie I've ever watched. Probably the biggest insult to the entire Halloween franchise. A slight against humanity. I'd rather sacrifice my firstborn than to ever watch this movie again. This is a horrible piece of shit that tries to capitalize on the reality TV at the time. And uses probably the greatest ending of a Halloween movie in order to kind of fuck it in the ass. And creates the most ridiculous, unflattering unfulfilling and disgusting end to a franchise ever seen in my goddamn life. So that's the second version. Uh, then, of course, we have the current timeline, which is the movies that we are getting now and that will conclude in Halloween Ends. So that takes the original film and then we jump ahead 40 years. I don't know why they didn't call it Halloween H2020, Halloween 2020. That would have been a scarier movie, actually, focusing on 2020. Jesus Christ. Anyways, that goes to Halloween 2018 because we have to use the same name of the movie, then Halloween Kills, and then Halloween Ends, which is uh, coming out this year, or will be out by the time this video is out. And then, of course, there are the two alternate timelines that have nothing to do with the original movie. Uh, these are, of course, Halloween 3, which stands completely on its own and does not connect to any other Halloween film ever, never since and never prior, just completely its own movie that has nothing to do with anything else. Very interesting. Good movie, actually. And then, of course, there is the Rob Zombie Halloween universe, which is Rob Zombie's Halloween and Halloween 2 uh, from the mid-2000s. And they are definitely a horse of a different breed that we will get to as well. But that is what we're working with here. So, just to give you an idea of what is coming up. But first of all, we got to go back, siphon back to the thing that spawned it all, the absolute original Halloween. So this is my review of the very first Halloween film. Before Halloween became what it is today, it was only meant to be a simple, cheap horror movie with the only premise being a man stalking and killing babysitters to placate to that small suburban town terror. Indie film producers Erwin Yablins and Mustafa Akkad seeked out upcoming filmmaker John Carpenter to take on the role. He had just made a movie called Assault on Precinct 13 that was extremely well made for its budget and they were hoping that he could work some magic on this idea. They came up with the idea that it would take place on Halloween night and that a horror movie centering around Halloween hadn't really hit off with audiences before this point. This also, of course, is influenced by Black Christmas, a slasher film taking place at Christmas time that came out four years prior. So, with this premise and setting and a budget of only $300,000, Carpenter, along with his girlfriend and producer Deborah Hill, began working on a treatment script for what we would come to revere 
as Halloween. John Carpenter himself is a one-of-a-kind director. He's one of the few out there that truly speaks his mind and says F you when he has to. He just overall carries that punk rock attitude and instead of dissipating over time has only increased that with age, which I love. And I think this is totally congruent to the kinds of films that he makes. For Halloween, he knew exactly what style and vibe to go for, using the limited budget to his advantage and doing a slower pace kind of film slowly building up the tension within the first hour, and then having it explode within the final act. He created the killer Michael Myers, someone that wouldn't speak and would be a representation of pure evil, stalking and lurking in the shadows and then attacking quick, violent, and efficiently. A child that murdered his sister when he was young and was sent to a mental institution until the day he broke out on Halloween. He refers to Michael as the shape, both in the script and in the credits of the film, and it was a way to show that Michael was more of a concept than a character. He is the boogeyman. It's never explained why Michael killed his sister, at least not in the original, but it doesn't need to be explained. Not knowing the whys and the hows of Michael is what makes it so much more disturbing. It's the fear of the unknown or that something about him is beyond human understanding. How can someone kill with a straight face? How can he stare at a wall for 15 years and then return to killing? Why is he stalking the babysitters and how can he take so much damage including being shot and then just keep on coming? It's these things that make him scary not knowing and not understanding him. Alongside that is Michael's look, a plain jumpsuit with no distinguishing marks and just a plain white mask. Which obviously, as every Halloween video needs to mention, the mask was actually a reworking of a William Shatner Star Trek mask. They were both working on a lower budget and wanted something humanish, yet still feels off, so obviously William Shatner was the way to go. They grabbed a mask that looks basic, they changed the hair, took off the eyebrows, and spray painted it white. Then we get our iconic Michael Myers mask. And honestly, throughout all the movies, they have never been able to make the mask look as good as it does in the original. Lastly, John Carpenter, the badass that he is, also did the score for the movie, creating the most iconic and legendary horror score of all time, and sometimes I think the music for this movie is just as famous as the movie. Just like Jaws or Star Wars, Carpenter created something synonymous with the property, and it's used in every single movie. If you had a movie in the Halloween series and it didn't use this theme, it just wouldn't make any sense and it wouldn't feel like Halloween. Carpenter is really big into the synth style of music, and he's made scores for other films of his as well, and he's even reworked and remixed his own Halloween themes plenty of times. And they're all great. But anyway, let's get into the film. It begins in 1963 and has one of the best opening scenes in horror. After, of course, the title sequence with the iconic theme and the slow zoom in on the jack-o'-lantern, we have a POV shot of the killer as he slowly stalks his first victim. I think the constant credit to give the first Halloween is how much you can make something from nearly nothing. Taking the low budget in stride, there are many of these long, lingering shots that work to both give the movie a runtime, but also to establish a ridiculous amount of suspense. This works best imagining that we as the audience have no idea whose vision we are seeing at this moment. Someone who sneaks around and into a house, grabs a mask and a knife, and makes his way upstairs to see a topless chick in her room combing her hair. Kudos to Carpenter for putting both tits and blood within the first five minutes of the movie. That's my kind of guy. But anyways, after the killer stabs her several times and makes his way outside, there is the reveal when the mask comes off that this is actually just a little boy. Not some deranged older psychopath, but an unsuspecting, average, nothing special boy. That's what helps make the Michael Myers thing so scary. It's that anybody could be a killer and kill for any reason. That even in an unsuspecting town, someone next door could just decide to grab a knife and fuck somebody else up. It also adds to the idea of local legends and the lore of a small town. Many small towns have that story of that one horrible thing that happened many years ago. Michael becomes sort of a local legend, even as a small child, simply because something like this doesn't and shouldn't happen, especially in a place like Haddonfield. 
We then cut to 15 years later in 1978. So if you want to keep track of Michael's age through the franchise, Child Michael was only six years old. 15 years later puts him at 21 in this movie. So he can legally drink. But actually it was 1978. So I think the, the age was 18. I don't know. We meet our first protagonist, Dr. Loomis, played by Donald Pleasance. And this guy is the GOAT. Dr. Loomis is pretty much hands down the best Halloween character. He's Michael's psychiatrist and someone that has tried to reach him and understand him over these last 15 years. And his final conclusion on Michael is that he is just unadulterated evil. That there is nothing behind Michael's eyes except darkness. And he does everything in his power to try to keep Michael locked up and, oh shit, Michael escaped. On Halloween Eve, Michael escapes the sanitarium and stealthily scares the shit out of Loomis's nurse. Her name is Marion Chambers, and she's not super important to this movie, but she does show up in way more sequels than you'd think she would. Anyways, I also love that this Michael escaping scene, and I think that the shots where you barely see him in the medical gown are actually pretty scary. Oh, and then we have the question of Michael stealing a car. Michael was in an asylum the entire adolescent years of his life, so how did he learn to drive? Look, if you really want to try to explain it, I would just say, because he's Michael fucking Myers. How can he lift up a man one-handed? How can he survive a knife to the neck? How can he survive getting shot six times? He just can. He's Michael fucking Myers. So yeah, he can also drive a car. Afterwards, we cut back to Haddonfield, Illinois, and we get to experience Halloween Day, mostly all through the perspective of Laurie Strode, played by Jamie Lee Curtis. Look, I think Jamie Lee Curtis is a great actor, and from everything I've seen behind the scenes, she has a wonderful personality off screen too. Her character Lori in this movie, in just the first film, is meant to be your average innocent high school girl. She's responsible as a babysitter, she's helping her dad who's a realtor, and there's not really a whole lot to say about her beyond that. She's just kind of average, and she's meant to be. Anyways, Michael's presence is felt through every scene, and every moment. The stalking nature of him and how he seems to be behind every window, across the street, behind the hedges, it's like he's got to town, he's scoped it out, and he's deciding who his victims will be. Then he spends all day meticulously following them around during their daily activities. The dialogue between Lori and her friends is definitely, or should I say totally, cheesy, but we don't really care as the audience. Go ahead and talk about boys and the school dance that we'll never see because it's not going to matter in a few hours. There's also this little boy named Tommy Doyle that Laurie is babysitting for. He's getting picked on at school and stalked by Michael as well. And being a little kid that he is, he's more receptive to the idea of the boogeyman and believing in and feeling the presence of Michael more so than the other characters around want to. Basically, the two main girls besides Lori are all trying to maneuver their evening so that they can get the most benefit out of banging their boyfriends and not actually having to babysit. But they're not bad people, they're just teenagers. So it makes sense, and if any of the three had foresight of what could possibly happen tonight, I'm pretty sure they would make different choices. I also like to think throughout the movie that you get little clues as to what Michael has been doing in the background. Whether it's the dead mechanic that Loomis finds on his way to Haddonfield or the hardware store that had the stolen mask and knives, or even the graveyard where the grave of Michael's sister, Judith Myers, was literally pulled from the ground and stolen. But when nighttime sets in, that's when the movie really gets going. Many times in this movie, there's this sound effect of Michael breathing heavy under the mask, and it's a choice that only the first movie has ever done. He's still a silent character, but only in this movie do we hear the breathing, especially when he makes his first kill. To me, there's something extremely effective and creepy about this, and I never understood why they didn't bring it back after this movie. His first victim here is Annie, friend of Laurie Strode and the daughter of Sheriff Brackett. Brackett has several interactions with Dr. Loomis and seems to be the only cop in Haddonfield that takes Loomis kind of remotely seriously, but still not very much. They go investigate the Myers house, finding evidence that somebody was there, and Loomis gives probably the best scene and monologue in the movie, recounting his experience with Michael and his devil eyes. Michael's next kill involves Linda and her boyfriend. Luckily, Michael is a nice guy, and he waits for them to finish having sex before killing them. See, he's a lot more considerate than you think he is. He kills her boyfriend by darting out of the shadows, lifting him up by one hand, and pinning him to the wall with a knife. Then we get this nice slow head turn as Michael inspects his handiwork. It's this little moment that adds to the creepiness of it. 
It's well known that Michael was played by a couple of different actors during the first movie, but the most notable one is Nick Castle, and to this day, he's mostly credited with the way that Michael moves and walks, the stiff and slow, almost childlike movements to him. Then Michael goes upstairs with a sheet over his head, something that always amused me, but also something they only did in this movie, and then he chokes out Linda with the phone cord. It totally sucked for her, I'm sure. The final act of the movie is Laurie Strode finding the bodies of her friends and then running for her life from Michael. This amazing shot where Michael's mask is barely visible coming out of the darkness, it, it, it's just perfect. It really makes him feel like an entity, like the shape rather than a person. And I think everything Laurie does makes sense. She runs back to the house that she was at because she's babysitting the two kids that were there and she's responsible for them. Her first priority is to make sure that they're safe. But Michael follows her back, and they have several struggles. She manages to stab him once, but he gets back up. She gets the kids out of the house and tries to hide in the closet. He finds her. She stabs him again, in the eye, but he gets back up. And I think Lori does everything that an average 17-year-old girl could do here. I mean, this is 1978. She doesn't have a cell phone she can just call the police with. She runs, she protects the kids, she desperately tries to stab him when she can. It's just, she's facing Michael fucking Myers here. And funny enough, even though Laurie and Dr. Loomis are both protagonists of the movie, they only ever meet in the final two minutes. Loomis sees the kids running away, hears the screams, and rushes in to take on Michael himself. He fires six shots into him and knocks Michael off the balcony, but oh wait, when he looks over the edge... Michael's body is nowhere to be seen. The John Carpenter score kicks in, we hear the heavy breathing once more, and we see shot after shot of locations of where he could be, but we don't know. The movie ends with the fear of a man that can't be killed and could be anywhere. So honestly, my favorite takeaway of the very first Halloween movie is how you can do something with nothing. I think it is absolutely inspiring because all this movie was ever meant to be was just a low-budget horror film that was meant to make a bit of a profit. A horror film that took place on Halloween. A horror film about a psycho killer. That's all it was meant to be. Very low budget. And this is what Carpenter was able to come up with, man. He created something that has literally stood the test of 40 plus years of time and will go on further into the future. You know, 100 years from now, people will be talking about Halloween. And I think it is so inspiring because so many people think when they're trying to create something that they have to have the best of everything before they can even start. I have to have the best equipment. I have to have the best editing software. I have to have the best whatever. I can't start yet. I can't do it. And you don't. All you need is a camera and someone to stand in front of it and wear a creepy mask. Like, Carpenter just made it work. He made it happen. And he didn't have any long-term plans. He wasn't creating a franchise or multiple timelines or multiple universes. He was just creating one really good movie. And he was focusing on making a good movie. And I think that's one thing, too, that kind of sucks nowadays because everything is trying to be a franchise. And when they're making one specific movie, they don't focus on trying to make that movie the best that it can possibly be because they're always thinking, well, we could spin off into this and then we could do this version and we could have this movie. And then it just kind of gets lost in the shuffle because what you're trying to do is create a universe rather than trying to create a movie. And I think that's one of the main problems that we have. Now... Halloween ultimately did go on to become a franchise, which I'm going to be talking about in the rest of this video. I don't know how long this video is going to be, but I hope you're down for the ride with me. We're definitely going to have to get ourselves multiple pumpkin spice lattes in order to reach the end of this video. But after the success of the first Halloween, obviously they wanted to make more. And Carpenter's involvement kind of steadily decreases over the years, but we'll get into that Real quick before I get into it though, I do want to say that I need to mention the TV edit version of Halloween. Uh, so if you guys don't know, when it played on TV, it needed to fit the two-hour time slot, and they already had to edit particular things out of the movie for things that you can't show on TV, like obviously the little bit of nudity there is, some of the gore. I don't really know what all of the rules were for TV channels back then, but some of it had to be cut out. And so the movie was even shorter than 90 minutes, but it had to fill two hours with commercials, you know, so they needed some more scenes 
to go into the movie. They need to make it longer. So while they were filming Halloween 2, or I believe maybe it was reshoots for Halloween 2, Carpenter actually came up with some extra scenes. And they're not really good. There's another scene between the girls together. There's uh, another scene of Loomis trying to convince them to keep Michael Myers locked up. Honestly, the extra scenes don't really add anything to the movie, so that's why I didn't talk about them in the review proper, because there wasn't really anything worth going into. Uh, the only scene that might be worth mentioning is they did add a scene with Michael Myers as a child, uh, which relates more to the relationship between him and Loomis, and then it shows the same room Michael was in after he had escaped, and he wrote the word sister on the door. Now, that does work in perfect context with the original movie because he did kill his sister originally. Perhaps he's just in there thinking about it. Perhaps he's just in there thinking about how much he hated watching her comb her hair naked. I don't know what it was, but he killed the shit out of her, right? So maybe he's still thinking about it 15 years later. Now, some of you also might be wondering, well, isn't uh, isn't Laurie Strode Michael Myers' sister? Ooh, all right, and so this is where the Halloween timeline just goes crazy, man. So from this point forward, we are going to have a massive back and forth with Laurie Strode and her relationship with Michael Myers. In the first movie, the original intent was that Michael Myers was simply stalking babysitters. He, he went to town, he found some people he was interested in, he stalked them, he killed them, and... The motivations behind Michael killing are not there purposely because it's supposed to be scary to not know what drives somebody to kill, why he would want to. And Michael doesn't even seem to get any sort of gratification from killing. It seems like this is just something he likes to do. Or maybe not even something he likes to do, just something he does. Like, he just kills people. That's his thing. Uh, and there's no rhyme or reason to it. He just finds a victim and decides to kill them. And that's what Michael Myers does in the original film. However, as the movies kept going and the original, the first timeline, which is this one right here, Halloween 2, 4, 5, and 6 after the original, in the original timeline, they consistently came up with more and more reasons as to why Michael did what he did as the sequels went along. And the very first thing that they would have added, which I will get into in Halloween 2, is creating more of a connection between Michael and Laurie retroactively making Lori Michael Myers' sister. And uh, that is something that uh, was never attended from the very get-go. But now going back to the added scenes that they put in, if you want to look at those added scenes since they were filming Halloween 2 at the time, it adds more context to Halloween 2 because now you can envision it as he's writing sister because that's who he's planning to go to Haddonfield to kill. Um, in the original flashback in the first Halloween movie, we only see his older sister and we see what we assume is his parents as they get home. We never see a younger sister. We, we, it, she would have to be a baby at the time or, or pretty close to or like a two-year-old basically. Uh, never see her, never mentioned, never talked about, doesn't exist in the first movie, does not exist at all. Uh, it's something they add in moving forward and overall, I... I have mixed feelings about it. I do really like it in some ways because when I was growing up and I was getting into horror movies, this was the version of the franchise I was attached to. I didn't just like the first movie. I liked the entire Halloween series. Um, so this is, this is something that I just have always been aware of. I think even before I just got into the Halloween movies, I always just thought, oh yeah, Laurie Strode is Michael Myers' sister. That's just common knowledge. That's just natural knowledge, right? Uh, and he, she is for most of the movies. But I think getting into Halloween 2 or segueing from Halloween 1 to Halloween 2, it is the main thing that we need to talk about because it is the biggest shift in the franchise. It is the thing that legitimately changes everything about Halloween because not only does it give motivation to Michael Myers, now he's not just killing victims, now he's trying to kill his sister, they push it even further as the sequels go because it starts to become Michael doesn't just want to kill his sister, but he wants to kill his entire family, his entire lineage. And then it goes even further than that and it becomes some weird occult thing. But let's take it one step at a time <laughs> and let's get into Halloween 2 and talk about what happens with the very first sequel to Halloween. 
With the success of the original Halloween, it made sense that they would want to make a sequel, especially since both the protagonist, Laurie and Loomis, and of course Michael Myers, were all still alive. The only person that didn't want to do it was John Carpenter, the mastermind behind why the first film works so well. He thought he said everything that he wanted to say with that movie, and instead didn't want to get locked into doing the same thing over and over. He was looking to make many different kinds of films, though he stayed within the horror genre plenty of times. His next film was The Fog, and from there he would go on to make other legendary movies like Escape from New York and The Thing. However, due to some rights issues and even a bit of a lawsuit at play, producer Erwin Yablins locked Carpenter into being involved with Halloween 2. So a bit of a compromise was made. Carpenter would go and direct The Fog first, and then he would come back and write the screenplay for Halloween 2, but he didn't want to direct it. Instead, the directing duties went to Rick Rosenthal, and he does a pretty decent job at trying to keep the aesthetic of the first movie, but of course, it couldn't really be captured completely. Now, I can see how this setup and drama might make it seem like Halloween 2 was a recipe for disaster, but honestly, it's not a bad movie at all. It grew quite the cult following over the years, and it has a lot of entertaining moments. Now, it's nowhere near the masterpiece of the first movie, but taken as is, it's a pretty decent and standard horror film for the time. The best thing about Halloween 2 is that it literally picks up right where the first movie left off. It takes place on the same night, and because of that, if you watch 1 and 2 back to back, it can feel like one long story, which I appreciate. It opens with Loomis rushing downstairs and outside to try to locate Michael's body. I love when a neighbor comes out. Like, for some reason, this neighbor never heard the screams and cries of Lori inside, but when Loomis comes out, he's like, Hey man, keep it down. I've been trick-or-treated to death all night. <laughs> As if handing out candy is so super exhausting, you would just pass out and not even hear somebody screaming. I don't know. This moment always made me laugh. But once again, the Lori and Loomis storylines are separated. Lori is rushed off to the hospital where the majority of the movie takes place, and I think it works well because hospitals in general can definitely be a very scary setting. I like how everything is very dimly lit, and when Michael arrives to the hospital, it feels like he could literally be down any hallway or any stairwell. Meanwhile, Loomis teams back up with the cops and Sheriff Brackett to look for Michael. The most ridiculous thing is when they think they see Michael, but... It's just some guy in a costume. Which, okay, they said in the first movie that Michael stole a mask from some store, so I get how another guy would be wearing the same mask, but how is the guy also wearing a blue jumpsuit? That's oddly specific. Like, who is he supposed to be dressing up as? But it doesn't matter, because moments later, he gets hit by a car and slammed into a van, and the whole thing fucking explodes! Why was this so aggressive? The cop states that he didn't see him, so why was the cop going so fast? He just decided to slam into a van? It's so unnecessary. And it gets even funnier, because the identity of this person is a guy named Ben Tramer, who, in the first movie, there is a throwaway line that Lori had a crush on a guy in school named Ben Tramer. So the guy that Lori was crushing on somehow literally dressed up as the man that was trying to stalk and kill her, who also is going to be her brother. And if it isn't enough that Lori's three friends got killed this night, now also her high school crush is accidentally completely eviscerated. This is so ridiculous. Meanwhile, back at the hospital, Lori in this movie, unfortunately, has next to nothing to do. She doesn't really develop as a character. She doesn't really have that much dialogue. Mostly, she's just laying in a room talking to a new character named Jimmy, who seems like he's meant to be a love interest of some sort, but it just comes off as very awkward. I mean, the girl just survived a murder. It's not really the time or place to be macking on her. Also, this relationship goes nowhere because he's completely forgotten about in the later half of the film. We do get to hang out with some of the hospital staff, though, and these are just our bodies waiting to be killed off. There is this one perverted guy named Bud that sings about wanting a nurse to sit on his face, and I relate to him the most, probably. He even gets naked in the hot tub with her later, but before they can go for it, Michael shows up and kills them both. This time, Michael didn't wait for them to have sex. I guess he only lets one couple do that per night. The kills in this movie are a lot more graphic than in the first. They're still not anything compared to today's standards, but the first movie, the kills were very quick, and there was only three of them. Well, four if you count Michael's sister in the beginning. 
But here in this movie, as per the rules of sequels, the body count is ramped up and the ways in which Michael kills people get more vicious. And this is a staple of the genre. Every movie has to push the envelope a little bit further. And I'm all for seeing some epic kills, but you do have to admit that it does lose a little bit from the simplicity of the original. And of course, we have to talk about the plot twist, the thing that ultimately changed Halloween for the next 20 plus years, making Laurie Strode Michael's younger sister. It starts with Dr. Loomis finding the word Samhain, or as he says, Sam Hain, written on the wall. Also, what's with Michael writing things on walls? There was also the word sister that was put into the extended TV version of the first movie I talked about earlier. It's like he gets bored in between murders and then just starts writing clues as to his methods on the wall like he's the fucking Riddler or something. Anyways, this is the beginning of a larger concept that would be expanded on in the upcoming sequels, but Samhain relates to the original pagan festival that a lot of the Halloween traditions are based on and leads into Michael being a true embodiment of evil, some kind of curse that perpetuates and has this unrelenting drive to murder his family. We'll get more into that later, but it's a bit of a double-edged sword because it does take a lot away from the fear of the unknown of the original Halloween, but they do wind up doing some really cool things with this concept along the way, and though in this movie it feels like an ass pull, in the future movies it really kind of works, so you're either along for the ride or you're not. Dr. Loomis's nurse shows back up here. See, I said she would be in the other movies. And she explains about the missing files that Lori is related to Michael, but her identity was changed when she was adopted in order to protect her. Then, as Loomis is being escorted away by a cop, he literally holds a police officer at gunpoint to make him drive to Lori at the hospital. This is wild. Like, okay, this police officer winds up getting killed by Michael later on, but that was the only option you could do with him, because if this cop lived, they could literally arrest Loomis and lock him away for the rest of his life. So, if anything, Loomis should be thanking Michael Myers for offing this police officer and allowing Loomis to still be a free man to this day. The finale of this movie is probably the cheesiest part. So, Loomis shows up at the hospital, he tries once again to stop Michael, then he's stabbed with a scalpel. Then Lori gets a gun and she fires two shots and somehow she shoots both of Michael's eyes out. How the fuck did she do that? Is Lori Strode secretly like a John Wick clone? Like the precision and accuracy you would have to have to shoot both of his eyes out is completely off the charts. Why isn't she joining the military like right now? But with bloody eyes, the worst thing that this movie does is have Michael just slowly swing the scalpel back and forth. It makes him look so weak and pathetic. Like, why is he going so slow? He knew where Lori was at. Just, just walk forward with the knife. I don't understand. Lori isn't even moving, so he could just stab her. Well, anyways, Loomis and Lori let loose the oxygen tanks, and Lori runs from the room as Loomis takes out a lighter and blows them both the fuck up. The great final shot of Michael on fire walking out of the room and then passing out onto the floor as he burns away has always been an iconic image that is forever in my mind. It ends with Lori being taken away in an ambulance, I guess to a non-blown up hospital, and the movie starts to fade out playing the song Mr. Sandman. So yeah, believe it or not, Halloween 2 was actually meant to be the finale of the entire Michael Myers storyline. So the twist of them being siblings doesn't really matter too much because that was the end. When you see Michael's corpse there burning on the floor and you see his mask sort of burning away, that was meant to be the very last time that you would see him. And it makes sense for a lot of reasons. Number one, John Carpenter, Deborah Hill, they didn't really want to be involved with the second movie anyways. They kind of got locked into it. So they wrote a definitive end in their script. This is the end of the story. That was what was meant to happen. That also, and a lot of other films at the time, took what Halloween did, took it and ran with it, especially Friday the 13th. So you had a lot of movies that were very similar to the concept within the slasher genre that were doing the same things that Halloween was doing. And so a lot of people like John Carpenter and Deborah Hill wanted to remove themselves from the property and say that that was it, that was it, that was the definitive ending and Halloween 2 is it and there's no need for any other Halloween film. But of course, we have 10 more movies to get through. No, 11 more movies to get through. I guess 10 more that include Michael Myers, so I wasn't technically wrong. But I was wondering the proper way to continue this video because when thinking about how I wanted to format this video, there's actually a couple of ways that I could do it. I could essentially go through each Halloween timeline as one segment 
and then go to the next timeline. Or I could review the movies in order of release. And when you get to Halloween 3, this is where I kind of have to decide which route I want to take. Because if I want to stay within the storyline of the movies that we've been reviewing so far, I would actually skip Halloween 3 and go right to Halloween 4. That's the way it's supposed to be. Or I guess I could be like really crazy and just start reviewing the new movies or H2O. But I want to keep it as consistent as possible. So it's really a matter of deciding whether or not to skip to Halloween 4 or go to Halloween 3. And I've been thinking about this pretty heavily. And I think what I really want to do is go in the release order. I think it makes the most sense to me because that way you're sort of experiencing the movies the same way that they were meant to be experienced. They came out in that order, so that's the order that you go. And I realize I'm like that with most things. Like if you were talking about the Star Wars movies, you're like, where do you start? You could start with episode one. I'm like, no. You start with fucking A New Hope because that's what it's supposed to be. Those were the first movies. I know it's episode four, but it's the first one that came out, and you're supposed to know all that stuff before you go into the prequel. So I think that the proper thing to do is to just go in the complete release order of all the movies, which means we're taking a break from the first timeline. We got to Halloween 2, and now we are transferring over into an alternate universe of Halloween 3, which ultimately stands alone as its own movie. It is not connected to any other Halloween film, and for good reason. Uh, because they did want to kill Michael Myers off at the end of Halloween 2, but wanted to continue the franchise, the idea or the compromise that John Carpenter and everyone else behind the series that came up with was saying that all of these movies, the movie is called Halloween. The movie is not called Michael Myers. So essentially what you could do with this theme is have a bunch of horror movies that take place centering around the concept of Halloween. And there's so many different things that you could do with that. You know, I always remember the movie Trick or Treat, which came out many years later, but it's a horror anthology uh, movie that takes place on Halloween and you show all the different sort of eras of Halloween like you have the children that have their own story and then you have the young adults that are having their own story and then you have like the old man character who's having his own story and everyone relates to Halloween in a different way especially depending on like what age bracket you're in what kind of social circles you're in like Halloween is a big holiday that can work for virtually anything and so the possibilities were endless you have the theme of Halloween Halloween, incorporate that somehow, but other than that, have fun. And honestly, that is such a fucking cool idea to have. And I kind of wish that we lived in an alternate universe where we could have seen what all of these Halloween movies had to offer. Now, I love Michael Myers, and I am glad that we have a lot more movies about Michael to talk about, uh, especially when we get to four, five, and six. Well, we'll get to six. But anyways, I'm very, very, uh, you know, happy that we live in a world where there is a bunch of movies with Michael Myers. But I really wish I could live in an alternate universe where the remaining Halloween movies were all different concepts and different premises revolving around Halloween itself. I really wonder how far they could have taken it. Trick or Treat could have very well been a Halloween movie in that universe. Uh, so anyways, Halloween 3 comes around. They come up with a concept for it and they create a story that just takes place during Halloween with the theme of Halloween, but has nothing to do with Michael Myers. And in hindsight, that's really fucking weird because Halloween 3 is the only movie that does not have Michael Myers and is con not connected to the rest of the movies at all. So in hindsight, this seems like the most you know bizarre thing ever, and it gets a lot of hate from the fandom uh, or has gotten a lot of hate from the fandom over the years because it's a movie that if you want to watch the story of Michael Myers is completely skippable. You don't need to see Halloween 3 whatsoever. It doesn't fit in with the rest of the movies. It doesn't make any sense. It's not even in continuity because Halloween is a movie within the Halloween 3 universe. So uh, you can't even like adjacently connect it at all because Halloween is a movie. So you're living in this sort of like tangent universe that doesn't make any sense uh, if you want to follow the Michael Myers story. But uh, there is also a good segment of the fan base that actually really like this movie. And honestly, I am in the side of the camp that I think Halloween 3 is fucking awesome. I love Halloween 3. And 
it's probably one of my favorites. I know it doesn't make sense to even compare it because it, it's not connected to the rest. But if I'm going like legitimately, like what are my favorite movies in the franchise? And actually, maybe as part of this video, I'll do a ranking system. I'll do a tier list or something like that. That would be a good idea. We'll we'll start the tier list um, maybe after this movie. After Halloween 3, we'll start the tier list and see how it goes. But uh, yeah, I love it, man. I think it's uh, I think it's ridiculously entertaining. It's it's fun. It's gory. It's just a good horror movie, man. If it's just a good horror movie on its own, and I appreciate it for that. So yeah, um, let's get into talking about Halloween three. Everything good, everything bad, everything weird, and that fucking catchy jingle that will literally never leave my brain, no matter how hard I try. Halloween 3, Season of the Witch. Now, this came out in 1982, which is only one year after Halloween 2. So I can definitely see how it would be very confusing for audience members to remember seeing the end of Halloween 2 and then go into this movie and think, what the fuck am I watching? Also, I believe the trailers and promos for this movie were pretty vague on what they would be getting. So to walk into a Halloween movie and get no Michael Myers, that's a bit disappointing. They also get no witches, and as well, if you're going to see a Halloween movie alone, you probably get no bitches. But the subtitle Season of the Witch actually refers more towards the idea of witchcraft, which does play a part in the movie. Adding supernatural elements into a Halloween movie would show up again eventually, and you could say that Michael Myers himself is kind of supernatural, as he has ridiculous human strength and endurance to the point where he can survive just about anything. But this movie really goes in a totally different direction and is full-on magic, and not just magic, but robots as well. It all begins with a man being chased by some guys in black suits that want him dead for some reason, and he winds up at the hospital where our main protagonist, Dr. Chalice, works. He's played by Tom Atkins, and he's a guy that's a little bit down on his luck. He's had some alcohol issues, he's divorced from his wife, he rarely sees his kids, but hey... He still is an extremely suave man and is constantly hitting on chicks the entire movie. But no, I do like him as a character. He seems like a genuinely good dude that's made a few mistakes in his life and he's just doing his best to work through them and then his life falls into madness. Things go crazy when one of the men in suits show up at the hospital, kill the victim, and then they go into a car and blow themselves up. That's definitely one way to get rid of the evidence, yes. The victim's daughter, Ellie, and Dr. Chalice have some conversations about the strangeness of her father's death, and that he may have been killed because he was finding out some secret information about the company called Silver Shamrock. Ah yes, Silver Shamrock, the one that has the most catchy and stupid song of all time that will be forever stuck in your head every single time that you hear it. They're selling three iconic Halloween masks to the masses and coincide with a big event that will take place on Halloween night on the television, where you need to be sitting in front of the TV as they air some kind of special broadcast. And apparently these masks are all the kids want to wear this year. To be honest, I love the design of these masks and they have become iconic in their own way over the years. Even in future Halloween movies, though they take place in a different timeline, they'll sometimes have characters wearing these masks as a nod and an easter egg reference to Halloween 3. But if you think about it, it's only a skull, a witch, and a jack-o'-lantern. Like, it's not exactly the most creative options you could come up with, but then again, we are dealing with witchcraft, so maybe there's something special in the medallions that help draw the kids to the masks. I don't know, but it's never really explained that way. So Chalice and Ellie take a trip to California to investigate. Yeah, okay, it's a little weird. I, I get that her dad just died and maybe she also has some daddy issues, but I mean, to go on a road trip with an older dude that you never met? Eh, never mind, I guess it happens out there. But for the doctor, sure he's curious, but mostly I think he's just horny. They do get it on later in the movie in a hotel room in the most awkward and boring sex scene that I have ever watched. All he does is just like slowly suck on her boobs. It's it's really weird to watch. And then only after they're done does he ask how old she is. Bro, I'm, I mean, okay, she's clearly an adult, but sometimes, you know, looks can be deceptive. At least ask for her ID or something first, man. Like, it's, come on. Like, what's going to get the doctor first? The killer mask, the killer robots, or Chris Hansen? Oh, yeah, there's robots in this movie. But first, let's break down what's actually going on here. The Halloween masks have a silver shamrock medallion in them that, when this lady tries messing with, it shoots a beam of energy at her, exploding her face! Honestly, this shot of her after her face is 
literally eviscerated is legitimately terrifying. So yeah, evil masks with laser beams and also robots. The Silver Shamrock Company is up to some wild shit. They also stole a stone from Stonehenge. Yeah. And it all leads to their master plan that gets revealed when Chalice and Ellie decide to take a tour of the Silver Shamrock factory, and they're introduced to its mastermind, Colonel Cochran, someone who is planning this Halloween ritual that will bring the horror back to the holiday. He puts on a demonstration, putting another family visiting into a room and playing the TV signal that he plans to air on Halloween night. This activates the tag and the masks, and the kid's entire face is absolutely destroyed under the masks, and then all sorts of bugs, snakes, and vermin start to burst out from his body. It's actually a really cool sequence, and it's probably the most memorable part of the entire movie, but yeah, that's his master plan, to explode kids' heads and evoke some kind of apocalypse of bugs and snakes. I mean, it's cool, I guess, but... He can also build robots. All of his henchmen are fully operational androids that can perfectly pass as human beings. So I don't understand why he's wasting his time with this ritual when he could literally just enter into the sex robot market. I mean, this is 1982. The closest thing people have to sex robots are a corner store blow-up doll. If this guy would just make some chick robots, he could easily be raking in millions by the year. But I guess, you know, the Stonehenge gods are too intimidating and he has to follow their wishes or something. Dr. Chalice is locked in a room and he's forced to watch the original Halloween. Maybe a reminder to the audience of what they expected to get but didn't. But it's also a bit of a bummer because if you ever did want to try to tie this movie in with the other films in some kind of roundabout headcanon way, this scene makes it all but impossible. But anyways, Chalice does manage to escape. He's able to sneak around the facility, he rescues Ellie, and they ruin their plans by activating an entire box of the medallions. Then Stonehenge itself gets very pissed at Cochrane and zaps him away to the bug and snake dimension. Or something, I, I really don't know what happens here. But the weirdest part of the movie is when Chalice is escaping, Ellie attacks him and turns out to be a motherfucking robot also! You're a no shit, Sherlock. When did this happen? If she was a robot from the start, why bring some random guy that has nothing to do with Silver Shamrock straight to the facility where he can fuck up their plans? And if this was built after the time she was kidnapped, not only was that an extremely quick build of a robot that looks exactly like a real human being, but does that mean that the real Ellie is still kidnapped? And if Chalice had sex with her, did he have sex with the human Ellie or did he have sex with the robot Ellie? And if it was the robot Ellie, why again not make sex robots instead of killing kids? I, it's all so confusing. But after Chalice defeats her, he makes his way to a phone and tries to get the TV networks to cancel airing the killing frequency. Somehow this raving madman on the phone is able to get a few stations to turn them off, but one remains. And as the special time hits, as Chalice screams helplessly into the phone, I suppose the apocalypse begins as the credits roll. Look, I know I'm ripping on this movie a bit, but I, I honestly do enjoy it. It is extremely entertaining, it has some great gore moments, and what little involvement John Carpenter had, which was the score, actually elevates this movie so much more. It has a lot of synth, some re-edits of the traditional Halloween theme. It, it's just really great overall. And overall, I think that this movie is super fun, and it's a shame that we never got to see what other kind of crazy Halloween ideas they could have came up with for future movies, but when people went to see this one, they really wanted Michael Myers, they didn't want Stonehenge, they didn't want Fembots, they, they wanted a guy with a knife, and, and I understand that. Alright guys, so I said once I finish Halloween 3, I would begin doing a Halloween tier list. This is the one I found. This has all of the movies except for Halloween Ends that comes out this year, but I figure it's accurate enough. So let's get right into it. After every single movie, I will be ranking the Halloween films on the tier list. But I have to say, I'm keeping S-Class very, very exclusive. Sometimes when people do tier lists, they put like 15 things in S-Class. And I just like, I, I think that S-Class has to be reserved for like one or two movies, you know, in particular. So that's how I'm ranking it. So S, I'm saying, is like a 10 out of 10 perfect. A class, I would say that's your 9 out of 10s, 8 out of 10s. B is somewhere kind of like a little bit lower. It's like a little bit higher than half. It's like your 6s and 7s. C is like kind of middle of the road. C is like whatever. D is when you're getting to the low numbers. And F would definitely be like a 1 or a 0. And uh, so let's get started here. We're starting out with, of course, the original Halloween. No question whatsoever that is going in S tier absolutely 10 out of 10 horror movie in my top 
five horror movies of all time. Absolutely love it, man. It is perfect from the score to the cinematography to just the creepy vibe of it, how it makes it feel like Halloween. You just watch it and you feel the leaves crunch under your feet and you just want to just drink pumpkin spice coffee and just fucking kill somebody or I don't, or carve, carve a jack-o'-lantern. I don't know, whatever people do on Halloween. Halloween 2... I do really enjoy, um, but I don't think it hits the peak of what the Halloween franchise has to offer. I think it has some really great moments, and I do think hospitals in themselves are scary, so it gives me creepy vibes. But ultimately, I can't quite put Halloween 2 in A tier. So I gotta put Halloween 2 in B tier, but it's a high B tier. It's probably like the highest B tier of the Halloween films. Uh, and now with Halloween 3... I really, really do enjoy it. Uh, definitely have my criticisms about it, but everything wrong with the movie or everything I dislike doesn't really matter because the movie is so much fun. I don't really take it that seriously, and I tend to just enjoy it for what it is, and I tend to enjoy it for the ridiculousness. Like, I love that there's robots. <laughs> I love that the master plan really makes no sense. I love Tom Atkins just being a Chad. So, like... Again, I think it is a high B tier for me. I can't put it, I can't in good conscience put it in A tier, but I do think it's a high B tier. I'll put it just behind Halloween 2. So that's my ranking so far. And we'll do this after every movie from now on. We'll start ranking in the, uh, the tier list so you can see where these movies stand with me. And also, if you're watching through the video, if you want to start doing your own tier list as well, that would be interesting to, to me to show me down in the comments below. Tell me where you rank the movies. But other than that, let's get into Halloween 4. And really, we're going to be getting into Halloween 4, 5, and 6 because these three movies really do fit together as one piece. Actually, a lot of fans have taken to calling the movies the Thorn Trilogy for a reason. And so um, we're going to get right into it. And also, 4, 5, and 6 are some of my favorite Halloween movies because these are the movies that I was really, really attached to growing up, along with the original, along with Halloween 2. But the story of these movies, Jamie as a character... Michael Myers through these movies. I really, really do enjoy this trilogy. So let's get into it, see what it's all about, and talk about why it's a trilogy. So after the financial failure that was Halloween 3, a few years later in 1988, the franchise would be revitalized with a new sequel that would take us back into the original timeline taking place after Halloween 2. But it always felt very strange to me that they would still call this movie Halloween 4. Because that implies that it's all within the same continuity and that there's three movies you need to see before this one. But now this is the third Michael Myers movie. I know you can't call it Halloween 3 again, but it's just kind of strange. Now, normally I would hate when movies just randomly take off the sequel numbering halfway through. But in this case, it would make total sense. Just call this movie Halloween The Return of Michael Myers. You have the subtitle there anyways, so just remove the number. And they also do manage to remove the number after Halloween 5, so they could have just done it early here and called it good, but I don't know. To me, calling this Halloween 4 just makes it that much more confusing, but whatever, I got you. We're on the journey. Back to the original story. Here we go. But who's not back is John Carpenter. This is the first film where there is pretty much no creative involvement or input from John Carpenter or Deborah Hill whatsoever. The original creators of the franchise sold away their rights to the producer Mustafa Akkad, and they would not be back to have any kind of involvement in these movies for a very long time. But, as Carpenter says himself, he still gets a paycheck every time they make a Halloween movie, so it's a fair trade. 1988, when this movie came out, was also 10 years after the original film, so they play into that in the movie itself. Kind of like a 10-year reunion, only this reunion involves big butcher knives into the face. I do want to take a second to talk about the opening credits, though. I really think that this is the best opening credits in the entire franchise. It's so simple and ominous. It's just a setting sun in the hazy background as it shows shots of random empty places found around a field and a farm, along with some low ambient music that really sets the vibe for horror movies and October in that fall Halloween setting. I don't know. There's something about these opening titles that really have always stuck with me, and I, I love them so much. It's the beauty and simplicity, which I guess is the same concept as the entire original Halloween film. Here, apparently, instead of burning to death, Michael Myers actually survived the ending of Halloween 2 and has been in a coma for the last 10 years. And in the beginning of this film, he's being transferred to a new facility. 
but of course, things don't go well. As he's being taken, the paramedics are talking about him and mention that he has a niece living in Haddonfield. Of course, this pisses him off, wakes him up, and makes him want to shove his thumb into a very uncomfortable place. No, 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 I mean into this guy's forehead. So yeah, we got some big changes here. Michael wanting to kill his family, that is the concept that we are going with, that's the motivation that it's going to roll with for some time, and at this point, Jamie Lee Curtis's career had taken off and she didn't want to be stuck doing only horror movies, so she declined to return to this franchise. Instead, what they decide to do with her character is say that she died off screen. Not by Michael Myers though, but in a car wreck. Like, how lame is that? This is one of the few things that I dislike about this timeline of movies, is that Laurie was so important to the first two films, and that's how you repay her? I mean, I know you could also go with the H2O row and say that she faked her death, but that's technically not in this continuity, and there's nothing in these three movies to confirm that she faked her death. You'd have to do some headcanon to make it work, but, you know, whatever, it is what it is. But before she died, apparently she did have a daughter. With who? I have no idea. Maybe it was that random orderly from Halloween 2. He does survive to the end, but then again, that was just a deleted scene that was in the TV edit version, so is it canon? Is it not? I don't know. Jamie Lloyd, played by child actor Daniel Harris here, is honestly a great character and a great protagonist. Danielle does an amazing job in the role, and normally I'm not the biggest fan of child actors, but she just knocks it out of the park. Imagine being a kid whose parents died, she's with a foster family, her uncle is a famous serial killer, she's constantly getting bullied at school, and she's having haunting dreams about Michael Myers coming to attack her, which is predicting his oncoming arrival. That's a lot of heavy shit for a kid to take on, and she does it with stride. Her terror feels real, the chemistry she has with her adoptive sister Rachel feels genuine. I have literally nothing bad to say about her. In fact, I'm gonna go so far to say... I like Jamie as a character more than I like Lori in the first two movies. I know, once you add Halloween H2O, it becomes pretty even down the middle, but I'm comparing Halloween 1 and 2 to Halloween 4, 5, and 6, and if you do that, I like Jamie more. I think her story is way more tragic, she's in a shit ton more danger, and she goes through way more trauma than Lori ever did. And as a kid! I mean, Lori, granted, okay, she had one bad night, I understand. But Jamie's entire life is this absolute fucking hell beyond your wildest imaginations, and she keeps going. It's a thread line that goes through three movies, and I truly don't believe that Lori could have handled even half of what Jamie winds up going through. And I really want to rant about how badly they did Jamie in part six, but I'm not there yet, so let's just keep going to part four. But all I'm saying is I absolutely love Jamie as a character. And it is a crime against humanity that they have never brought Daniel Harris back as Jamie. I know Rob Zombie put her in the remakes, but those don't count. I want her back as Jamie Lloyd, goddammit. Another criticism I have is Michael Myers' mask in Halloween 4. Even though I think Halloween 4 is one of the better Halloween films, I think it by far has the worst Michael Myers mask. It looks way too small for his head, it's way too white, the hair is way too perfect, and overall, it just looks kind of derpy. Also, it's really funny how Michael winds up with the same costume he had in the first film. Remember in the first movie, he killed a mechanic on the side of the road and stole his jumpsuit and then later stole a random mask from a hardware store? Well, in this movie, it just so happens that he winds up at a car garage in order to kill a mechanic and take his jumpsuit and then eventually breaks into a Halloween store and takes a mask that is the same type of mask he had in the first movie. The odds of this happening again is just absolutely hilarious. But even though Jamie Lee Curtis did not return, my main man Donald Pleasance does. Dr. Loomis is back once again, and finding out that Michael Myers escaped, he heads to Haddonfield to try to warn the police officers, who take him a lot more seriously this time. I, I guess like a bunch of murders one night will do that to you. Loomis, as you might remember, was also caught in the hospital explosion at the end of part two. Myers surviving is one thing, because it's Michael Myers, but Loomis surviving with only a few facial and arm burns, well... I I just say that's a Halloween miracle. Maybe the Great Pumpkin was watching over him. But honestly, he is great in this movie, and he's in his element, and it really makes it feel like a Halloween movie. I know we have Michael there, but something about Dr. Loomis on his tail and just trying to bring him down always just made it feel more like itself. I love that Halloween has these returning characters film to film that make you feel like you're coming home in a weird, fucked up kind of way. 
A lot of people really like the scene where Loomis is hitchhiking to Haddonfield after his car explodes, and he gets picked up by this traveling preacher, who is no doubt a little out of his mind, but relates with Loomis in that they are both chasing evil. It's a good scene, and one that probably could have gotten cut, but this actor does such a great job in this one scene that I think they figured it had to stay in the movie regardless. There's a lot of horror cliches that happen in this movie, like Rachel and the older kids wanting to go out to party, and introducing more characters to build up the bounty count, but there is this really creepy idea that's subtly put into the film that Jamie is not only having visions of Michael, but also some similar tendencies, like seeing the clown costume and wanting to wear it, being the same exact costume that Michael wore in the first film when he was a child and killed his older sister. When Halloween night descends and Rachel takes Jamie out trick-or-treating is the same time that Michael enters town, and he does some fucking work this time. No more just looming around in the bushes watching random babysitters. No, this time, he causes a town-wide blackout. He kills off nearly the entire police force, which causes a group of renegade NRA members to form a vigilante group that go out looking for Michael themselves and accidentally gun down an innocent human being. At the same time, Loomis and the new police sheriff are trying to track Michael down themselves, and instead, Michael sneaks into their safe house, he grabs a gun, and instead of firing it, Michael uses the gun to stab a chick and pin her to the wall. Come to think of it, is this movie an anti-gun message? I mean, you have the gun-toting rednecks that go out and shoot an innocent man, and then you have Michael with a gun, but he refuses to fire it and instead stab somebody with it? I don't know, that might be a thing. Yeah, this is the movie that really starts to showcase that Michael has an absurd level of superhuman strength. In the first two movies, he survives bullets, but here, he literally shoves his fingers inside of somebody's face. And my favorite one is towards the end of the movie, where the vigilantes are helping Jamie and Rachel escape. Michael gets on top of their truck, reaches through the window, and literally rips this guy's fucking head off with his bare hands. It is one of my favorite kills in the entire franchise. I just love the practical effects for it, and it looks so fucking cool. It might sound like I'm jumping all over the place with this movie, but it's a pretty straightforward film. Michael is coming after Jamie, kills off a lot of the people in the process. Once Michael attacks the safe house, Loomis meets up with Jamie, takes her to the school for some reason, as if it's going to be safe there. I don't know. Of course it isn't. Michael tosses Loomis through a doorway. Her only hope is the team of drunken rednecks that already killed an innocent man earlier that night, but you know, it is what it is. And then during the driving scene, the best kill happens. Man, it's so good. In the finale, Michael is confronted by all of the rednecks and what's left of the police force, and they unleash hell on him with gunfire. He's continuously hit until he falls down like a mine shaft or something. I don't know. It's weird because he eventually ends up in the river in Halloween 5, but I don't see a river anywhere near where they're at right now, but whatever. Then the movie cuts to them regrouping at Jamie's adoptive family's house, but then the movie ends with how the original Halloween began. Jamie, still in the clown costume, puts on a mask, and we see her POV, similar to the beginning of the first Halloween, as she enters the bathroom and stabs her stepmom with a pair of scissors. Loomis sees the girl, looking the same as Michael did once upon a time, and screams out in terror, seeing that the cycle of evil is still continuing. Now, on a surface level, you can take this ending to simply mean... If Michael quote-unquote died, then maybe another person received whatever curse or demonic enhancements that he has. I don't think it was ever really meant to imply that Jamie did this intentionally, but whatever took her over. And as these movies go on, things become a lot more supernatural. So the next two films take it in stride to not only explain this moment, but to definitely over-explain it to near death. Halloween 4 might not be anywhere near as good as the original Halloween or, you know, copied what it wanted to say, but it does really nail what it tries to do. It's a great slasher film on its own. It has great kills. I feel like it honors the original Halloween to a degree, brings us back into that world. It adds new story elements and new characters like Jamie that become iconic in her own way. Loomis is still fucking Loomis. And yeah, overall, I gotta say, I really enjoy this one and I think it's one of the best. I just wish they would have changed that stupid mask. All right, back to the tier list. If we're ranking Halloween 4, look, Halloween 4 has a lot of flaws to it, but overall, I really, really do enjoy the movie. This is one of my favorite eras of the Halloween franchise in particular, and I think Halloween 4 just straight up is a really good, fun horror movie. So, you know what? Halloween 4, in the context of the Halloween franchise, to me, is going up in a tier. Yes, A tier for Halloween 4, man.
after the success of Halloween 4, Part 5 was rushed into production immediately. Like, so immediately they didn't even have a completed script or know who was going to direct the thing. But like I said, Carpenter still gets paid, so who gives a fuck? Originally, they were going to lean in towards developing Jamie as the next killer based off the end of the last movie. The idea that even if Michael is killed, the evil or the curse will transfer to another person, virtually meaning that it was unstoppable. But longtime producer Mustafa Akkad scrapped that idea, and it makes sense that he did. They already tried to do a movie without Michael Myers with Halloween 3, and people hated it. There's no way he was going to move forward into another Halloween film and not have the mask-wearing maniac to be the prime focus. So reworkings of the script kept coming, and they got a guy named Dominique Othenin Girard. I have no idea if I pronounced that right. He is the one that came in to direct it, and his filmography isn't really all that great, but I do think he delivered the best that he possibly could with Halloween 5 and all of its rush concepts. The movie was released and takes place exactly one year after Part 4, taking place on Halloween night 1989. This also means this is the first Halloween movie that I was alive for. I was only five months old, but still. And the best thing about this movie is that it still has all of the surviving characters from Part 4. Donald Pleasance comes back once again as Dr. Loomis, making it feel like coming back to the Halloween films is kind of like seeing old friends. Loomis is like the crazy grandpa that's been to war and he's seen so much shit that sometimes he shouts out random monologues or uses children as bait to catch serial killers. We've all had someone like that in the family before. So even though this film decided not to use Jamie as the killer, it still has the events of the last movie be relevant. Jamie is now being seen at a child psychiatric ward under strict supervision, probably similar to how Michael was, causing all sorts of negative flashbacks for Loomis. But Jamie is still herself, she spaced out during the stabbing, and it's even mentioned that she didn't actually kill her foster mother, she just seriously injured her. Jamie has also lost her ability to speak, which feels like more of a connection to Michael, who has never said a word either. So whatever curse had stricken him began to get its hands on her as well, but didn't quite take her all the way. Also remember all the dreams and visions she had of Michael in part 4, well, here they play that up as if there is some sort of psychic connection between the two of them. She can sense when he's near, sometimes see what he's seeing, and she knows where he will strike next. It's a far cry away from the simplicity of the original, but in this particular movie, I think that it works. It's just a vague enough concept in the supernatural element that weaves itself decently into the plot and doesn't distract from Michael doing his traditional slasher killings. Speaking of Michael, at the end of part 4, he is shot up and falls down a mine shaft that somehow ends up at a river. One thing interesting is that this scene takes place immediately after part 4, and yet Michael Myers' mask is 100% different. Technically, it should be the same mask, since this is immediately happening after, but having said that, the mask from part 4 looks so horrible that this is a massive improvement. So, it might be a little big looking, but I do think this is the best looking mask since the original, so I'm not even going to question why it changes. But that's not the weirdest part of this scene. It's the fact that Michael stumbles upon this old fisherman's cabin, passes out, and for some reason, this fisherman literally keeps Michael's body here for an entire year. Why would he do that? It's assumed Michael didn't wake up for that whole year, so you would assume that maybe he was dead? Maybe it would have been cooler if the guy actually buried Michael Myers, and then a year later on Halloween night, Michael digs himself out of the grave? I don't know, maybe it would have made him feel too zombie-like like Jason Voorhees, but I still think it would have been cool. Also, wouldn't this old man be aware of the fact that Michael Myers was attacking Haddonfield? I mean, if a random guy in a white mask and a knife shows up, you wouldn't put two and two together and maybe call the cops? Or, you know, maybe call a hospital since he was basically in a coma for a year? Out of any flaws in this movie, this opening scene is the one that upsets me the most. <laughs> The dude keeps Michael alive for a year just for Michael to wake up and instantly kill him. But alongside Michael, Jamie, and Dr. Loomis, Jamie's foster sister Rachel also returns for this movie, but unfortunately it's very short-lived. Rachel was a bit of a plain Jane, but she also went through hell to keep Jamie safe in part 4, and here in part 5 she is unceremoniously killed off in the first 30 minutes. One of Michael's first victims she stabbed early on and not seen from again, well until her dead body later but I at least appreciate that they got the same actress to come back, even for such little screen time. But even more, unfortunately, since Rachel dies, we need to have the standard young adult protagonist. So we get Tina. And, and Tina is kind of like, 
an 80s version of Kat Dennings in that she's mostly annoying, also a little bit endearing, but but overall just uh, she's a party girl that doesn't really have a whole lot of foresight or common sense and you can't really hate her because she's really nice. I, I, I don't know, man. I, I'm conflicted. There's also her boyfriend named Michael, who is this ass clown that thinks he's living in the 1950s and is obsessed with his car and the other couple that we barely get enough time to know. But, and look, I'm only going to share this with you guys because I love you. And also, if you made it this far in the video, I want to reward you in some capacity. The blonde friend of Tina's named Samantha in this movie, when I was like 13 years old watching these movies for the first time, I thought this chick was like the hottest thing that I had ever seen. I was literally a simping madman over this VHS tape. And the scene later where she's about to, you know, have sex with her boyfriend in the little farmhouse, she doesn't even show any nudity, but let me tell you, young teen Ryan did not care. I discovered things during this scene, and so for that reason, Samantha in the Red Devil costume and Halloween 5 on VHS being rewound over and over again holds a very special place in, let's just say, my heart. And I'm only sharing that with you guys because I love you. <clears throat> but anyways, let's move on. Ultimately, there is not a whole lot of structure to this movie, which makes sense when you remember they barely had a working script. Scenes just kind of happen. We have Loomis trying to get Jamie to tell him where Michael is through her psychic connection, but he's being very aggressive and is kind of going a little crazy himself. Poor Jamie. A again, Daniel Harris does an amazing job. But since she can't speak for half of the movie, it's all expressions and body language and still... Continuing my compliments from part four, this is some of the best child acting I have ever seen. And I'm not just saying that. Even knowing she stabbed the shit out of her foster mom, you really care about this little girl and you want her to be okay. And it all comes from Danielle's performance. It's just, it's master class, man. It's, it's the best acting in the movie. Michael also does do some of his traditional stalking and they do bring a little bit of the heavy breathing back that I had forgotten about until I rewatched this movie. And a really weird moment is after this, Michael kills Michael. <laughs> Get it? And then he puts on a different mask and picks Tina up in the car. He lets her in, sit next to him, talk some shit to him, even kiss him over the mask, and then he drives her to the gas station. It, it just feels very odd for him not wanting to kill her here, especially when he just winds up killing her later on, but whatever. The same sheriff from part four also returns, but has a lot less screen time this go around. The police force is aware that Michael might be out there, but it's odd that this town would even want to celebrate Halloween this year or, you know, sell the Michael Myers mask. Samantha's boyfriend almost gets shot by the police because he plays a prank dressed up as Michael Myers. It's ridiculous. See, Sam, you're with the wrong guy. That piece of shit would never treat you half as good as I could. Just come with me and everything will be fine. Bring your little devil costume and uh, we'll, uh, we'll raise some hell. Eventually, Jamie teams up with another little boy that has a crush on her and they go to stop Tina from getting murdered until they fail. But then Michael chases Jamie down with a car. Michael drives a lot in this movie, and it's the first one since the original that really capitalizes on the fact that Michael Myers knows how to operate a vehicle. Like, really, really well. Maybe there's some kind of correlation between driving cars and being obsessed with family. Hmm. But after being unsuccessful with that kill, Loomis tells Michael to meet them at his old home, basically using Jamie as bait to try to lure Michael there and finally kill him. Except, when they get to the old abandoned Myers home, what the, f the fuck is this place? This is what the Michael Myers house looked like. They show it clear as day a bunch of times in the first movie. How did this transform into this? It doesn't even attempt to look like the same house. Like, they could have at least shown an establishing shot outside of the same house and then just made a set for it inside. I get changing the mask, but changing the architecture of an entire house is a little bit too much to look past. Anyway, within the final act, there is a scene from Michael and Loomis that I actually quite like, and it might be controversial, but I enjoy this scene a lot. Instead of just instantly shooting him, Loomis talks calmly and makes his way over to Michael. And it's really one of the few moments where it makes it seem like Loomis really was Michael's psychiatrist at one point, and has been since his childhood. 
like he knows him on some kind of intimate level. And the fact that Michael doesn't immediately stab him also kind of lends itself to that. I don't think that they should try to make Michael Myers a sympathetic character, but I like the idea that Michael would have some sort of engraved understanding of Loomis as his doctor, and it's an interesting idea. Like, even when Michael does eventually slash at him and throw Loomis to the side, I get the feeling that it wasn't with intent to kill. Just more so a get-out-of-my-way kind of thing. Like, he doesn't have the desire to kill Loomis specifically, but if Loomis happened to die, he wouldn't feel any remorse for it. You know what I mean? And there's a bunch of chase scenes with Jamie, but towards the finale, similar to the Loomis moment, Jamie also has this moment with Michael that I like. She calls him uncle, which makes him briefly stop, kind of like triggering maybe the 1% of humanity that's within him. She has to see his face, and we actually do see Michael remove his mask, and he looks very human. Honestly, he should look like Freddy Krueger because of how badly he was burned in part two, but whatever. I also totally forgot to mention the brief moment in the original Halloween where we see Michael's face. When Laurie is struggling against him, she knocks his mask up for a second, and we see this face. And even though Nick Castle played Michael through most of the original movie, Tony Moran played the face reveal. And honestly, there isn't much to say about it except that it, it happened. And unlike Jason, who was meant to have a deformed-looking face, Michael is just human-looking. Which might be even scarier, that he's just a normal guy. Halloween 5 is the first time since the original that we see his face, and it's mostly covered in shadow, but it has the same idea here. He just looks like a man. They even do a close-up shot of a tear running down his face, kind of like maybe that little boy is still trapped somewhere deep beyond the vestige of the curse of Michael Myers, and for one brief second, he tries to connect. But then Michael freaks the fuck out, puts his mask back on, and keeps trying to kill Jamie. Loomis eventually grabs Jamie, using her like live bait, and like the kooky old grandpa that he is, he traps Michael by dropping chains on him and then shooting him with a double barrel tranquilizer gun because those exist I guess somehow it works and they take Michael to jail why take him to jail he was unconscious why didn't you just shoot him in the face not like Loomis hasn't tried to kill him many times before it just seems so weird that they would just take him to jail and keep his mask on at the same time I know they just had a heart to heart but if you literally had him unconscious just chop his goddamn head off yeah we gotta wait a couple more movies for that anyways after he's taken to jail well I guess it's time I talk about why they call four five and six the thorn trilogy okay Here's the intro to it anyways. Throughout this movie, there are a few additions to the franchise, such as a thorn tattoo on Michael's wrist. It's shown a few times, but never elaborated on, just enough to know that Michael has some kind of tattoo on his wrist. Alongside that, there's also a few quick scenes of a man in a black trench coat and a hat just walking around Haddonfield. He never does anything, he never interacts with any of the characters, just sometimes it'll cut to him getting off a bus or walking down the street. But then at the end of this movie, he shows up at the police station, takes out a fucking machine gun, and blows the place to hell, freeing Michael Myers and leaving Jamie alone, wondering when he will strike next. And in Halloween 5 specifically, none of this is explained. It just cuts to credits. And apparently, while making this movie... Nobody knew what this was meant to mean anyway. It was literally just thrown into the film in order to explain it later on in a sequel. And boy, do they. See, part four introduces a mild supernatural concept of Jamie having visions of Michael and being stricken with the same curse as him at the end. Part five pushes that even further and makes it pretty clear that this is a curse and that it is supernatural and that Michael is being affected by whatever it is. And then going into part six, it all goes to hell in some of the weirdest lore additions to the entire franchise, which we're going to get into here in a second. But first, we got to rank Halloween 5 on the tier list. All right, so back to the tier list, and I can't lie to you guys, I do have a lot of love for Halloween 5. Along with the original, Halloween 4, 5, and 6, the Thorn trilogy, is... The Halloween movies I watched the most when I was a young teenager getting into horror films. When I was 13, 14, 15, these were the movies I'd watch every year. I was excited to watch them on AMC Fear Fest. I would watch the VHS tapes of them. And Halloween 5 
was my favorite of the Thorn trilogy when I was younger. And I think a lot of that is because just the way that Michael Myers looks, kind of the tone of the movie, I like the way that it feels, I like the kills, and despite its flaws, I do like the more intimate moments with Michael Myers and sort of getting a feeling of what could be going on behind the devil's eyes. And I know that explaining Michael Myers takes away from what's scary about it, but when I was younger, I really liked kind of a slow unraveling of learning about Michael Myers through the movies, where you'd only get little bits and pieces of it from film to film. And part five felt like it gave you the most before we get into part six and they go overboard with it. But part five felt like it had just enough where Michael Myers is still like an irredeemable, you know, psychotic, pure evil killer. But there might be something more going on there. There might be something more to this curse. There might be something more to the supernatural abilities of it. And I just kind of really like that vibe. So for me, Halloween 4 and 5, it's very hard for me to decipher which one I like more, especially with how dorky Michael looks in part 4. It's kind of hard to take it seriously sometimes. You just look at him and he's all like all padded up with a tiny mask and stuff like that. So I think that I like part five a little bit more than part four i'll admit part four is a better movie but this is just a tier list of my personal preference i'm not going by what i think is the best movie i'm going by what i personally enjoy so that makes it a different list if i was going by filmmaking i'd put four above five but for personal enjoyment i gotta put five above four so i'm giving five halloween five an a tier which is gonna be controversial to some people i know but I just, I enjoy it, man. I think it's a fun slasher movie, so I like it that way. We are now entering the 90s, a simpler time, a time where you could still go rent videos at the store, you looked cool in acid wash jeans, and right before social media destroyed all of humanity. But it was also a time where the slasher genre of movies was played out to hell. Not only had Halloween had five movies by this point, Friday the 13th had nine, Nightmare on Elm Street had six, and overall it was being slowly phased out of the mainstream. Halloween 5 did not live up to Part 4's box office return, and so Mustafa Akkad put the franchise on hold for a bit. A great time to do it, considering Part 5 probably had the biggest what-the-fuck cliffhanger since the original film, and we would have to wait six years before we got another Halloween film to continue it with Halloween, The Curse of Michael Myers, releasing in fall of 1995. And the irony is that most people would consider this to be a cursed film to begin with. Both pre- and post-production were filled with problems, and the fan reception to this was a lot less positive, to put it lightly. Not only were they working against a genre that was fading out, but they also needed to answer all of the questions that Halloween 5 introduced. The tattoo, the man in black, the curse itself. None of the creative team from part 5 returned, which just proves that they threw all that stuff in there just for the hell of it. Multiple people were approached to write the script for part 6. Even Quentin Tarantino was apparently brought up as a possibility. He was just beginning to make a name for himself in Hollywood, and Pulp Fiction had just released the previous year. He did offer some ideas, but it never got far enough to where he would write a script, and none of his ideas were ultimately used in the end. Supposedly, there was even a moment where they approached John Carpenter again, but he said he wanted it to be about Michael Myers in a space station. And I have to believe that he was just fucking with them, and I hope that's true because that's hilarious. It's also even more hilarious considering how many horror franchises eventually do go into space. Eventually, they found a screenplay that they liked, and they got Joe Chappell to direct it. Halloween 6 would drop the numbering in the titles and just call itself Halloween, The Curse of Michael Myers, which shockingly would make it also follow the series of titles for the Pink Panther series, Return, Revenge, and then Curse, which is probably one of the strangest coincidences in film. But anyway... The movie would take place in real time, six years after the events of Halloween 5, and basically change and shit on everything that we know about the series. First of all, we do have the return of Jamie Lloyd, the character, but not the actress that played her. See, Jamie the character would be 15 years old in this movie. Daniel Harris, the actress, was about 17. So, it could totally work just fine, but apparently the filmmakers wanted an actress that was over 18 years old. Not for nudity or anything like that, but to not have to deal with the restricted hours of actors who are minors. Basically, to work them harder and be able to do longer night shoots since all of Jamie's scenes pretty much take place at night. 
but I find this to be an absolute piece of disrespect, especially when you dig up more information on what was fully going on. See, Daniel Harris had at this point been in just as many movies as Jamie Lee Curtis, and unlike Jamie Lee, Daniel Harris wanted to return to the role. She became a main staple of the franchise and was fully willing to return in it. Not to mention, as a child actress, she was acting circles around most of the adult cast besides maybe Donald Pleasance, and she'd given some of the best performances since the original movie. Apparently first, they didn't even bother to inform her that a part six was being made and instead just started looking for other actresses. When Danielle became aware, she got a hold of the right people and found that the main reason was because she was literally only one year away from being the age that they wanted the actress to be. So she actually went out and got emancipated in order to become a legal adult in order to continue to play the role. Yes, that happened. But then, they told her about the script. The fact that the character of Jamie was meant to have been held prisoner the last six years, forcefully impregnated, and then disrespectfully killed off within the first 20 minutes of the movie. To which Harris knew was a massive mistake. Not because they were killing her character per se, but the way that it was being done and the lack of any kind of justice to someone that stuck by the franchise as long as she had. Added to that, they only offered to pay her $1,000 and not even budge on it even though she was a legacy character at this point and she herself put up $4,000 just to get herself emancipated in order to do the movie so she wasn't even breaking even just to do the movie. And she has to live with the fact that her character was imprisoned, raped, and killed off in the worst way possible. Originally, it was going to be by being shot in the head and later it was changed to being killed by Michael himself. But with all of this chaos, eventually Danielle left the project and Jamie was eventually recast with an actress named J.C. Brandy. And look, it's no fault of hers. There's no reason to hate on the new actress. She does a fine job in the role with what she's given. It's just what she's given absolutely sucks. The movie begins with Jamie trapped somewhere inside some facility, apparently being kidnapped the same night the man in black broke Michael out of prison at the end of part five. When the movie begins, she's about to give birth birth. And after she does, the baby is taken into some bizarre cult-like room where the thorn symbol is drawn on its stomach, and we get some overdub recap of the franchise thus far. Then a nurse, at wherever this is, brings Jamie her baby and helps her break out. Oh, about time. She's only been stuck here for six goddamn years. But of course, as soon as she's free, just so happens to be the same exact night that Michael Myers shows up looking for her. And so the beginning of the film is Jamie trying to escape with her baby and evade Michael once more. Meanwhile, there's this Howard Stern knockoff show on the radio that apparently everybody in Haddonfield listens to, including Dr. Loomis. Yes, Donald Pleasance does return once more in his iconic role, but unfortunately, this would be his last run. The actor himself tragically passed away before the film was even released due to heart failure, but overall it's pretty impressive that Donald managed to stay with the franchise for 17 years and in five different movies. He always gave his absolute best in every movie despite any dips in quality. He is an absolute legend, and I always wonder what the series would have looked like if he hadn't passed away and he was in more films. Let's give a quick moment of silence for this legendary actor, and all that he contributed to the series. But back to the story of this movie, Jamie reaches a phone and instead of calling 911, she decides to call into the raunchy radio show because obviously Loomis would be listening to it. Uh, I don't know. She tries to get a message out to him that she's still alive, but she doesn't have long to talk. Michael continues to chase her down and eventually confronts her at a farmhouse. Thankfully, Jamie had already hidden her baby somewhere else, but Jamie herself is not so lucky. And how they take her out just feels so wrong. She gets thrown onto this corn thresher, Michael turns on the machine, and it basically just rips out her midsection in an extremely excruciating way to die. Wait, wait, hold on, hold on, hold on. Stop the show, stop the show. This is absolutely ridiculous. This is one of the worst things 
that the Halloween franchise has ever done. Not to mention the absolute disrespect of the actress Danielle Harris and everything that she went through to try to be in the movie. She'd been in the main character of two different Halloween films thus far and wanted to come back for part six, saw the disrespect of her character, still was pushing through the best she could until she was offered absolute jack squat in order to play the role until she eventually dropped out. And I don't have anything against this actress. And you know what? I'm not talking about the behind the scenes at all. I'm talking about the story of Halloween. Yes, I mean the story and the character of Jamie Lloyd. Jamie Lloyd's character is absolutely destroyed because of this movie and the horrible things they did to her, and she deserves so much more as a character. I'm not talking about the actress. I'm talking about the character, man. Everybody talks about Jamie Lee Curtis as Laurie Strode in the Halloween franchise. Laurie Strode is the one that's put on the posters. That's the one that people remember. That's the one that's been in multiple movies. Laurie Strode is up there. But if you think about the story of Halloween, and look, Laurie Strode becomes a great character mostly because of the next film in this franchise, which is Halloween H2O, which we'll get into a lot of Halloween H2O, and hey, I love that movie. And that is the movie that solidifies Laurie Strode as a great character. She comes full circle. She faces her fears. There's a lot of great things that happen because of that. But if we're just talking about the original two movies that she was in, compared to Jamie Lloyd, the character, in the three movies that she's in, Laurie Strode doesn't hold a candle to Jamie Lloyd as far as a character goes. Because, let's think about it. In the first two movies, what really happens to Laurie? Now, granted, she has a horrible night, right? She's babysitting, then she goes over to her friend's house, she sees that her friends were killed, she gets chased by Michael Myers, she has a little bit of a struggle with him, uh, then she gets taken to the hospital, she lays around for a while, uh, Michael comes back to chase her again, she shoots Michael's eyes out, and, and that's pretty much the end of the movie. So, she has a pretty bad fucking night. A night that would cause serious trauma that would last into, you know, your entire adulthood. I understand that. But if you compare her one bad night to Jamie's entire life of absolute misery, not only did Jamie spend the first nine years of her life basically finding out that her mother died, finding out that she was like in a foster family, finding out that her uncle was literally a serial killer, but then she starts having horrific visions of her uncle stalking her before he even actually shows up. She's completely bullied and picked on in school. Remember, Lori at least had friends. At least she was doing okay in school. She might have been the nerdy girl next door, but she was at least doing okay. Jamie was constantly picked on and bullied. She had her uh, foster sister who, you know, was really good to her, but also had moments where they were, you know, she was saying she'd rather hang out with her friends. She had all these things going on that was already causing her a horrible life just as a regular person. But then her crazy serial killer uncle, Michael Myers, starts coming into her life and starts trying to kill her when she's like eight years old. She miraculously survives a night of complete violence intensity where like the entire town goes awry all because of her, and then she gets possessed by the curse of Michael. She winds up stabbing her foster mother, almost killing her, almost becoming a serial killer herself, which winds her into a child institution for her mental capabilities to try to test her and to try to figure out what is actually going on with her. She has to live with the fact that she almost murdered her foster mother. She loses her voice. She's completely harassed by uh, Donald Pleasance as Dr. Loomis, completely trying to like get her to reveal where Michael is. Meanwhile, she's haunted with the visions of Michael, seeing the things that he's doing, seeing the things that he's about to do, seeing the murders that are about to happen, and yet she's completely helpless to do anything about it. And then uh, she gets completely chased around again. She gets, you know, uh, beat up, brutalized, falls down, uh, you know, uh, it gets completely, like, fucked up just as a child. Remember, she's, like, nine years old at this point. And then, when she thinks that her uh, serial killer uncle, oh, she was used as bait also to lure him, and then when she realizes her serial killer uncle was finally put in prison and then broken out of jail, well, what happens next? Well, in the six-year gap in between these movies, she gets kidnapped, abducted, held hostage from fucking nine years old to 15. She is a child, goddammit. Who knows what kind of, like tests they were running on her and what the Thorn facility was trying to do and what the cult was trying to do. Then she basically gets raped, impregnated, forced to have the child, doesn't get any time with that child, and then the second that she is released, she's hunted down by Michael Myers again and brutally killed in the worst way possible, in the most like traumatic, painful way. It's not quick. She doesn't have her throat slit. She doesn't have, you know, she originally was going to get shot in the head, but, you know, that didn't happen, and then they switched to this. And her entire life is absolute torture, horror 
horror, pain, misery, and this is how her character is treated, and Jamie Lloyd, the character, never comes back again for the rest of the series. Throughout all the reboots, throughout all the remakes, throughout all the bringing the characters back, she never comes back and gets any justice against Michael, and I think this is a slight against the franchise and a slight against humanity, and you know what? You do bring Daniel Harris back in the Halloween remakes, that's great, but she doesn't play Jamie, so it doesn't even matter. It's great to see her in the movies again, but it doesn't matter. Meanwhile, Jamie Curtis as Laurie Strode is praised as and hailed as this great survivor and this great fighter against Michael Myers. She didn't go through half, a quarter of the bullshit that Jamie goes through. All right, she comes back in H2O. She does great. Look, I love that movie. I don't have any hate against the Laurie Strode character, but all I'm saying is that Laurie Strode is put up on a pedestal and praised as the hero in this ultimate combat person of Michael Myers. She never even gets a chance to come back and try to redeem herself within the franchise whatsoever. I mean, you've got Lori being able to do it twice. She does it in one timeline in H2O and she does it in a second timeline in the current Halloween trilogy that is coming out right now. And again, I don't have anything against Jamie Lee Curtis. I think she's great. I think she's a great actress. I think she's good in the movies. All I'm saying, if we're going by the character specifically, she, uh, Jamie gets the absolute shaft every single time while Laurie Strode is just this person that everybody reveres and everyone thinks is so great. Not once did they ever think of bringing Jamie Lloyd back and I don't understand why and we'll have many of reasons to rant about this in the future but you know what god damn it I'm just gonna do it now because I don't care. Okay first of all if you're gonna reboot the timeline and you do Halloween H2O and you say that Jamie never existed that's one thing but when you reboot the timeline a second time a second time when they rebooted the franchise in 2018, I thought this might be the time. This might be the opportunity. This might be the moment where Jamie finally gets some redemption. Actually, this would be the perfect opportunity because if you're rebooting the entire timeline, this would be the perfect moment where you could literally put Jamie Lee Curtis and Daniel Harris in the same movie, have the two main icons, minus Dr. Loomis, because RIP Donald Pleasance, but besides that, you have the two other main icons of the entire series coming together, and you could have them in the same movie. You've never been able to do that before, because in the Jamie timeline, you said that Laurie died. In the Laurie timeline, you said that Jamie never existed. So when you finally come back to reboot the series, and the biggest insult of all time is when they did reboot the series, they did give Lori a daughter, but they gave her a completely new character as a daughter, and they didn't use Jimmy Lloyd, and they didn't use Daniel Harris. What the fuck? Why? Sorry about that. That was a, uh, that was a deep-seated rage. I've kept locked away for the past 20-some years. Uh, ever since watching 4, 5, and 6 when I was younger, I, I've had these thoughts, especially going into Halloween H2O and the rebooted timeline especially, especially in the current timeline that we're getting now with the, with the movies that started in 2018. It, it just it really, really annoyed me that you would give Lori a daughter. Like, I, I get it in H2O, they gave her a son. They gave her a Josh Hartnett, and he's great. But in the rebooted timeline that ignores all of that, you give her a daughter and you don't make it Jamie? I mean, I just didn't, I don't understand that. I'll get more into that when I get to Halloween 2018, but, you know, uh, I love these movies, man. And I love 4, 5, and 6 especially because I, I was just really attached to them. And it's because I was so attached to them that the death of Jamie bothered me. And you know what? I don't even mind if Jamie dies. I don't even mind if Michael Myers ends up killing her. But it's the way that it's done. And it's the fact that you realize, you know, in the past six years that she's just been some kind of prisoner somewhere and she's been forcefully impregnated. And we haven't even gotten to who the father is. I don't... I... Whatever. Let's keep going. Now, there's a lot more to this movie than the Jamie Lloyd nonsense. We have a whole new gaggle of characters to worry about. First, we have the Strode family. Yeah, related to Laurie Strode, but not her parents. 
assumingly it's her uncle and cousins, but remember, this is from her being adopted, so none of these characters are related to Michael Myers at all. Mostly it's just kind of confusing. I, I don't know why they decided to use the Strodes as characters, but here we are. It gets even worse, because remember how Lori's dad was supposedly a realtor in the first movie, and he was trying to sell the Myers house off? Well, apparently nobody wanted to live there because it's the fucking Myers house. So instead, his brother, the other Strode in the realtor business, just decided to move his entire family into the house with him. Also, the Myers house in this movie at least looks similar to the original one. Somehow in the past six years, it went from being turned into a castle then back to its original self. I don't know, maybe the reason they couldn't sell it was because the house looks different every couple of years. Who knows? Oh, and the Strode's names are John and Deborah as a nod to the original creators, but the main character is their daughter, which is Kara Strode, and her son, Danny. Kara is this girl that's made some mistakes in her past, but her family lets her move back in, but that doesn't stop her dad from being an absolutely over-the-top abusive prick. It's extremely exaggerated. And added to that, her son Danny is having visions of the man in black telling him to kill, because that's also a thing now. And besides them, we have their neighbor, played by none other than Paul Rudd. Yeah, this was Paul Rudd's first movie, and he's awful in it. <laughs> Honestly, this is by far the worst acting I've ever seen him do. Every line he gives sounds like he's either trying to narrate a creepy audiobook, or he just shouts and makes weird faces and expressions. He's actually playing a character that we've seen before, too. The little boy that Laurie was babysitting in the very first movie. And since this movie is 17 years since then, it would put him in his mid-20s, and thus Paul Rudd is playing him. And he's been obsessed with Michael Myers ever since that first attack. To be honest, I kind of like the idea of pulling an old, inconsequential character back and seeing what they would be up to now as an adult. Tommy Doyle as a main character is a great idea overall, but I have no idea what Paul Rudd was doing in this movie, and I don't think he does either. There's also this subplot going on in the background that Haddonfield actually did ban Halloween for the last six years, but people are trying to bring it back, including Kara's younger brother and his girlfriend, who are really just our resident young couple that get to get it on and then be killed. It's just funny because Michael usually always lets people finish having sex before he kills them, all except for in Halloween 5. I guess he just couldn't stand to see my girl Samantha be fucked by another guy. I completely agree. Anyway, Tommy Doyle manages to find Jamie's baby after investigating where she made the phone call and how literally nobody else through the night or morning shift ever heard a baby crying except for Tommy. I guess that's just another Halloween miracle. And Tommy isn't the only inconsequential character that returns from the original. A guy named Terrence Wynn also shows up. Who is that, you're asking? He's this guy. He has literally one scene with Loomis in the original movie, and he's easily the most forgettable character because his only purpose in the original film was just to be that guy that says, there's no way that Michael could have escaped like that. He can't even drive a car. And that's basically all he does. In this movie, Wynn is back, played by a different actor, and trying to convince Loomis to come back to Smith's Grove. He also goes with Loomis to the site of Jamie's body and sees a thorn symbol burned into the hay in the barn, and just, what is this shit? I know that they established in previous movies that Michael will sometimes write a word on the wall, but how the hell did he make this symbol so perfectly, and who's he trying to be, fucking Batman? But anyways, that's only the beginning. So let's just dive right into it. Let's talk about Thorn. Once Tommy and Kara become friends, they do, yada yada, whatever, he takes her up to his creepy bedroom, and apparently because Tommy has this newfangled thing called the internet, What the fuck is the internet? Because of that, he was able to research the thorn symbol and figure out exactly what drives Michael Myers to kill. Yeah, that's right, he just pulls it up on his computer because he looked up some ancient runes. It's that simple. All those years of all those doctors in the sanitarium never being able to figure Michael out? Well, that was before the internet. All they needed was some dork in his attic room to get it right. The thorn comes from this ancient Halloween ritual from the night of Samhain, which was written on the wall in Halloween 2 and once again mispronounced as Sam Hain in this movie. So they took that concept, barreled full force into it, and back in ancient times, one family would be cursed with the thorn and would need to be sacrificed in order to save an entire village, basically saying whoever has the thorn is possessed to kill their family. Also, it only happens when the thorn constellation of stars is in the sky, trying to give an in-universe reason as to why Michael skips multiple years of killing before he returns again. 
And I guess it's an interesting concept, but it truly does take away everything that made Michael scary in the original. Now it's like it's not even Michael's fault. Like he was just cursed with this thorn and has no autonomy over his own decisions. No longer is it the terror that someone might just snap out of the blue, but it's a full-on spiritual magic at play. And not only that, but there's an entire cult following it, led by the Man in Black. He's the one that's been whispering in visions to the new child Danny to kill, and the Man in Black just happens to be Dr. Wynn, the administer for Smith's Grove and the man that's known Michael and Loomis for almost two decades. He reveals himself to our group of protagonists and his fellow cult members steal Jamie's baby. There's also this absolutely ridiculous scene of Kara coming upstairs and seeing the old lady who ran the boarding house pull out a knife, and her main response to this is just, it's just jump out of a second story window and land flat on her face. Like, okay, I, this is like an 80 year old woman who is holding a baby in one hand and a dinky little knife in the other. She's not that intimidating, at least not enough to warrant jumping out of a window. I, I don't know, man. Anyway, the idea of the Thorn Cult is extremely confusing and it has a ton of plot holes, which makes sense when you consider the fact that there's two cuts of this movie, the theatrical and the producer's cut. I've been going over the theatrical since that is more so the canon version. So the idea is extremely poorly expressed in that when New Michael was cursed with the Thorn and has been trying to control him for years, it's even assumed that he's the one who originally let him out back in 1978 and maybe even the one that taught him to drive. Anyway, Wynn wants to kill the last of his bloodline so that he can start over with a new cursed child in Danny, which doesn't make any sense whatsoever because what is the point to end Michael's bloodline and why get Jamie pregnant in the first place when you could just kill Jamie? None of it makes any sense. And when Tommy and Loomis go to the sanitarium to rescue Kara and Danny, there is literally no security anywhere. Every door is unlocked, they can go anywhere they want to, and the only thing that happens is that all the cult members wind up in a single room where Michael Myers eventually enters and murders all of them with a machete. So yeah, it's introduced this huge plot twist, cult concept, for literally all of them to be killed within the next 10 minutes. There's some chase scenes that happen with Michael, and eventually it leads to a one-on-one -on -one with Tommy stepping up to fight back against Michael, first injecting him with some tranquilizers, and then beating him with a pipe. And honestly, it's just super lame. First of all, Paul Rudd, I'm sorry, but you don't look nearly strong enough to do any damage to Michael Myers, even swinging a pipe. Also, after all the things Michael Myers survived over the years, seeing him get beat down by Tommy in this scene really makes him feel weak, even if he is a little bit tranquilized. And sadly, because of the reshoots being done after Donald Pleasance passed away in real life, Loomis himself is barely in the finale, and his presence really feels missed. There's a final scene with Tommy, Kara, Danny, and the baby, uh, that they named Steven for some reason. Uh, they're leaving the facility, but Loomis opts to stay behind. But then all we get is a close-up of Michael's mask and the sound of Loomis screaming in the background. No explanation is given, and the film just... ends. So not only does this film give us the most disappointing conclusion possible for Jamie, but Dr. Loomis as well. The Loomis one is a little bit more forgivable due to the circumstances, but it still just makes you come out of this movie super disappointed. Now I know I do have to talk about the producer's cut version as well, another version of the film with a few changes and a completely different ending than the original version that was going to be released in theaters but test audiences hated it so they reshot a bunch of stuff for a new conclusion. To be honest, I'd never really watched the producer's cut but for some fans they claim it's a much better version and after watching it I gotta say, those fans are smoking fucking dope, dude. The producer's cut is 10 times worse than you could possibly imagine. The first major difference is Jamie's death. Instead of being killed off in the farmhouse, she's stabbed, but survives and is taken to the hospital. So, yay, you would think that's a good thing. But no, it's way worse. Instead of Michael killing her, she just gets shot in the fucking face by Wynn. Why? If Wynn wants Michael to kill off his bloodline, why do it himself? And if Wynn was just going to kill Jamie, why didn't he do it within the six years that he had her captive? Or, if he's just going to kill Michael's bloodline for him, why even bother with Michael anyways? Especially when you learn that in the producer's cut version, Michael has even less autonomy than in the theatrical, when he is completely controlled by Wynn. Yeah, the ending with all the cult members, they're all dressed up in robes, actually performing a ritual, and motherfucking Michael Myers is just standing there like a little bitch, being controlled by Wynn the whole time. How the fuck is the producer's cut better when you have Michael fucking Myers reduced to this? 
And in this version, we find out who the father to Jamie's baby is. Yeah, it's Michael Myers. No, no, why? Are they implying that Wynn had Michael rape his own niece? Also, remember her character is 15. What the absolute dog shit, turd infested, vomit inducing crapalooza is this shit? And to add insult to injury, on the escape, instead of Michael killing the cult members, he stopped in his tracks by a bunch of rocks. Yeah, little magic crystals from your hippie girlfriend's bedroom, tossed on the ground, it stops Michael in his tracks. Bullets can't stop him, falls can't stop him, fire can't stop him, but little rocks can. And in this finale, we see what happens to Loomis as he goes to Michael's body, takes off the mask, and... It's Win. Oh, what? Makes no sense. He switched their clothes. Uh, why? Who the fuck knows? Who the fuck cares? Doesn't make any sense. And then Loomis has the thorn symbol appear on his arm. And what the fuck does that mean? I don't know. Doesn't matter. Loomis screams and the movie ends. And thank fucking God they didn't use this version. But then again, the version we got is also pretty awful. Yeah, so I don't think it's a shock to anybody. You know, originally... I was going to put Halloween 6 in D tier because I do like some of the kills. Uh, I, Dr. Loomis is there. But honestly, after rewatching it, I don't... I I got to put it in F tier, man. I got to put it in F tier. I, you know, I really wanted to put it in D tier, but after rewatching it, I don't think that I can. I, I really think that it absolutely destroys... A lot that's great about the series and I do think it does a ton of disrespectful things to its legacy characters uh, ultimately I mean the producers cut it's not any better it, it leaves with a stupid cliffhanger that's never resolved and uh, really the only thing I can say that's good about it is some of the kills which you could I completely skipped in my uh, review of um, you know the John characters head exploding and stuff because I I literally had so much to rant about, I couldn't even remember what I liked about it. <laughs> uh, yeah, and this is not going to be our only F-tier movie, but things will be looking up as we move forward. And with that, welcome back to the Halloween timeline board. And just as fucked up as Halloween 6 was, we also have a fucked up scenario here. Where I was recording this segment of the videos with my video camera, now I have found that my camera batteries refuse to stay charged no matter how long I put them on the charger. I put them on the camera and they immediately die, so obviously something is fucked up. So, I had to makeshift this weird scenario where I have like 17 books stacked on top of a chair with my webcam on top of it trying to record this, so I apologize for the angle, I apologize for the awkwardness, but you know what? We gotta keep the show going, we've made it this far, I refuse to give up now, so we just have to MacGyver this shit. Halloween 6 marks the end of the real first timeline of the Halloween series. And I know that we had Halloween 3, which exists somewhere in its own tangent universe over there. So technically, there was another universe Halloween. But really, Halloween 6 feels like the finale of, you know, nearly two decades of events. We went from Halloween, the original, to 2, 4, 5, and 6, the Thorn trilogy. And it really did almost everything that you could do with the circumstances. And in a way, I'm kind of sad to see it go because to me, if you count every single timeline as a whole, you know, I, I do think that the original Halloween timeline, one, two, four, five, and six is ultimately the best when you consider it all together as one. It feels the most like Halloween. It feels the most like a story. And even though I really, really love Halloween H2O, which we will get to here, and, you know, a couple of the other films, it really is kind of sad to bring the end of an era. And it really does feel like the end for many ways, um, not just because Jamie, you know, was killed off in this movie, but also Dr. Loomis. Dr. Loomis with Donald Pleasance, who had literally been there since the very first film, is finally out of the series. And not that he wouldn't want to come back, but the actor himself passed away, unfortunately. And so it really does feel like an end. You know, we have the uh, the story that ends with Jamie's baby being taken by Tommy, Kara, and Danny, and they go off to wherever they're going. I don't know if they're just going back to town, but I would hope that they would go further than that. 
We do assume that Michael Myers is still alive by the end of Halloween 6 because we see his mask on the ground. We hear Yuma, Loomis yell. So it's assuming that Michael finally got to him or finally killed him in the theatrical. I know that the yell was taken from the producer cut ending, but technically that version of the movie is not canon. So we would take it. Well, I guess you could say like whichever one you like better is canon, but really the theatrical cut is the one that people saw. Um, so we end the series in a really weird way where Michael's still out there, Loomis is supposedly gone, and if Michael is still out there, he does have another member of his family to kill with the baby, Jamie's baby. Also, his baby, if you watch the producer's cut, it's fucking stupid. But anyways, that's out there. So that's a plot line they could follow. But unfortunately or fortunately, they never did. After Halloween 6, it was kind of decided that there wasn't really anywhere else to go with Halloween. And it makes sense because by the time you get to Halloween 6, they've already explained everything about Michael Myers. They've explained that his powers come from this curse of the thorn, that he's doing it to appease a bunch of pagan gods, that this cult was trying to control him, and that, uh, you know, that's what that's the explanation for his enhanced strength and durability and almost being immortal and coming back time and time again to kill his family members. And they went pretty hardcore with that. And after a while... Well, what else do you do with that? I mean, you can't really explain any more about his powers. I mean, you could, but clearly that was not the direction people wanted it to go. So after Halloween 6, along with the poor reception of it, just it being a bad movie in general, the slasher genre going downhill consistently, and it just being an ultimate mess, and Donald Pleasance being gone, uh, obviously, I don't think Daniel Harris would want to come back. Uh, well, she can't because Jamie's dead. So... You know, you don't really have any leaping off points anymore. There's there's nowhere to really go uh, unless you just had Michael hunting down the baby. So instead, they decided to pretty much scrap the entire thing. And that was the end of Halloween as we knew it. And instead, what they decided to do a few years later, something very interesting happened. Not Halloween H2O, but the movie Scream. Scream, directed by Wes Craven, was not only a love letter to the slasher genre, but it was also a love letter specifically to Halloween. There are so many references to Halloween. They use the, like an entire sequence where they use the music from Halloween. Uh, and everything about Scream really, really seemed like it was saying, I love these kind of movies. I especially love the horror movies with Michael Myers. And it really reinvigorated the slasher genre. It made people care again. It made people remember why they loved these type of movies. And with the big explosion of Scream and how immensely popular that movie was, came out in 1996. And make no mistake, Scream just exploded man like that movie was so fucking popular i even remember being a kid in elementary school and all the kids were talking about scream scream just did something very special very unique where it poked fun at itself poked fun at the genre but still was a legitimate quality slasher film had great characters and became a franchise of its own so after scream happened a lot of people were trying to jump on board this sort of self-referential version of the slasher genre and do these kind of movies. Kevin Williamson, he went on to write the movie The Faculty, which was similar. And also there was this movie idea that they had to bring back the actual OG, the original Halloween, and make it sort of similar to Scream, sort of within a little bit more of a thriller aspect, staying away from the supernatural stuff, staying away from a lot of the, the cliches, and instead uh, trying to make it a little bit more uh, self-aware, a little bit more self-referential. And the best way to do that is to bring, bring back a classic character. And so it was decided that instead of continuing the timeline of Halloween 6, they would basically ignore all of those movies, especially when they got Jamie Lee Curtis to decide to come back. Now, in the time in between Halloween the original, or Halloween 2, we should say, and before H2O, Jamie Lee Curtis's career really blew up. She became a legitimate popular actress that was in a bunch of different movies, a bunch of popular movies, not just stuck in the horror genre. And a lot of the reason why she didn't come back to the Halloween franchise earlier is because she didn't want to get typecast into that horror genre. But by this point in 1998, she had already become you know famous enough doing a bunch of variety of different kinds of movies 
that the idea of returning to Halloween, especially for an anniversary film, because 1998 would be exactly 20 years since the original film, and it would basically wrap up Laurie Strode's story and give her a kind of redemption arc where she fights back against Michael. This was something that was really appealing, and so they got Jamie Lee Curtis on board, all of a sudden said, okay, Halloween's 4, 5, and 6 never happened. Instead, we're going straight from Halloween 2 into Halloween H2O, which is Halloween 20 years later. How it became Halloween H2O, I mean, it, it just happened. Water was synonymous for horror, and uh, and it's been the same ever since, man. So that's just how we know the movie. But that also means that in this universe, uh, uh, Laurie Strode obviously didn't die, but it is said that she faked her death. So, so far, continuity can still remain, but Jamie never existed. So we're taking her out. Instead, we're putting Josh Hartnett in. And it's a little bit of a shame. And when I was younger, I really, really, really tried to make these films be in the same universe. I was thinking, well, okay, she does say that she faked her death in H2O. So maybe the car wreck thing from Halloween 4, maybe that was her faking her death. But the fact that they never mention Jamie or bring up anything from Halloween 4, 5, or 6, you kind of at some point have to think, okay... Fine, this is in a different universe, which is a little bit annoying, but it also works in its own way. Now, it might seem like I'm a little disappointed to go into a different universe because I enjoyed the first run so much, but I gotta be honest with you guys, I fucking love Halloween H2O. I think this movie is, I know this movie is a little bit divided in the fan base, but I will tell you straight up, I think Halloween H2O is fucking awesome in its own way and i love this movie so let's get into talking about it let's go into halloween h2o so like i said the perfect storm of scream success in the box office along with getting jamie lee curtis back ultimately saved the doom franchise from going the direction of the straight to video sequel territory yeah we almost got another hellraiser series on our hands and thank god that we didn't Although there was that one time they were going to make a Hellraiser Michael Myers crossover, but we'll, we'll get to that maybe. They wanted to capitalize on the resurgence of the genre and gave this movie the biggest budget that a Halloween film had ever had up to this point, which was $17 million. A guy named Steven Miner was picked to direct the film that was switching franchises. Having already directed Friday the 13th, Part 2 and 3, he was now going over to the Halloween series and of course was no stranger to silent stalkers with giant knives. The movie was always meant to be and marketed as an anniversary film, Halloween 20 years later. But I guess whoever designed the poster ultimately just made everybody call it Halloween H2O. It's really just meant to be Halloween 20 as an abbreviation for Halloween 20 years later, but in a weird way, Halloween H2O does work very well for a title. It's memorable for one thing, it's kind of weird, and it is something that catches people's attention, so good on them. It's Halloween H2O now. And it would make no sense to call it Halloween 7 since this is not supposed to be connected to any of the movies after part 2. Then again, Halloween 3 isn't connected either, but that was a different time. That was the 80s. Nobody cares about the 80s anymore. We're in the 90s now. Halloween H2O also decided to go back to the simplicity of the original in that Michael is just some unstoppable evil. There is no attempt to explain why he wants to kill his sister. There's no thorn tattoo. There's no explanation whatsoever, even to where he's been the last 20 years. Remember, in this continuity, he would have been burned alive at the end of part two. So what happened to his body? Where did he go? Don't know, and it's never discussed, but it doesn't really need to be. Apparently, he's just been laying around dormant for the last 20 years, and now he's ready to go on a cross-country road trip to California in order to visit his family. Yeah, this is also the first Halloween movie, other than part three, to not take place in Haddonfield. I would say it gives it a fresh take, but 90% of this movie does take place on a school campus, so you don't really get that much unique scenery out of it. The movie opens with possibly a familiar character, Marion Chambers, aka Dr. Loomis's nurse from the first two movies. And I kind of like that it starts with her because as per a 20 year anniversary film, the original Halloween also started with her too. In this universe, apparently Dr. Loomis is dead, but again, somehow did not die from the explosion in part two. 
Damn, that man is durable. Two different timelines, and he didn't explode in the hospital. He, how? I, I don't know. Halloween miracle. Instead, he died years later of natural causes, and his nurse was always kind of taking care of him. She returns home to see that her house was broken into, and instead of going in herself to investigate or immediately calling the cop, she responsibly lets two underage boys go in to check it out. And hey, one of them is Joseph Gordon-Levitt. Yeah, I love that dude. He's not in much of the movie though, but that's all right. Because pretty soon he gets an ice skate to the face. He is the first kill, technically, so, you know, he's got a legacy here in the Halloween franchise, like it or not. Yes, apparently Michael Myers was the one that broke into the house, and after killing the two boys, he does what he should have done to Marion 20 years ago and slits her throat. But he wasn't there specifically to kill her. That part was just extra fun. He actually came for information on Laurie Strode, somehow knowing that she is still alive. Also, if you're keeping track, Michael Myers, the character, would be 41 years old at this point. And Laurie is still alive. In this universe, Laurie apparently faked her death, changed her name, and moved to Summers Glen, California. Now going by the alias of Carrie Tate, she's still haunted by nightmares and the PTSD of what happened 20 years ago, but manages to get by with the help of many prescription drugs and a lot of alcohol. But she's a high-functioning alcoholic as she's able to hold down a job as a teacher and raised her son, a new character, John Tate, played by Josh Hartnett. And actually, this is Josh Hartnett's first movie. I really like this actor. I think he's super underrated. And I also always laugh because this movie and The Faculty came out on the same year, and he looks exactly the same in both movies. And uh, I don't know, man. I just love The Faculty. If you haven't seen it, go watch that movie. So the character of John doesn't have a whole lot to do in this movie, but Josh Hartnett does the best with what he has. In this film, Laurie is a little overprotective of him, but understandably so. She works at a private school that he, of course, also goes to along with all of his friends. And the movie kind of tries to do two things by having us focus on Laurie and what she's been up to for all of these years and also have John introduce us to our teenage characters, half of which are only here to add to the body count, which is natural. But I actually think it does a really good job of balancing both. And of course, I always gravitated more towards John's group in this movie, but now I'm realizing that at this point in my life, I'm way closer to Laurie's age in this movie than I am him, and I'm a little bit creeped out by that fact. There's also LL Cool J in this movie for some reason as a security guard working the front gates. He was making the rounds doing a lot of movies at this time, and honestly, he's much better in Deep Blue Sea. I'd rather see him fighting sharks. Here, he basically doesn't really have much to do except give us a, a few moments of comic relief and, and just kind of be here whenever the film needs to cut away to something else. But also similar to the original movie, the first half of this film is very much a slow build. It makes you wonder when Michael will get there, who he will go to first, and when Laurie will ultimately see him again. All that kind of stuff. And yes, the movie does take place on Halloween. There's also a cameo of Jamie Lee Curtis's mom, Janet Lee, who played the lead role in Psycho back in the day. She's in the movie for a second, and we even see her car from Psycho also. It's a good little nod to the character in the legacy. The worst character in the movie, though, is the guidance counselor, a guy named Will. I don't know why, but I just always hated this guy. I hate the sound that he makes when he makes out with Lori. It just, their lips smacking just sounds like nails on a chalkboard to me, and I, I can't stand it. Maybe I'm biased because I never liked any of my guidance counselors, but something about this guy always rubbed me the wrong way. I just don't like him. And speaking of Lori's love interest, though, just like with Jamie in the other timeline, we never get to know who John's father was. Just someone that apparently Lori had as a disdain for, but it's also mentioned that he is the one that broke up with Lori, most likely because he couldn't handle dealing with the PTSD. I, I'm not really sure. That's a lot of what the first half of this movie has to do. It showcases the effects of that traumatic night, but I like this direction. Despite my feelings about Lori not going through half of the bullshit that Jamie did in the other timeline, it was still an extremely horrific night that would give anyone, especially just an average person, nightmares for probably the rest of their life. And it's a very good realistic concept that goes through the movie and makes it work even better when Lori finds the strength to fight back later in the film. It feels realistic and relatable, and you feel the build-up as it comes throughout the course of the movie. And the movie goes the way you would expect it would, but not in a bad way. It's kind of nice to just have the simplicity of Michael Myers showing up and doing what he does best, rather than trying to cram a bunch of extra bullshit and lore in. The only thing that's very off-putting is the mask. 
Apparently, they couldn't come to a unanimous decision on what mask to use, and because of this, the final product is a mask that is super tight against his face, and there's even a few scenes where they try to make the mask look better with late 90s CGI, and it, it just looks awful. I never understood why it was so hard to get the mask right. The original set the standard, like, I don't know why it's so hard to make a mask that looks similar to that. I think part 5 got it the closest, but beyond that, it's just never been quite right. But other than that, Michael is great here, a classic force of nature making his way through the campus and putting a stop to John's first ever celebration of Halloween. All he wanted to do was set up a nice night with his girlfriend and friends, but Michael said, no fucking way, it's time to meet your uncle. His kill of this girl, Sarah, is my favorite in the movie. She tries escaping in a dumbwaiter, and Michael just cuts the line so it comes crashing down, almost chopping her entire leg off. There's this great shot of him coming down with the knife over and over, stabbing her, and something about this always felt so brutal to me, and there's barely any gore. It's just a very simple and effective thing to do, just showing him stab and stab and stab, and it just reminds me of sometimes less is more. Then things ramp up as John meets Uncle Michael for the first time and tries to escape his rampage. Meanwhile, Lori admits her past to a will, and at the same time realizing that John is currently the same age that she was the night that Michael attacked her. I don't know if they are trying to imply that the reason Michael is back is because of this. I, I don't really think that it is, more so it's just something to specifically trigger her PTSD once again and make her go looking for John, but maybe they did intend it that way. Now, because of this, I had to look up how old Michael's older sister was in the first movie, and the one that he killed in the very beginning, and apparently she was meant to be 15 when he killed her. So, okay, the rule of them being 17 years old, thankfully, does not play a part in the lore, because that would be pretty stupid. Laura shows up at the school just in time to save John and his girlfriend and get a good face-to-face -face look at Michael for the first time in 20 years in this super iconic shot. They try to escape through the hallways of the school, and Will's dumbass accidentally shoots LL Cool J. Come on, man. He's in like three scenes in this movie. Why you gotta do him like that? But thankfully, then Michael comes in in a clutch and gives Will some guidance of his own. After Lori makes it to the main gate and successfully has John and his girlfriend Molly drive away, Lori then decides to stay behind, realizing that she has to take this opportunity to take Michael down for good. The more that she runs, the more that he will find her. And it's at this moment that Lori, in my opinion, fully solidifies herself as not just a decent character, but a great character. When she grabs that fire axe, yells for Michael, and walks back towards the school, I get chills every time that I watch it. Lori in the original film was mostly just a relatable girl that screamed and ran away for her life. And like I said before, I don't expect a 17-year-old girl to be a superhero and a badass in the movie, but after living with the pain and torment for 20 years now, knowing that everything that she tried to do from running across the country to changing her name, that Michael eventually found her anyway, she knows that the only way to be free from this nightmare and the years of trauma and having any kind of future relief is to kill this motherfucker right here and right now, and it's awesome. I love seeing her stand up to Michael, I love seeing her take charge of her life, and the cat and mouse battle with Lori and Michael is just great and I wish it was longer. She stabs him, she gets stabbed, she just comes at him full force, and even though Michael is way stronger than she is, she gets the drop on him a number of times and manages to stab the ever-loving crap out of him and have him fall down a few stories. But then the police and paramedics arrive and they opt to follow procedure and take Michael away on a stretcher. Pfft. But Lori isn't having any of that shit. She swipes a gun from a cop, loads Michael into an ambulance, and drives away with him, hoping to finish the job herself. And before I get into anything else about this scene, let's just take it on the merits of just Halloween H2O and nothing else. As an ending to this film, this scene is fucking great. Of course, Michael wakes up, so she crashes him out of the car, runs him over, and then down a cliff to a point where Michael is pinned up against a tree. And then there's this little moment where Michael is trapped and he holds out his hand to her. And this can be interpreted in so many ways. Is it just an instinct to kill that he's reaching out? Is it that he's asking for help? Is it similar to the end of Halloween 5 where maybe that 1% of the potentially not evil Michael is still deep down there trying to connect? And in all the possible ways that this could go, Laurie touches his hand 
and then cuts his motherfucking head off! Oh snap! This is so good! She chops off his head, the Halloween theme plays, and the movie just ends. As it should. Michael Myers is dead. The movie is over. Nothing more needs to be said. That's it. We did it. We brought back Laurie Strode for a 20-year anniversary film. She showed the damage that the original film did to her. We showed her grow as a character. We watched her decide to fight back. And in the final scene of this movie, she ultimately rises up and kills Michael Myers. That's all you need to say. Cut to black, franchise over, we're done here. His first main victim got vengeance in the most hardcore way possible by chopping off his head. Sure, Michael can survive a lot from stabbing to getting shot to being burned, but decapitation? Look, unless you can regenerate an entire fucking head, this is over. And I love that. This movie works so fantastically as a perfect conclusion to the Halloween franchise. Look, would I prefer it to have addressed Halloween 4 through 6? Sure. But as a trilogy of Halloween 1, 2, and H2O, this is an epic finale that deserves a high spot on my tier list. Yes, that movie is so goddamn good my beard fell off. Try not to get scared about it. Uh, so... Taking Halloween H2O on its own merits, which means just viewing it as a film. And I'm saying that very specifically because I don't want to count anything about Halloween Resurrection within my feelings of Halloween H2O. I want to take Halloween H2O as a full movie from start to finish, assuming everything that happened in that movie is what happened and nothing was retconned. <sighs> I'm not, re I'm not ready to talk about Halloween Resurrection. But just taking Halloween H2O on its own merits, I love bringing back Laurie Strode as a character and making her a full, well-rounded, fleshed-out character, having her face her demons, stand up to Michael Myers. I think the horror is fun. I like that it went back to the simplicity. Look, could there be more gore? Could it have better kills? Could it be a little bit less 90s? I mean, yeah. But this was kind of the style and vibe at the time, and I felt like... After Scream, you know, Halloween H2O really came back and kind of reclaimed itself as one of the titans of horror. Also, I forgot to mention, in the movie Halloween H2O, a couple of the characters are watching the movie Scream 2, which brings a whole bunch of new questions into the scenario, because in the first Scream, it is very clear that the movie Halloween is a movie. So if Halloween is a movie in the Scream universe, how is Scream a movie in the Halloween universe? Of course, maybe it's a whole different version of Scream. Maybe it's a version of Scream that doesn't mention Halloween whatsoever. How would they do that? Because it would completely change the story of the original Scream? I don't know, but Scream 2 is in Halloween H2O, so try to make that fit the best of your ability. Anyways, guys, I think ultimately, because of how much I love this movie, it might not be the best made movie ever. It might not still hold a candle to the original, but... I really, really enjoy this movie. I get a kick out of it. And just viewing it as a finale, imagining in a perfect world where this was the finale of the Halloween franchise, where this was the end. Michael Myers is decapitated. Movie is over. Franchise is complete. In that case, I'm giving Halloween H2O an S tier. I know, I know, but I am, man, I am. I think that if you view this as, as a trilogy, as Halloween 1, Halloween 2, and then Halloween H2O, or if you just view it as a finale to the franchise, if you just want to assume it takes place in the same universe, and you want to say that, you know, they never mention Jamie or any of those characters, whatever, uh, I still think it works great as a finale. And, and as that, I'm putting it as an S tier. But I also am a realist. And I have to live in reality, and I have to live with the fact that Halloween H2O was not the last movie. And that we have to get to Halloween Resurrection, which retroactively changes everything awesome about Halloween H2O. Because for some fucking reason, somebody thought Halloween Resurrection was a good idea. Having the perfect conclusion, the wrap-up full-circle character arc of Laurie Strode, the death on screen of Michael Myers... Not just seeing him shot, not seeing him being burned, but literally watching him get decapitated. 
a most definitive death, the most definitive death the franchise has ever had. Some asshole decided to make another movie and, and not try to do anything interesting with it, but just make it the biggest piece of dog shit to ever exist. And that retroactively moves Halloween H2O down to an A tier. Uh, I'll put it at a high A tier. I still think it's better than Halloween 5 and Halloween 4. But unfortunately, living in the real world, I can't in good conscience keep Halloween H2O at an S tier because of what they did with Halloween Resurrection. Yes, another movie retroactively makes Halloween H2O worse. And normally you would think you could watch every movie on its own merit, but it's because of what Halloween Resurrection does in its first 15 minutes that completely changes everything about Halloween H2O and makes everything awesome about it fucking suck. And I really don't I really don't want to review this movie. This is the worst movie in the entire Halloween franchise. This includes Halloween 6. It includes whatever Rob Zombie does in his remakes. It includes whatever Halloween Ends does. I haven't seen Halloween Ends yet. But I would be willing to bet all of my money that Halloween Ends is still not going to be as bad as Halloween Resurrection. There's no possible way they could ever make another movie in the Halloween franchise that is as bad and as poorly taste as Halloween Resurrection, as disrespectful to the franchise, to the characters, to our intelligence as an audience. There is no movie worse than Halloween Resurrection. I will rank it right now. I haven't even reviewed the movie. It is dead last. It is F-tier ass. In fact, Halloween Resurrection is so bad, it retroactively changes Halloween the Curse of Michael Myers to a D tier because no other category can possibly hold any movie besides Halloween Resurrection. I feel uncomfortable with any movie being ranked in the same spot. So I was wrong. I was wrong. We're going to move Curse of Michael Myers to a D tier because, because Halloween Resurrection exists. I can't, I don't want to review this movie. I don't want to do it. I don't want to rewatch it. I don't want to think about it. I can't do it. I can't rewatch. I can't. I can't do it. I can't watch this fucking movie, man. <sighs> Halloween Resurrection is truly the biggest piece of dog shit, vomit spewing, rat feces, foot smelling, low brow, dumb shit movie that I've ever seen within the Halloween franchise or within most slasher franchises. I legitimately do not want to watch this movie again. I have actually been watching all of these movies, doing a nice marathon rewatch of all the films as I've been reviewing them for you guys uh, piece by piece, but this was the first movie where I was legitimately considering just not watching it again and just going off memory and going off of the plot summary and, and just kind of giving you a review that way without going into it with fresh eyes, a fresh perspective. It's probably been years and years and years since I've watched it. Um, but it's the one movie that I really didn't want to review. And it's not even that it's, like, that horribly made of a movie. You know, I'm not dealing with, like, Birdemic or Sharknado or The Room or anything like that. It's, this, isn't, this isn't Troll 2 territory. If anything, it's a very standard paint-by-numbers slasher movie. You could actually probably interchange it with a lot of the Friday the 13th movies. And if you switch Jason out for Michael, you really wouldn't notice much of a difference in this movie. But I think that's the main problem. The main problem with Halloween Resurrection is that it just tries to be a standard cookie cutter cash in on the franchise. A franchise that had been running for a very, very long time. One that had almost, some could say, ran itself into the ground, but then also revitalized and rejuvenated itself. And you could say, resurrected itself with Halloween H2O. 
And it brought the franchise back into the mainstream. It brought Jamie Lee Curtis back. It brought Michael Myers back as a terrifying figure. It made Halloween legitimate once more. And instead of riding that high, really, they shouldn't have rid it at all. They should have just ended it with H2O because, as I was saying, H2O works as a perfect finale to the entire franchise. Instead, what they tried to do was, of course, capitalize on the success of it, but they had a lot of obstacles. Uh, they, uh, Jamie Lee Curtis, for example, only came back for one scene, one sequence. And, uh, and after that, they just delved into cliché, generic, boring slasher territory while also trying to be hip and trendy and cool and mainstream and capitalize on the new reality TV uh, er emerging social media uh, era of the world. Um, it wasn't until 2001 that Halloween Resurrection came out, and at that time, reality TV was really huge. Uh, obviously, there was, uh, you know, American Idol and Survivor and Big Brother and all that stuff, but there was also the um, the shows like, well, yeah, like, like Big Brother, like a Big Brother type show where it was a bunch of people getting together in a house or in a room, and they had to live with each other, and they had to do things with each other, and uh, you know, challenges and obstacles and all that. It was the sort of era where, like, um, MTV was doing, you know, Room Raiders and The Next Bus and doing all these dating shows and reality shows and putting people in real-life circumstances to see how they interact with one another. So, and I think the, a problem that a lot of movies have, is, uh, not just Halloween Resurrection, but a lot of movies in general, franchise movies, is that if they try so hard to fit in with what is currently popular, like when a movie all of a sudden does a, a found footage style or whatever is popular at the time, you know, they think that they're being trendy and up to date and relevant and, and trying to bring in new viewers and everything from the younger crowd, but what they're really doing is isolating that movie to a specific point in time to where even five years after that movie comes out, it's not relevant anymore. Technology has updated, times have changed, and instead of uh, making a movie that uh, resonates with people, instead what you're doing is basically making a time capsule of that period. So the more you try to stay relevant, in a way, you kind of shoot yourself in the foot and you just kind of fall to the wayside. And because of that, Halloween Resurrection uh, doesn't hold up any better than any of the other Halloween movies. I'd say it holds up the worst. I'd say the 1978 Halloween movie holds up pretty well because you have a standard movie about a girl that's babysitting and a stalker in the bushes. It's pretty timeless. It doesn't hold itself to any of the technology of the time or anything that was popular in the music or media or anything that was going on. It's a very simple, basic story that I think makes it resonate even 40 and going on 50 years later because of that simplicity. But Halloween Resurrection tries so hard to double down into this reality TV, MTV era and make a movie in that vein. And because of that, Halloween Resurrection is just really boring. It's really boring and it doesn't hold up. And I, you could say that like Halloween 6 or upcoming perhaps Rob Zombie's Halloween 2, which is very divisive between people, you could say that those are worst made movies. But I think that Halloween Resurrection... It's not that it's a, a worse made movie, it's that it's a boring, irrelevant movie that doesn't add anything to the Halloween franchise and detracts from the Jamie Lee Curtis, Laurie Strode storyline, which we'll get to here in a minute, and completely shits all over it, is completely disrespectful to it, writes it off, and then instead of continuing the story, because Halloween has always had a story, you know, as, as silly as it may sound, you know, it's a slasher movie. You know, a guy with a knife goes around killing people. Yes, but the Halloween series has always tried to incorporate an ongoing story. Uh, ever since the sequels, you know, as, from Halloween 2 on, they've tried to incorporate a, an ongoing story of Michael Myers wants to kill his sister. Michael Mons Myers wants to kill his niece. Michael is cursed to kill his family. There's a perpetual curse that goes from generation to generation. There's the thorn. There's the cult. Or, uh, you know, 20 years later, I found where you live. I'm coming back to finish the job. There's always been a recurring uh, a narrative that's been going on. There's been characters that have crossed over from movie to movie, from movie to movie. Loomis was in five movies. Um, you know, Laurie Strode now is in three movies, about to be in four. And instead of honoring that and honoring the characters and honoring the legacy and honoring what Halloween was as a franchise, 
Instead, they took a super popular franchise and they tried to squeeze it and pigeonhole it into whatever was popular at the time and make that movie. And they suffered the consequences for it because it's a horrible movie. I, I don't really know anyone that likes it, even in the Halloween like fandom or horror fandom. I never hear anybody talk about Halloween Resurrection in a positive way. So I don't think I'm quite uh, in the minority here. I think that most people will understand where I'm coming from with this. But I can't sit down and watch this movie without at least another giant, large pumpkin spice latte. So uh, we're going to go get one of those. We're going to try to make it through this movie. And uh, I I'm going to be... I just gotta be honest, man. I gotta be honest my entire way through. The worst thing this movie does, besides be boring, is the first 15 minutes. Let's start with the title of this movie. Halloween Resurrection. Now, taking away the stigma of adding a one-word subtitle to a movie franchise eight films deep, and the fact that other movies with resurrection in the title really didn't do so hot, the word itself would actually make a lot of sense if they decided to give three shits about the series to begin with. At the end of Halloween H2O, Michael Myers was definitively dead, decapitated, and gone for good. So bringing him back to another movie would be a pretty interesting challenge. But this word, resurrection, the idea is kind of exciting. Would they literally be resurrecting Michael Myers from the dead? Was he going to come back as an unstoppable zombie, kind of like Jason Voorhees? Maybe they were going to reintroduce cult-like elements back into the story or have something supernatural going on. A group of devil worshippers performing a spell to bring Michael back from beyond the grave in order to continue his work. Given the title, any of this would have made sense, and I wouldn't want them to do another movie to begin with, but if they came up with something awesome for the resurrection concept, I could have been on board with that. Instead, the word resurrection has jack shit to do with the entire movie. It means absolutely nothing. It's just a word for the title. Nobody gets resurrected. Well, nothing except a franchise that should have ended four years before this movie came out. Instead, guess what? Michael was never actually decapitated. In the most ludicrous, bullshit, dumbass, lazy, and disrespectful way possible, the entire perfect ending of H2O is retconned, and for nothing. And all so that they could get Jamie Lee Curtis back for 10 minutes of screen time, just so they could put her on the front of the marketing and trick people into think they were going to see a legitimate continuation of H2O, for which this is not. From what I can tell, it all comes back to longtime producer Mustafa Akkad, who was determined to keep this franchise going forever. While they were finishing up H2O, he had them film extra scenes in order to explain why Michael could still be alive for when they go ahead and make the next movie, because apparently it was contractually mandatory that Michael Myers was not allowed to die, something that Jamie Lee Curtis was unaware of when she went to enter the project and do the story of H2O. And I'm like, what the fuck is happening here? <laughs> I don't understand this. There's a clause in the contract with Mustafa Akkad that says you can't kill him. <laughs> H2O was the story that she wanted to tell along with who was creating the movie at the time, but with this clause, they were saying that they didn't want Michael to die. So they came up with a compromise, which Jamie Lee Curtis has explained in interviews, where they would make it seem like Michael died at the end of the movie. So if you watch the end of H2O, you would believe that Michael is dead completing Lori's story. However, they would come up with some bullshit excuse to explain why Michael is not dead so that they could do another movie. And with that, Jamie Lee Curtis said, fucking kill me. And, and I don't blame her. I guess that's show business, and my hatred for the movie just begins with that. This film is not something anyone cared about or wanted to do. It was legitimately just a cash grab. And I know every movie is meant to make money, and I know that every movie is ultimately a product meant to be consumed, but even if a movie is meant to be sold, usually the director, the screenwriter, and a number of the actors actually care about the story that they're telling, and they want to create something good that people will enjoy and hopefully remember for a long time. This is not that kind of movie. 
Just like Michael himself, this movie is soulless with the blackest eyes. Dollar sign eyes of the entire Halloween franchise, and you can tell that within every single frame. Nobody cared about this movie. And it reflects that in the reception, because I've never heard any Halloween fan say that they love this movie. Anyways, they made it so that before Lori ran off with Michael in the ambulance at the end of H2O, apparently Michael had managed to kill a paramedic and switch their clothes. Yeah, somehow the paramedic coming to get Michael just so happens to have the exact size of Michael's clothing, and Michael somehow had all of the time in the world to remove both of their clothes and dress him up as Michael himself, including the mask. So then, quote, Michael wakes up in the ambulance while Lori was driving it, when it was actually just a regular guy, and the explanation as to why he couldn't talk was because Michael apparently crushed his throat, which makes no sense because in H2O, you can see that he can breathe, he can move around just fine, he moves slowly just like Michael, he has the same mannerisms as Michael, because it is Michael. These scenes make it out to be Michael Myers, and this is the stupidest fucking retcon of all time. You remember how he was pinned against the van and the tree? Remember how he could move perfectly fine, almost like he had some insane demonically enhanced super strength? Hmm. Or how about the moment where he literally puts his hands on his face? You know, a moment where he could literally remove the mask if he wanted to, and show Laurie that he's not Michael Myers, but instead just some regular guy? There are literally so many opportunities for him to take off the mask, but he just doesn't and so this movie is saying that Laurie Strode decapitated an innocent man and she begins resurrection going crazy from that in an asylum what the fuck and okay you know maybe I could forgive that insanely dumbass dog shit retcon if Laurie was the main character again for the entire film maybe there was more story to tell maybe it would have been cool if the whole movie took place in the asylum that that actually might be interesting but it doesn't Laurie Strode, the original survivor from the first Halloween film, is killed off in Halloween Resurrection within the first 15 minutes. She runs from Michael a little bit. Also, Michael's mask, again, looks awful here, and why does he have an afro? I don't know. Laurie traps him on the roof, but in the last moment, he grabs her and stabs her in the back. And, and that's it. This is the end to Laurie Strode. After all of that, she dies in the most boring way possible in a film opener, shoved into the movie that nobody wanted to make in a super boring kill. As she descends to the trees below, we feel our own sanity and tolerance for this film also being lost within the abyss. Not only is this a horrible end to a legacy character, but it's also the second time that they've done something like this. And considering that Resurrection is the final film in the series before it gets rebooted, there is once again no redemption. And again, I could be okay with killing Lori if it meant something to this movie, if it had an impact on the film. For example, if Michael's goal is to kill off his family still in this timeline, well then guess what? He still has a family member out there. He has John, played by Josh Hartnett, that was in Halloween H2O. Where has he been the last four years? How does he feel about his mom killing a man and being locked in an asylum? He's still alive, so wouldn't it make sense for Michael to go after him? Wouldn't it make sense for this storyline of this movie to be about him? Maybe Lori's death is just meant to pass the torch to the next of kin. I would totally be okay with Josh Hartnett becoming an MC of the Halloween series. That sounds awesome. If this was a Michael versus Josh Hartnett movie, I'd be all for it. And I'd be okay with Laurie's death because of that too, but it's it's not. He's nowhere to be found and is never mentioned. Instead, we cut to a group of random college kids that are boring and generic as all fuck, and I don't care about any of them. They literally wouldn't even be in the middest tier of a Friday the 13th collection of characters. These are just stupid young people put here to be stupid, horny, and to get killed off and turn what separated Halloween from the other generic slashers into the exact same kind of thing. I guess the main character of this movie is a chick named Sarah. I just watched the movie and I still couldn't tell you anything interesting about her. Her and her friends are selected to go on to this reality TV show where they have to spend the night in Michael Myers' childhood house. Cameras are everywhere to watch them and they wear camera headsets as well. It's all part of a channel called Dangertainment, run by, um, Tyra Banks and Busta Rhymes. Yeah, Tyra Banks is in this movie. 
though she has even less screen time than Lori had. So once again, Tyra Banks is only here to put her face on the poster in order to trick people into seeing a movie where its actual main characters are people that nobody cares about. Sarah also has this online friendship with a guy going by the name of Deckard. Okay, so I give this movie a ton of shit, rightfully so, but I will say this came out in 2002. This was the very early stages of the internet and social media, and a lot of us were using AIM Instant Messenger at the time. And as far as their dynamic, it actually wasn't that uncommon to talk to and make friends with somebody you didn't know or didn't even know what they looked like online back in the day. I'm not saying it's a good idea for teens to text anonymous people over the internet and grow attachments to them, but we all did it back in these times, like 2002, 2003. Like, it was a normal thing. But enough of a history lesson for you. In this movie, Deckard hides his identity because he's actually a high school student and she's in college and also Deckard is a nerd. Get it? He uses the name Deckard from Blade Runner as a screen name and then later he dresses up as Vincent from Pulp Fiction because, you know, he likes movies because he's a nerd, a nerdy teen that has an attractive girl out of his league and he messages her every day and assumes that she would never like him because he's a nerd. Get it? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's the fucking same trope you've seen 10,000 times. All the unlikable, boring characters are put into the Myers house, which once again looks completely different than any other version. That would be now four different architecture designs to one house over the course of eight movies. Interesting. Also, wait a minute. Everybody knows Michael Myers is still alive and on the loose in this timeline. If he wasn't killed at the end of the H2O, that means that he's still out there. He literally just killed multiple people only a few years ago. So this would be like making that Jeffrey Dahmer Netflix special while at the same time he was still out there butchering people. So what the fuck? Isn't that kind of in poor taste? Also, it's a weird idea to do a show in the house because it's not like Michael was brought up in some weird ancient Dracula castle. This is literally just a, a house. It's not that interesting. The Dangertainment people knew that too, and they tried to spice things up, leaving weapons, a weird baby chair, and chains in the basement to make it look scarier, but lo and behold, the real Michael Myers is here somewhere, lying in wait. But why? No, really, why is Michael here? Why did he return to Haddonfield in the first place? There's literally nothing for him to do here except, I guess, eat rats in his basement. There's also that scene where Busta Rhymes dresses as Michael Myers to try to scare the kids but meets the real Michael Myers and somehow with all of the variations of masks over the years they are happening to wear the same exact one and maybe that's the reason why Michael didn't kill him right away. It literally makes no sense. As expected, the characters start getting killed off uh, and the audience all thinks it's fake except for Deckard who is the only kid smart enough to realize that Katie Sackhoff's head was actually decapitated for real. But also, yeah, there is nothing here to care about. I mean, I could talk about the characters exploring the rooms, but why? All of these characters suck. They're not memorable. They can barely be considered characters. So, so maybe, just maybe, the movie can make up for all of that by just being a stupid gore fest and having some epic kills. For the love of God, if you won't give me anything else, just give me some good gore. And guess what? It doesn't. Every kill is just a quick stab, the one decapitation that looks cheesy as fuck. Michael is supposed to have crushed this guy's head, but we don't even get to see it. We just hear like a little sound effect while he grabs his face. Looks like he's about to kiss him. Like, come on, guys. Give us an exploding head or something. Give me something I can like about this movie. Oh, but it gets better. You know that they've tried to kill Michael Myers many different ways over the years. They've tried bullets, fire, various melee weapons. But you know what they've never tried? Buster Rhymes doing some motherfucking kung fu. Yeah, his character quirk is that he loves kung fu, and he starts doing some jump spin crescent kicks on Michael's face. You know, I'd be fine with a character wanting to square up and try to fight Michael one-on-one, -on -one, but doing it like this just makes it feel like they don't give one solidary shit about this movie. You know what, Buster Rhymes wants to do some kung fu? Fuck it, let's have him do some kung fu. I don't really know if it was Buster Rhymes' idea, but it, I low-key kind of hope it was. And not just once. In the finale, Sarah is trying to ward Michael off with a chainsaw. Also, F for this movie for having a chainsaw and having nobody get killed with it. But you think Buster Rhymes might be a down and out, but no. The door comes crashing down, and he's like, Trick or treat, motherfucker. 
and he comes in for round two of the Kung Fu. He then zaps Michael in the dick with an electric wire. No, I I'm not kidding. And when he does, there's this weird sound effect of something that sounds like a ghost moaning. Please don't tell me that that was supposed to actually be Michael. The first time he says anything and it's a kinky ghost-like moan from being zapped in the dick. Anyways, Michael gets tangled up in some wires and he burns to a crisp again. And yeah, there's a subplot with Deckard helping Sarah navigate through the house through texting, but does anyone care? I don't know. I sure don't. Finally, the cops come after all is said and done, and Sarah and Buster Rhymes are the only survivors. I know his character isn't called Buster Rhymes, but let's face it, th this is Buster Rhymes. Anyway, Michael's body gets taken to the morgue, and guess what happens? Yup, in the very last shot of the movie, his eyes open, and it cuts to credits leaving us on a cliffhanger of Michael still alive in order to come back in Halloween 9, except there is no Halloween 9. This was the last shot and the last movie in the original Halloween run before it got rebooted, which means instead of having the literal perfect ending with H2O, they crammed a whole ass other movie, destroyed H2O's legacy in the process, ruined Laurie Strode's character, and made us sit through an hour and 10 minutes of absolute bullshit with characters we don't care about in order to end the movie on a fucking cliffhanger that to this day has never continued. So thank you everybody that made this movie. We appreciate it. I have been pissed off about this movie for literally 20 years now, and you had it, man. You had the end. The end was right there. I really like to pretend that this movie doesn't exist, and I have not rewatched it in years, and I was hoping that when I did for this video, I would find something, just something to enjoy about it, but there is nothing here. At least in Halloween 6, we had Dr. Loomis through pretty much the whole movie, and at least it had some good kills. Resurrection offers you nothing except pain, anguish, and disappointment, and worst of all, it's boring. The writing is awful, it's a slight on the entire franchise, nobody making the movie even cared about it. It even had the director that made Halloween 2, but you would never guess because Halloween 2 is actually a competently made movie, and, and this is not. Anyways, the only solace here is that they didn't attempt to ruin it any further. They didn't try to bring back a new group of random teens for the next movie. Nope, instead, after this, the entire franchise would be scrapped, and they would start from scratch with a remake. So I thought now might be an interesting time to do a little bit of a detour. And before we get to the Rob Zombie Halloween within the next timeline of Halloween films, talk about the Halloween movies that were almost made, but weren't. There's a five-year gap in between 2002's Resurrection and 2007's Halloween remake reboot that Rob Zombie did, but in between, in that five years, they weren't just sitting around. They actually had a number of Halloween sequel ideas that they were potentially going to do. And I remember Halloween 9 was a thing. So this was the very early stages of the internet, and I remember this was around the time that I was really getting into horror movies. When I was younger, when I was like 12, 13, 14 years old, these are the years where I was like heavily getting into horror movies. This is when I was watching all of the Halloweens, all of the Friday the 13th, all of the Nightmare on Elm Streets, all of the Hellraisers. This is when I was watching all of that shit, and I specifically remember the Halloween website at the time had updates and articles about Halloween 9. Halloween 9 was going to be a thing. It wasn't originally intended to be scrapped and start over with a remake. They were legitimately going to make Halloween 9. There was even a competition where uh, people online could send in videos uh, of themselves either re reenacting a scene from the Halloween franchise or making a Halloween short film or doing something interesting with the Halloween property. Back then, they were actually like encouraging that shit instead of just copywriting strike everybody that was making a fan film. I don't know if they did that, but like movie studios do that. You know what I'm talking about. But back then, it was encouraged, and they were going to pick the best one, and the winner got to be in Halloween 9. I think eventually the winner actually did get to be in uh, the Rob Zombie Halloween, but the scene got cut, so F in the chat for that. <laughs> but it's not unfair to say that Halloween Resurrection failed on all accounts. It failed critically, the fans didn't like it, it made almost half of what H2O made in the box office, so all around, it was representative of what that film was, which is a complete total trash heap. So, in order to continue forward with Halloween, there was a lot of brainstorming ideas of what to do and where to take this franchise because they wanted to hold on to it 
a uh, longtime producer Mustafa Akkad was still pretty much in charge of what was going on with it and he wanted to do more movies. So a very, very interesting one. I'm going to talk about a couple of them. But the main one I want to talk about is this right behind me. A film that could have potentially been called Halloween, <laughs> which I love that title. But the movie, Halloween, where does it come from? Why does it exist? What's it all about? I really can't tell you the full details, but I can tell you with what information has been around online since uh, its conception up until now, what's been revealed about it. There's been a lot of information that's been out there, but uh, never really got the full story of everything. But basically what we can say is that Halloween Resurrection came out in 2002. And the very next year in 2003, there was a movie called Freddy vs. Jason, which of course put two franchises together, now both owned by New Line Cinema, Freddy Krueger from the Nightmare on Elm Street series and Jason Voorhees from the Friday the 13th series, two titans of horror, titans of the slasher genre, were both owned by the same company, and they decided to put those two together in a movie for a balls-to-the-wall battle royale between the two of them. That in itself was a concept that was going around for about 10 years prior before that movie actually got made. In one of the Friday the 13th films, Jason Goes to Hell, at the very end of that movie, when Jason goes to hell, you see his hockey mask sitting on top of the sand, and Freddy Krueger's hand comes out and drags it down beneath the sand. And ever since then, fans were kind of going crazy about a potential Freddy versus Jason movie, or Freddy and Jason in the same movie, which at the time, something like that wasn't really common. It wasn't heard of. It wasn't something you thought you could do. And I'm pretty sure, I have to fact check this, I've been doing Halloween movie trivia you know, fact checking. So I'm a little bit foggy on my Friday the 13th, but I think that originally they just put the Freddy hand in there as sort of like a, an Easter egg or a nod, or just to say like, Hey, uh, the studio has the rights to Freddy too. What would be a cool, like little ending? I don't think they were thinking too deeply about continuing it, especially since the next, uh, Friday the 13th movie they made was Jason X taking Jason into space. Coincidentally, Pinhead has also been to space, but neither of them have ever made a space movie as good as Leprechaun 4 in space. If you haven't seen Leprechaun 4 in space, you're doing yourself a huge disservice. We got the Leprechaun, we got lightsabers, we got giant Leprechauns, we got spider monsters, we got random naked chicks for no reason, we got a guy that's a military general using nunchucks while wearing a dress. Everything in that movie is fucking fantastic. Go watch Leprechaun 4. But I'm talking about all these horror movies. Anyways... It took forever for Freddy vs. Jason actually to come together and become a full-fledged movie, but after about 10 years of development hell and different scripts and different timelines and trying to figure out how to do it, eventually it happened, and it actually did pretty well, uh, especially considering the genre, considering it was like the 8th uh, Nightmare on Elm Street movie and the 11th Friday the 13th movie, really, really deep within, you know, uh, kind of milking these characters for as much as we possibly can. But this was a new kind of fresh idea, and I loved Freddy vs. Jason when it came out. It was one of my favorite movies. You know, I was the perfect age for it. I was like 14 years old. I got to see it in the theater. It was my first time seeing these characters on the big screen. I loved it, man. I ate that shit up. I still think it's a great movie. And it did really, really well. So other companies were thinking about what characters do they own that would make it a possibility to put two kind of titans of horror in a movie together and have them fight each other. Even Freddy vs. Jason, they were thinking about who else can we add? And for a while it was like, let's add Ash from the Evil Dead, which unfortunately never happened as a movie, but did happen as a comic book. And the people that owned the Halloween franchise also happened to own the Hellraiser franchise. So there were thoughts, ideas, talks, pitches, scripts made that could potentially put Michael Myers up against Pinhead from Hellraiser. But this is a very weird concept, which is not as simple as Freddy vs. Jason. As different as Freddy and Jason are, they at least sort of do the same thing. They are slashers, they, they haunt people, they kill teenagers, they, they are within the same genre. Hellraiser was never a slasher series, not really. In Pinhead was never the main antagonist of the Hellraiser films. Not really. Uh, I did do an in-depth review of the first two Hellraiser movies. After that, I think they all fall to shit. I haven't seen the, uh, the new one, the remake, as far as the recording of this video, so I can't comment on that. But everything from Hellraiser 3, Bloodline, uh, all the rest, they're, they're just absolute trash. But one thing that tends to be a theme in most of them 
is that Pinhead is sort of this ominous figure in the background. He's not really too hands-on. Even in the first movie, the main antagonist is really frank. The Cenobites are sort of this thing that are this concept are, of these creatures that are beyond human understanding that exist within this other dimension that take you into it, torture, pleasure, pain, give you kind of the, the full experience that a human body and a human mind can possibly take before its insanity breaks. Like, it's they're very, very different. It's not like somebody going around with a knife in killing people. And although they did add a lot of supernatural elements to Michael Myers as the sequels went on, it, it's it's very different. Michael Myers is there. He's, he's haunting you in the shadows. He's showing up. He's stabbing the shit out of you. With Pinhead and the other Cenobites, you know, you got to find a puzzle box. You got to solve it. You get transported to hell. You, like, things happen. Like, it's, it's a whole different thing. So how in the world do we get these two together? So the basic general concept from the versions that I saw, and you guys can correct me if you know extra added information about what it was supposed to be or different versions, but the ones that I have mostly been seeing uh, involve a complete, uh, basically, retcon of the Michael Myers character in order to try to make it fit in with Hellraiser. So what they do is essentially go back in time and show Michael, My Michael Myers' origin as a child. And instead of just a child that either just snaps one day and decides to kill people for no discernible reason, which adds to the terror of it, besides it being some kind of curse of the thorn, or besides it being what Rob Zombie is going to do and have him have like the cliche tragic background, you know, of a horrible upbringing uh, of an abusive family, you know, instead of all of that, the thing that makes Michael Myers go crazy is because he's given a puzzle box. He's given one of the lament configurations from Hellraiser, I think by trick-or-treating. I think that explains why he was in the clown costume. He was out trick-or-treating, got this, took it home, solved it, and then all of a sudden, instead of like being dragged into hell, a demonic spirit from hell came out and possessed Michael Myers. And in a lot of version is uh, Samhain, which of course, Sam Hain, as Dr. Loomis likes to say, that Michael Myers wrote on the wall in Halloween 2. And honestly... It it kind of it kind of works. I I still I don't like it. I don't like the idea of it because every time you start taking away power and autonomy from Michael Myers making his own decisions, I don't like that. What I find scary about Michael Myers is that he's unreasonable. You don't know why he's doing what he's doing. He's just going to keep doing it. He's like a machine that just never stops. Never is just going to continue killing no matter what. You can't reason with him. You can't talk to him. He has the devil's eyes. Like he just is this person or is this thing is this entity that you can't explain, you can't quantify, you can't pin down, and ultimately you can't stop. That's what makes Michael Myers so scary to me. So the more that you try to explain him, the less you get from that. Also, the more supernatural you make it, you take it out of the hands of Michael himself, which doesn't make it seem like for some reason a child was just born evil, right? Or decided to be evil. Um, and instead, you know, it's like a demonic possession. So how much is Michael Myers still there? Like, is there, a, is there a sense of who he was as a child still there? I always also see Michael Myers being very childlike, like he, even though he can drive and, you know, follow maps and figure out and understand people and stuff. I don't know. But I, I always view him as sort of like that six-year-old that never really changed. Like, he's still like a six-year-old killer, you know, beneath it all. But anyways, the, the Halloween movie would cause him to be possessed by whatever came out of the configuration, and that's what caused Michael Myers to be the way that he was throughout all of the movies. And then this movie would pick up, I, I think, in real time after Resurrection, and somebody solves the puzzle box, which for some reason draws Michael Myers back to that location. I think it happens back at his house. We can't escape that fucking house no matter what we do. We can't get rid of the Myers house. It would probably look different. It would probably be designed completely differently in this movie too. And then Hell, uh, Pinhead and the Cenobites show up and they recognize the evil that's inside Michael and want to bring him back into Hell because he's been gone for so long. Sort of like coming back for Frank in the first Hellraiser movie. But of course, Michael doesn't want to go anywhere. And this is what causes the conflict of Pinhead fighting Michael. Uh, and yeah, yeah, it, it could have worked, but, uh, conceptually it's a little, it's a bit of a retcon, but it doesn't, I don't think it's as bad as what they tried to do with the cult thing in Halloween 6, to be honest with you. Um, and, and it could have meant for something kind of cool to come out of it. I don't know how the fights would work because 
Pinhead has like all of this demonic supernatural power controlling all these chains and like disgusting things that he can do and Michael has a knife. Michael's like pretty much like impenetrable, but so is Pinhead except in Halloween 2 when he gets killed like a little bitch. Yeah, he does. Um so I don't really know where the fight would go or how they would do the fight or if the fight would take place in hell. Uh it seems like it was going to, so who knows. But I, I kind of just like the novelty idea. I kind of would have liked to see it for that reason. But it never ultimately got off the ground uh, because the producers that have been behind uh, Halloween since the entire series had ran never really got on board with the idea, never really liked the idea. And also, it was making Halloween and Michael Myers' origin very dependent on the Hellraiser franchise. And between the two franchises, Halloween had been pretty successful for most of its run. Hellraiser was on that like complete straight-to-video, straight-to-DVD sequel after sequel that nobody has seen and nobody cares about anymore. It was kind of in the place where like people really liked the first movie, some people really liked the second movie, but then nobody cared about it, and it's been a long time since there's been a good Hellraiser movie. Whereas Halloween has had its ups and downs, but overall it's a very recognizable franchise. So if you're making Halloween dependent on Hellraiser, you know, it was sort of like they thought Halloween doesn't need Hellraiser. Hellraiser might need Halloween, but Halloween didn't need Hellraiser. So ultimately it fell apart and they never got around to actually doing it. But conceptually, that's kind of like where it came from. Uh, but that's not all. So they were going to go forward and actually do a Halloween 9. And they had various versions of different kinds of movies they would make. One of them would have been called Halloween Bad Blood. And if you watched my rants from earlier in this video, you were probably sure I was going to bring this up if you knew about it because this movie was supposed to bring back Jamie Lloyd, played by Daniel Harris once again, and give her a sense of redemption. Now, I don't know how they would have done it because I didn't read the script. I haven't seen like details from it, so I don't know if this was supposed to take place in the H2O timeline. I'm assuming it was since it was a continuation from Resurrection and since Jamie died in Halloween 6. So if you are bringing Jamie back, I guess Laurie Strode did have Jamie and just never mentioned her and never talked about her. I don't know. I don't know why you wouldn't just do uh, Josh Hartnett's character, John. Once again, where did he go? Just disappeared after Halloween H2O and like is never talked about and Michael never goes after him. I guess he just gets off scot-free. Maybe it's because he's not a woman. I don't know. But anyways, somehow Jamie Lloyd is alive and would be age appropriate of what Daniel Harris would be in real time and Daniel Harris would uh, supposedly had been playing her and she's aware that Michael is after her and she's been doing all of these things she's basically like Laurie Strode winds up being in the Halloween 2018 movie where she's got like a you know all this training all this weaponry she's got like a fortress set up like she's good to go like she's been aware that Michael's is coming after her. she's aware of how strong he is and she's trying to fight back against him uh, but something happens within this movie where she winds up at the hospital and this is where it gets weird. Like, I like the idea of bringing Jamie back, show some justice for her, get Daniel Harris back in there. I'm on board with all that. But then it gets weird because the movie's called Bad Blood for a reason and they went like full hardcore, like it's the bloodline of Michael Myers that he's trying to kill. And she winds up at the hospital and there's some weird blood transfusion thing and there's like a mix up and her blood gets given to like, other people in the hospital like as a as just when they need blood it was just given to them and since her blood was now in them now they were all potential victims of michael myers and what this was supposed to do is like expand the universe that was the idea behind it that you know he would be going after other people movie to movie and it would make sense rather than being random characters like halloween resurrection however i think that idea was stupid like i think that's fucking dumb uh, and how would Michael, he would just like sense that they would have like his blood. Like, I, I don't know, man, you, you, you set me up with like a Jamie comeback story. I dig it. You set me up with like the bloodline thing, but then blood transfusion, other people, other victims. I, I don't know where they were going with that, but that was like one idea for Halloween night. There was also supposed to be another version that would actually bring back Buster Rhymes from Halloween Resurrection. <laughs> Okay, we can make fun of it as much as we want, but to be completely fair, Buster Rhymes was the best part of Halloween Resurrection. Not for good reasons, because that movie is so terrible that when he's on screen, he's actually hilarious, and it like gives you some sense of enjoyment for the ridiculousness of it. Not in a good way, it's kind of like how you find joy from Batman and Robin. 
Like, it's not good, but it's so bad that it's funny, and so you start to enjoy it. But he's not the only character they were going to bring back. They were going to do, like, a full reunion of characters. They were going to bring back Buster Rhymes' character, um, supposedly Josh Hartnett's character, and supposedly characters from the earlier films, like uh, Sheriff Brackett from the first movie, and uh, I, I forget who else, but, like, a handful of... Uh, oh, oh, yeah, Tommy Doyle. They were going to bring back uh, Paul Rudd. They wanted to basically do, like, a, a reunion... You know, like a, a Infinity War or like an Avengers of the Halloween uh, franchise. And in a way, I really, really like that idea because like I said, I'm a fan of the storyline of these movies as cheesy as that might be. I would have loved to see Tommy Doyle and uh, Jamie and uh, Josh Hartnett as John Tate and all of these characters. Even fuck, even Busta Rhymes. I don't care. Even Busta Rhymes. Put them all in the same movie. Um, and they were supposed to be like he was making a documentary, like Buster Rhymes' character transitions from the rea reality TV into making a documentary about Michael Myers, but at the same time, Michael Myers returns to kind of uh, hunt them down. So essentially, he gets all of them in one location to premiere the film, and then Michael Myers shows up and like wreaks havoc somehow. He finds them all. Uh, but it would be a unique thing where like he'd be making a documentary. So you'd be watching a movie, but then there would also be like the documentary version too where you'd be have like interviews of the victims and stuff and it would feel like sort of a true crime type thing. I don't I don't know, man. I could go either way with this. Like in a way it sounds kind of corny, but in another way I kind of would like to see these characters together. You know, I, I'd like to bring them all together. Like I, I keep think I keep wishing that like, I haven't gotten to 2018 yet, but like I, I keep wishing that they would have took the opportunity to put Jamie Lee Curtis and Daniel Harris in the same movie. Like, like you could do it. It's right there. It's right there. Um, I don't think Paul Rudd would ever come back. I think he hates Halloween, uh, the part that he played. So I don't think he would. So you could recast him. It would be fine. You know. Um, and then who else? If Josh Hartnett came back, I thought that would be great too. I think he's a super underrated actor. So that's another one. Um, and then there were also various other ones too. There was like a Halloween asylum movie where Michael Myers would just be in the asylum. They would have caught him and then he would have like – movie would, whole movie basically would have taken place within the asylum. So that would have been interesting I guess. Um, there was another one that was going to be Halloween Returns that they were just going to retcon everything including the first movie. So it would be like a remake but at the same time – it relies on your knowledge of the Halloween franchise. So it, it's like super complicated because they go back to the original, but things are different and they change things. It's kind of like a fucking Terminator time loop, time hop thing where they t change things that you are aware of. I don't know, man. It sounded really complicated and confusing to me, but I, I don't know. So all of these were, were potentials and options and all of them where they were trying to get made within that five-year time period. Um, unfortunately, so this is actually like a real thing that's like an actual tragedy so going out of film so mustafa akkad who i've talked about through this entire video I, who actually i learned a lot about by making this video i was aware of who he was like i knew he was a producer on the halloween movies and i knew he had produced like all of the original uh series but i didn't know like anything about this guy i didn't really know like his relationship with john carpenter and how that started and or how it ended um so uh he apparently passed away which I, I was aware that he passed away, but I didn't realize it happened with like a real life tragedy. There was a, a bombing at a hotel that he was staying at and he was actually killed within that bombing. Yes, apparently he passed away in 2005 with his daughter, unfortunately. They were staying at this hotel together and it was like a, a, a coverted um, suicide bombing thing. Uh, and he received some injuries, was taken to the hospital according to this, according to the article I'm reading but then uh, passed away of injuries a couple of days later, um, which is crazy. That's fucking nuts. Uh, the 2005 Amman bombings. That apparently happened in Amman, Jordan, uh, which is a country in Southeast Asia. Um, so, yeah, absolute, like, horrific tragedy uh, that, like, I can't, I didn't even, I had no knowledge of. Before making this video, I had no knowledge of that. Um, but... Uh, going back to the Halloween franchise. So basically the reason, one of the reasons that they decided to go with a remake instead of trying to make any of these versions work or deciding on which to do for a Halloween 9, um, Mustafa had produced all of the Halloween movies up to Resurrection. 
And so the idea behind it is his son and, you know, the other people involved, they wanted to kind of start fresh. They wanted to have Mustafa Akkad have his era of Halloween and not continue that series and not continue that franchise. And I'm sure, like, you know, the reception of Halloween Resurrection played a part. And I'm sure the options they had for Halloween 9 played a part. But I think the main reason was, I think, because they wanted to kind of hold that legacy as what it was. That's the last movie that was made while he was alive. Let's not touch it. So that was part of the decision-making process. So instead, they decided to go uh, in the opposite route and just start from scratch, start from the beginning, and make a remake of the original Halloween. And with that, my friends, we are back to the Halloween timeline board, having now gone through three out of the five different Halloween timelines, having starting at the original, going into Halloween 2, zooming over to the tangent universe of Halloween 3, back to the OG universe for 4, 5, and 6, then into the third universe for Halloween 2 to H2O to Resurrection, and now we are finally going into the next one, which is the Rob Zombie-verse uh, over here. And this, of course, is also its own thing. It is not connected to any of the other movies, including the original Halloween, as in this is a remake. We are in remake territory. Therefore, this is its own thing, its own universe, its own version of the characters. And how you feel about the Halloween remakes is really dependent on how you feel about Rob Zombie as a filmmaker, as a director. I would say that uh, other than the original Halloween itself, the two Rob Zombie Halloweens are the most distinctive as far as a director's style. Halloween 2 through all the way through Resurrection, I don't really feel a specific filmmaker style or vision necessarily with them. I feel like they are very much horror movies that are meant to be that style of horror movie, that style of slasher. I don't really sense a signature vibe with it. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. You're making a specific style and kind of movie, so you play by the numbers to make that movie. That's not always a bad thing. Sometimes a slasher movie can just be a slasher movie. It doesn't have to be like an artistic artur, you know, specific kind of thing. But when it came to the original, I felt like it was, and especially the two Rob Zombie movies. So these are really dependent on how you feel about Rob Zombie as a filmmaker. If you don't know, Rob Zombie, of course, was a, a guy that was a musical artist first with his band White Zombie. He did sort of rock, retro style, a little bit of techno-ish kind of stuff in there. Uh, and then he got a little bit more famous when he kind of went off and just did Rob Zombie underneath his own title. Uh, which got a little bit more popular, the famous album, Hellbilly Deluxe, which of course has Dragula in it. Speaking of which, Dragula was based on the car from the Munsters. Recently, Rob Zombie just did a movie version of the Munsters that did not feature the Dragula car. I don't know, missed opportunity there. Also, I very much recently just watched the Munsters. And I don't think I've recovered yet. Way before The Munsters was made, back in 2007, before this time, Rob Zombie had only made two other movies, House of a Thousand Corpses, which came out in 2003, and its sequel, The Devil's Rejects, which came out in 2005. And in this time period, I was a pretty big Rob Zombie fan. I liked his music well enough. I've always been a fan of metal, rock, whatever, so he's sort of adjacent to the kind of music I like. But more particularly... I do have to say, I, I would be 100% honest, I like House of a Thousand Corpses pretty well. I think it's a, a decent first movie. I think it kind of works as a strange, like, bizarre 70s music video kind of thing. Like, it's he does a lot of kind of weird artsy things with it, which he would, of course, triple down in, you know, further on in his career. But The Devil's Rejects, which came out in 2005, which is technically a sequel to House of a Thousand Corpses, although stylistically those movies are polar opposites. Also, you can pretty much watch The Devil's Rejects on its own without having ever seen House of a Thousand Corpses before. And in many ways, I feel like you should. Um, even though there is a story beat that kind of like goes off of something that happened in House of a Thousand Corpses, I still don't really think that you need to watch it to see Devil's Rejects. I think Devil's Rejects is a goddamn horror masterpiece. And I'm not kidding. 
I really, really do. I think the way that movie is filmed, I think it looks so raw, realistic, gritty. I love the kind of desert aesthetic to it. The cinematography is great. And I love the main characters, the actors that they pick to play. Uh, Otis by um, Bill Mosley, Sid Haig in the movie. And just the fact that this movie is able to take these like horrific, nasty, disgusting, vile serial killers and make you kind of like them and make you relate to them and have them make you laugh and have them give you like these precious little family moments while at the same time they're going on you know doing these horrific things like tearing people's faces off uh bill mosley has that one great scene where he's standing there and, and like the camera angle is so low his hair's flown in his face and he's just like I want you to pray to your God. I want you to pray that he comes and save you. I want lightning to crash down on my fucking head. And then he's like, I am the devil and I am here to do the devil's work. Bro, scariest fucking shit ever. Imagine you're just in the middle of the desert and some hillbilly asshole says that to you while you're bleeding out. Like that is fucking terrifying. Love that movie. I love the intensity to it. I love the devil's rejects, man. I fucking love that movie and to this day i don't think rob zombie has ever made a movie as good as the devil's rejects unfortunately a lot of his movies are very hit or miss with people and it's because i feel like rob zombie doesn't compromise on many things he makes the movies that he wants to make which gives him his signature standout style and it's a matter of being an audience member whether or not you vibe with that style or whether or not you don't and i feel like a lot of people in the general audience do not vibe with his style. He usually has his characters constantly curse, you know, tons of F-bombs everywhere, tons of nudity, like a, a bunch of gore. And then he does like a lot of artistic things with the way that it, uh, shots are lit and the way that um, the camera is set up. And he does a lot of weird, interesting dreamlike things that his characters go through, things that they are envisioning, um, like with Lords of Salem or just kind of like as raw and gritty and like, just uncomfortable as you possibly can get with a movie like 31. So this is what he does, right? But he seemed like the guy that might be able to take on the Halloween franchise because his first two movies were pretty decent. And like I said, Devil's Rejects was a masterpiece in my opinion. So to go to a guy like Rob Zombie to do a Halloween film wasn't exactly as probably uh, concerning as it would be now that he's had like probably like seven or eight films at this point where you could look at his filmography as a whole and be like, mm, I don't know if we want this guy to touch our insanely popular property that we have right now that's near and dear to us. But at the time, this seemed like the way to go. Plus, you throw Rob Zombie's name on it, then you have his niche, you have all of his fans that'll be interested in to see it, you're rebooting it from the ground up. So this was a big deal. This was something that mattered because... We aren't continuing the series anymore. We're we're remaking it. We're starting from scratch. We're making Halloween again. So we're making the first movie. This is the second movie that is titled Halloween. There is a third movie titled Halloween that's not a remake, though. It gets a little bit confusing, if you couldn't tell. And his Halloween and Halloween 2 are both very, very different. And we'll get to that also. But uh, we have a little bit of a split here in the fandom. There are some people that really, really love Rob Zombie's version of Halloween and his universe and what he did with it. There are some people that want it to burn in the grave and never, ever see the light of day again. There are some people that consider Rob Zombie's Halloween movies in the same vein that I consider Halloween Resurrection. Um, and there are some people that think Rob Zombie's Halloween is better than the original. I think they might be smoking crack, but I can see at least where they're coming from. Because Rob Zombie does something very specific with the first Halloween. And it's kind of hard to talk about just going piece by piece as I have been doing with these movies. Instead, I kind of want to give you the overall gist of what this movie is and then get into a little bit more of the specifics. So come with me into the Zombieverse and let's talk about the Halloween remakes. For the Rob Zombie Halloween remake, he took almost the exact opposite approach of John Carpenter. But to a degree, I can't really blame him. He didn't want to make the same exact movie, and any attempt to outright copy Carpenter's version would just be in poor taste. Does anyone remember the shot-for-shot -shot remake of Psycho? Not at all. Also, Carpenter himself once did a remake for the movie The Thing, so... In a roundabout way, doing Halloween the way that they did was the most John Carpenter thing that you could do. The original film was meant to be a simple movie on a small budget. 
The remake had way better funding and was going off an established franchise at this point. It was time to shake things up. The main thing that Zombie did was to make the entire first half of the movie a Michael Myers origin story. In fact, I would argue that this is the first movie where Michael Myers is the main character. Yes, he's always the focal point of the movies, but he's always the antagonist to a Laurie, a Jamie, or a Loomis, or whoever else. In this movie, the story definitively follows Michael virtually all the way through it. I would honestly go so far as to say that Michael is the protagonist of this movie, which, on one hand, is a really cool idea. On the other hand, and this is where a large portion of the controversy comes in, that means that this movie really delves into explaining Michael Myers, causing some fans, and myself included originally, to think that it takes away from the things that make Michael scary. The fact that we don't know or shouldn't know why this six-year-old child just snapped one day and decided killing was something that he wanted to do as a career. This movie will eventually take place in modern times, but for his childhood, it all begins in 1990. Also, Michael is a little bit older here than in the previous version. He's 10 years old instead of 6. And here, there is no mystery whatsoever as to Michael's murderous ways. Instead, we are dropped into an abusive, low-class family unit where Michael's mother is a stripper trying to make ends meet. His dad is verbally abusive to him. His older sister is a big old thought who doesn't care about him. And Lori is a baby that never stops screaming. In the first 15 minutes of this film, there is probably more curse words than in the entire filmography up to this point. Rob Zombie's dialogue isn't exactly the best, and it could very well be intentional, but dropping you into this world where it's extremely overbearing, but the amount of yelling, cursing, and sexual innuendos that are within this opening scene is enough to fill a whole movie's worth. So right away, you see this movie isn't hiding what it's trying to do. It takes the cliched approach of saying that Michael was from a horrible upbringing, he was an outcast, he was picked on at school, and he has the typical early warning signs of a serial killer in that he loves to kill and torture small animals. It's all very on the nose, and at first can kind of make you roll your eyes with its direction, but I think it gets much better from here on out. If I'm viewing this just as its own movie and I take myself out of wanting to compare it to the original or to the things I know about Halloween before this or the things that I find scary about Michael, and instead, I look at this as a character study of the creation and the cultivation of a serial killer, it actually becomes a lot more interesting of a movie. This is not the Michael Myers that we are used to. This Michael is the main character. And if you look at Halloween 2007 as the story of a psychopath, I think it works really well. This might sound odd, but I feel like this movie is kind of laid out similarly to Full Metal Jacket. Whereas the first half of the movie is the best part, the second act is alright, and there's a pretty strong moment in the third act. As Michael's story continues, there are people out there trying to get him help, and his mom seems to be the only person that cares about him, yet isn't taking the warning signs seriously. Oh yeah, Michael's mom is played by Sherry Moon Zombie, Rob Zombie's wife. He puts her in just about every single movie he makes and seems to always have a shot or two of his wife's ass just bearing it all to the audience. I guess it's to say, hey, guess what? I'm hitting that. I don't really know, but at least she's better here than she is in the Munsters. In this version, Michael's first kill is against one of his bullies. He corners him in the woods with a big-ass stick and beats the ever-loving shit out of him. I can understand being a little upset that his first kill isn't his sister like in the original version, but again, if I take this movie as is, I think it works pretty well here. But don't worry, the sister killing is here on Halloween night when he's left alone with no one to take him trick-or-treating, and after being harassed by his stepfather once more, he begins his assault. First on his stepfather, who when he goes to sleep, he tapes him up with duct tape and then slits his throat. And the effects here for this scene are really, really good and super intense and make this movie feel, in a way, a lot more realistic than any of its predecessors. Also, we gotta talk about the mask. So in this version, the classic Michael Myers mask was something that his sister's boyfriend wore to try to get freaky or kinky before they had sex, and it I didn't really work. So later on, Michael just finds it and puts the mask on when he eventually does kill his sister, but ultimately it feels kind of silly, especially since the mask is way too big for his head. I get that they were trying to give some origin to the mask, but it didn't really work for me. Anyways, after the initial murders is where I think the movie gets into its best stuff. 
Michael is taken away to Smith's Grove Sanitarium, and we get this movie's version of Dr. Loomis, played by Malcolm McDowell. Doing a new version of Loomis after the iconic Donald Pleasance performance is a very tall order, but McDowell does an amazing job here. Part of the reason was because, admittedly, he had never seen the original film, so he was able to come at the character with a fresh perspective and not try to copy anything Pleasance had done in his version. And I love every single scene in the sanitarium with Loomis and the child Michael Myers. To me, this is the most interesting aspect of the movie. We knew about Loomis's long history with Michael and trying to get through to him before ultimately realizing that Michael is just pure evil and that there is nothing to be done except trying to stop him. But here we actually get to see Loomis try to relate and connect to Michael. Oh, also I forgot to mention, as a child, Michael does speak, but as these scenes go along, his speech gets more and more limited. He also starts to wear all sorts of masks that he creates as something to hide the person that he is or the person that he was. There are so many great moments, like Michael saying he doesn't remember the killings, and you wonder, is that true? Did he blank out? Did something evil take over him? But he also holds no remorse or regard and doesn't seem to care about any of it either. There's moments that are lighthearted where he actually feels like a little kid, and there's other moments where him and Loomis are shouting at each other. There's various time skips during these scenes too, and we're not quite sure how long all of it has been taking place during, and... Michael wants to get out, but Loomis keeps telling him that there's no way that that can happen. And I was saying, if you view this movie as the story of a serial killer and ignore the previous Halloween films, this sequence works so damn well. I honestly want the entire movie to be like this. In fact, I want this to just be a Michael and Loomis movie. We've never had a movie like that, really. Don't even bring Laurie Strode into it. Just give me the Michael and Dr. Loomis movie. But sadly, things begin to change. It cuts to a 15-year time skip, like from the original, and from this point on, we get the actual remake portion of Halloween, and a lot of it is kind of meh, you know, it's alright. Somehow during the time skip, Michael went from this pudgy little kid to being a 6'7 muscular monster from hell. Seriously, what kind of protein shakes were they feeding him in this asylum, and, and who thought this was a good idea to just give him full access to the gym? I don't even know if it has a gym, but like, how? But actually, Michael is played here by professional wrestler Tyler Main, and I think he does an amazing job in the movie too. I think he's probably the best actor to play Michael Myers since the original. His acting is in the physicality, and he really makes Michael feel fucking terrifying and powerful and ominous, and you never really know what he's going to do next. Every time he's on screen, he just steals the frame, and this version of Michael is not somebody you want chasing you down a hallway. I'm even so appreciative that this movie gets the mask right. Sure, they make it look a little beat up and dirty so that it's edgy, but like Tyler's performance, this is also my favorite mask since the original. It's slightly bigger than his face, just like in the original, and it doesn't look too white, too small, too awkward. It's literally perfect for him. But one thing I don't like is in the director's cut of this movie, the way that Michael escapes is that two workers in the facility are drunk and decide to take a female patient into Michael's room to rape her. Like, why? Like, I get the dude doesn't like Michael, but even as a drunk person who doesn't like Michael Myers, who would think it was a good idea to enter the room of a nearly seven-foot-tall monster giant that's known to be a murderer and put yourself in a position where you can easily be killed? Also, the rape itself is, like, really gross. And I know we're talking about a movie with an extreme amount of murder and gore, and it's not that I can't make it through a rape scene in general. It's just, I think here it feels so out of place and unnecessary for anything. These characters don't matter. We don't know the girl at all. She's just an innocent victim. And, okay, yes, it makes you want Michael to kill them, but this is Michael Myers. I know he's going to kill people in this movie, and I don't need everybody that he kills to be an asshole first. In fact, it's scarier when they're not, and he just kills at his own discretion. We want Michael's kills to be scary, not to have Michael Myers act like the Punisher. But once Michael is on the loose and we cut to Haddonfield, we meet this movie's version of Laurie Strode as a teenager. She's played by Scout Taylor Compton, and no offense whatsoever to the actress, but I really hate this version of Laurie. Mostly because of Halloween 2, where she becomes absolutely insufferable. But in this movie, I think the idea was to make her, like, spunky and quirky, but it, none of it really works. Lori in the original isn't exactly a complex character, but she's memorable. This Lori, I never cared for much. 
and introducing her an hour into the film doesn't exactly help either. Everything feels like it's speeding along to get to the conclusion. In this version, there is no question that she is Michael's sister. She herself is unaware, but Michael comes to Haddonfield to find her, carrying around a picture of them together when she was a baby. The dynamic here is a little different, though, as it doesn't seem like Michael actually wants to kill his sister in this version. Instead, he's kind of here to reconnect with her. He wants her to know that they're siblings and to remember him. Lori's two friends are in the movie too, one of them, and playing Annie, who got choked out in the original, this time is played by Daniel Harris. Kind of strange since Harris was 30 years old here playing a 17 year old, but hey, getting her back into the franchise even as a different character was nice to see. We still get no justice for Jamie, but at least we got a nice Halloween alumni in the cast. And the rest of the movie is pretty much the most remake thing about it. Loomis comes to town to try to warn the police. This time Sheriff Brackett is played by Brad Dwarf, who does a pretty good job even though he's not in the movie much. Michael stalks them from a distance, then begins his kills. He kills Linda and her boyfriend the same way after they bang. Some new kills involving Michael killing Lori's adoptive parents, which kind of felt like him killing them out of jealousy or maybe just feeling like they are pretending to be her family. It was an interesting addition. Annie in this movie doesn't die, actually, but she does get to run around from Michael while being cut up and topless, which I, I guess you could say she is the first legacy character to ever be topless in the movies. And it's too bad because I was always hoping the first one would be Donald Pleasance. Rest in peace. When Michael catches up to Laurie towards the end of the movie, there's a great moment where he kneels down, removes his mask, and shows her the photograph of them together, as if he's trying to get her to remember. And I really like this. I like the twist on the motivation for Michael. I never get the sense that he's actually trying to kill her, but only trying to get her to understand. But he can't communicate, and he can't go five minutes without killing somebody, so it's a little bit difficult. Loomis catches up with Lori and shoots Michael like in the original, but here Michael comes back, and it seems as though he crushes Loomis's head between his hands. He survives and is in the next movie, but this one leaves it on a bit of a cliffhanger as to whether or not he lived through it. In the final moments of the movie, Michael tackles Lori out of the house, and falling on him, she grabs Loomis's gun and shoots Michael point blank in the face. God damn. Blood splatters all over her, and it fades to the baby picture as it cuts to the credits. I don't think it's any shock as to why this movie was divisive and controversial as a Halloween film. So much about Michael was changed and explored in ways that it never had been before, and I'll admit, when I first saw this movie in the theaters, I wasn't the biggest fan of it. But over the years, I find when I watch it, I do start to like it more and more, and I appreciate the things about it that I think are good. And it was when I really started viewing this movie as a singular film and an exploration of a psychopath, trying to understand Michael, what makes him tick, and what he wants. All of the things that were taboo before and not the focal point of the movies is what makes this movie the movie that it is. So this is honestly probably the most difficult Halloween movie to rank in my opinion. Because although I think it strays away from a lot of the things that I enjoy about the Halloween franchise and Michael Myers himself, I think as a film, it is a really, really well-made story about this psychopathic killer, Michael Myers. Just, it's a different version of Michael Myers than what we're used to. So it's really hard to rank it among the series as a whole because... If I'm ranking it as a Halloween Michael Myers movie, it's a little bit different than just ranking it as a film. You know what I mean? Like, as a film, I think it's it's better made than Halloween 4 and 5. But I don't know if I would put it above Halloween 4 and 5 because I like that era of Halloween and I like that version of Michael Myers more. So... It's really, really difficult. I think what it comes down to is whether or not I want to rank it above Halloween 2, uh, the original Halloween 2. And overall, I think that I definitely do enjoy it more than Halloween 2. And I don't think it deserves to be in a B tier. I, I really, I think B tier might be too low, especially after just now rewatching it. So you know what? I'm going to put Rob Zombie's Halloween in the A tier just below Halloween 4. Just below Halloween 4. And that might be too low for some people. It might be way too high for some other people. But honestly, after rewatching it, I really, really do enjoy it as a movie. I think that 
it's better than Halloween 2 because I, I just, I think consistently it's better, even though Halloween 2 has some great moments. You know, it doesn't really do a whole lot with Laurie as a character. Halloween 3, you know, because it's not really a Michael Myers movie, it's hard to say. It is still really a really, really good movie. Um, but for some reason, Rob Zombie's Halloween in the B tier just doesn't feel right, especially after rewatching it just now. So I'm going to put it in the A tier, and I'm going to stick with that. However, Rob Zombie's Halloween 2 is where it all changes. This is the most bizarre fever dream of a Halloween movie that has ever somehow been cobbled together by a studio, and as different as the Halloween remake is to the original Halloween, Halloween 2 is just as different from the first remake, and in all of the worst ways. When I said every time I watch Rob Zombie's Halloween, I start to like it more and more, the exact opposite is true when it comes to Halloween 2. Every time I watch this movie, I want to tear out all of the hair from my head, and I can't stop my eyes from rolling back over with how stupid I think it is, and I'm sorry, I don't like this movie at all. So the remake itself did well financially, so doing a sequel and continuing the new timeline is where they wanted to go. Originally, Rob Zombie didn't want to come back to direct, but they basically convinced him by saying that he could have free reign over this entire movie and do whatever he wanted. Unlike the first one, for at least half of it, he follows the template set by John Carpenter's original. For Halloween 2, they basically said, just have fun, do whatever you want. And this is where the problems began. I will say that on one hand, I do appreciate the attempt to do something radically different than was done in any other Halloween film. Zombie delves fully into the weird, dreamlike imagery, nightmarish visions, changes Michael's looks and motivations yet again, and takes previously established characters to places that we've never seen them go before. So, even though I do think this movie is probably just as bad or worse than Halloween Resurrection, I do give it the slight edge just based on the fact that Resurrection was just a slasher paint by numbers cash grab that nobody cared about that was making it, whereas Rob Zombie's Halloween 2, at least he tried to do something cool, and at least it feels like Zombie was actually trying to make something artistic. I, I think it fails on all levels, but I do at least appreciate the attempt to do something different with the franchise. But that's about the end of where my compliments lie with this movie. This movie begins with an ominous quote about a white horse that is just some BS that Rob Zombie wrote down. It's not from anything, which just really takes away everything this movie was trying to do from the beginning. And I feel like it was only put in here just because he really wanted to have, well, one, a white horse in the movie, but he also wanted it to link back to Michael's childhood and his relationship with his mother, which I can only assume he did because otherwise his wife Sherry Moon Zombie wouldn't be able to be in the movie since her character was killed off in the first film. God forbid he make a movie and not put his wife in it. So, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, we start to put Michael into the similar mindset of a different silent stalker. Yeah, this is some serious Jason Voorhees shit. Jason's character is extremely dependent on his mother. She was the only one who loved him, she was the killer in the first Friday the 13th movie, and his entire ordeal, his kill, 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 mom, mom, mom. It, that's a Jason thing. And I get that just because of the previous versions of Michael Myers and him never having a connection with his mom doesn't mean that the remake version can't do some of that, but this was never even hinted or discussed in, in the first film. It's a random addition that once again takes power away from Michael, making his own decisions for himself. Throughout this entire movie, he sees visions of his mom and a white horse, and she speaks to him and leads him around, ultimately wanting him to bring Lori back home to them. A lot of this is done through extremely artsy and out-there dream-like sequences. There's this bizarre dinner scene with all these weird Halloween creatures sitting around Lori's body. This stuff feels like Rob Zombie was having way too many viewings of the movie Haxon before making this film. It's basically just an excuse for him to get as weird as possible, and... Other than the fact that I think it takes away from Michael himself, I don't mind this part so much. There's not enough of it to take away from the film, so I can get behind it to a degree just as an excuse to show some weird shit, because I, I myself am a fan of weird shit. But what I can't get behind is the other dream. The beginning of this movie takes Laurie to a hospital following the events of the first film, and here it kind of feels like a legitimate remake of Halloween 2 with the hospital setting. Michael shows up and begins chasing her through the halls, just like in the OG, but 
also stabs Octavia Spencer for what feels like three minutes straight. Like Jesus, she's not even your main target. Yes, she's dead, Michael, it's all right. But I also do kinda like this opening. I actually think the most suspenseful and scary scenes are right here. Michael is a fucking menace through the first scenes of this movie and it would have been pretty great until you realize it was all a dream. A 24 minute dream sequence. What the actual fuck? This is like a two hour movie and you literally wasted one sixth of the runtime with scenes that do not matter. I get so fucking annoyed every time she wakes up from it. 24 minutes into the film before the film actually starts. But then it follows Lori two years after the events of the first movie, and we see that now she's living with Annie and Annie's father, Sheriff Brackett, all with the same actors reprising their roles. And honestly, I cannot stand Lori in this film. I get that the idea is that she's dealing with the intense trauma from the first movie, so she's unhinged, she's on medication, she's drinking a lot, yada yada, but I also forget that she doesn't know she's Michael's sister till halfway through the movie. In the beginning, she's yelling at her friend Annie for not understanding, and at first I'm like, oh, it's because Annie doesn't understand the stigma of being the sister to a serial killer, but no, it's not that at all. We're only talking about the night that they were attacked, so did Lori forget Annie actually watched her boyfriend be killed in front of her and then was slashed to near death herself? Both Lori and Annie essentially went through the same thing. The only difference is that Lori got to shoot Michael in the head at the end of it, which apparently he survived from because he's just that guy. Although if a bullet to the head doesn't kill him the way that he dies at the end of this movie by being shot a lot makes literally no sense either. Lori's character in this movie, all she does is whine and shout and scream and curse at people and flip out and have mental breakdowns and she's constantly screeching the whole movie and it is insufferable. I literally cannot stand her. Every time she goes into one of her many freakouts, I want Michael to just show up and stab her already. I would rather listen to nails on a chalkboard. I would rather listen to an air raid siren for two hours straight. I would rather listen to the leprechaun have an orgasm than listen to Lori's voice in this movie. And of course, Rob couldn't just have Laurie turn into a miserable, unbearable character. He also has to do the same thing with Dr. Loomis. So in the first movie, Loomis wrote a book about his experiences with Michael as his therapist. And there's a subtle point of contention that he might have used his experience for a cash grab on the book. But ultimately, Loomis has the right concerns and does the right things in the first movie. All the scenes with him and child Michael make it seem like he's a decent dude at the end of the day. In this movie, somehow Loomis went to being a complete and total fucking dickhead, even stating that that was the old Loomis and he is the new Loomis. He's berating his assistant, he's only looking for publicity and fame and money, he's just an asshole. He's supposed to have some kind of character arc where at the end of the movie he starts to change his ways but none of it works, and he never redeems himself in any kind of way anyway. In this movie, he's written a new book and in it he reveals the family connection between Michael and Lori, and when Lori finds out, she goes off the deep end even further. As for Michael, for most of this movie he's just walking around in the forest. Hey, is that Rob Zombie? Is this a cameo in his own movie? No, that's just Michael Myers without his mask on. Just wandering around like a hobo, following the visions of his dead mom. I don't know. This is what Rob Zombie likes to think every single male in his movie should look like. Just a big, disheveled dude with a giant beard. Michael has only been unmasked briefly about two times in the entire franchise, and here, it's not even a moment. It's not even a reveal. It just is what it is. Oh, here's Michael's face. Moving on, it, it just doesn't matter. And there's also this long scene with Michael going to the strip club that his mom used to work at and killing, I guess, the only three employees that work there. And it's such a long scene and it's not connected to anything else in the movie. And, and I don't know, man, something about it just feels like the entire thing could be completely cut out. Basically, it seems like they tried to add as many little things in this movie as they could to give it a runtime of two hours when the real story of this movie could probably be told in like an hour and 15 minutes maximum. After Lori gets done screaming at her therapist for the 10th time, she goes out to a Halloween party with her friends dressed as characters from Rocky Horror Picture Show. Michael kills her friend there, and instead of going after Lori at the party, he then decides to go all the way back to Sheriff Brackett's house and kill Annie for good this time. And this also means this is the first time Daniel Harris gets to die on screen in a Halloween movie, but it just feels so meaningless. 
She could have literally died in the first movie because she does nothing in this film except argue with Lori and then die. When Michael eventually catches up to Lori, he takes her to the abandoned cabin in the woods, and then Ash and the Deadites appear. Nah, I'm just kidding, but I kind of wish that happened. No, instead, her nightmares and visions of their mom and the horse seem to combine, and she sees the same things that Michael does. Brackett then shows up with the rest of the police force, along with Loomis, who suddenly wants to redeem himself after watching himself on a late-night talk show with Weird Al. Yeah, Dr. Loomis and Weird Al in the same scene together. That's a thing. But he redeems nothing. He goes to talk to Michael, he sees Lori bound by an invisible force, and then... Oh god. And then... Michael Myers, who has never spoken a word in any Halloween movie ever as an adult, knocks Loomis outside, removes his mask, looks Loomis in the eyes, and says... Do you want to know what Michael says? To Loomis, his long-term therapist, one of the only adults that ever cared and tried to help him that he spent a 15-year history with, that he's fought before in the past? Guess what he says to Dr. Loomis? For God in hell, die! Yeah, die. And then he stabs him. Wow, 31 years of films until Michael spoke in a movie, and that's what we came up with. May as well just had him say, save Martha, for God's sakes. Then Michael gets blown away by the police force, which is the exact same ending as Halloween 4. Michael traditionally can survive this kind of stuff easily, and not to mention he survived a bullet in the head in the previous movie, but whatever, I guess he dies here. Along with Loomis, and also Lori, who gets gunned down by the cops too, I guess. Leaving her within this white, dreamlike room dimension, finally reunited with her family. The movie ends, nothing matters, and all the characters suck. The whole film feels like a waste of time, and I think this is truly the last time I'm ever going to rewatch this film. I would rather end on the high of the first remake and forget that part two even exists. Now, I know there are some people that claim that originally Rob Zombie wanted to have Laurie be the killer, which is why there's so many dreamlike sequences and why Michael looks so weird and does so many weird things because it would have been Laurie all along. But that's not the movie we got, so I can't base my review and retroactively change things based upon a movie that we could have gotten. I gotta go by the movie that we do have. And in the movie we do have, I it just, I hate it. Alright man, so it's no shocker how I feel about Rob Zombie's Halloween 2. Honestly, like I said, I, I appreciate that he tried to do something different with it, but I just honestly think that all of it fails. Every single thing that he attempted to do with the movie, I think, fails. I think it's one of his worst films, and I think it's one of the worst Halloween films. I'm only going to give it the slight edge above Halloween Resurrection just because of the creativity that's on display, whereas Resurrection is just nobody cared about that movie. So it still gets an F tier but I am putting it at least above Halloween Resurrection. I know there's a lot of Rob Zombie Halloween fans out there, so I don't know how you guys are going to feel about how I rank Halloween 2. When I rewatched Rob Zombie's Halloween, it actually grows on me like so much more than before, and I, I put it in A tier, and I truly, I truly do believe it belongs in A tier. I truly like it more than the other films on there besides, so far, H2O, 5, and 4, and the original. So... It's got the highest grade I can possibly give the, the first remake, but the second remake, I'm sorry, everything about it I think was poorly done, and I just don't like that movie. That and Resurrection, I never want to watch again. I also find it funny how, for me, for my personal taste and sensibility of the Halloween films, it kind of alternates. Like, six I didn't like, then seven I really liked, then eight I did not like, then nine, which would be the remake, I really liked, and then ten, which would be Halloween 2, I really didn't like. So following that pattern, that means I should really like Halloween 2018, right? But before we get into that, we got to zip over to one of our last appearances of the timeline board to go into the final Halloween universe, at least as far as the recording of this video goes, into the new trilogy of films, which is uh, the new Halloween 2018, Halloween Kills, and Halloween Ends, which as of the recording of this moment hasn't come out, but by the time this video ends, we'll have. So let's dive into our final universe, man. Okay, first of all, if you've made it this far into the video where we are approaching the four hour mark, somehow, if you have put up with me for this long, if you are still here, I have one simple request for you. Can you please give the video a thumbs up 
and a comment and let the algorithm know that you liked it because all interaction with a YouTube video helps it be seen in the algorithm better. It's Halloween time. It's fall time. It's Michael Myers time. Halloween ends just come out. Like, let's get the video pushing the algorithm a little bit. I would really, really, truly appreciate it. And I waited this long in the video to say something about it because I figured, you know, I hate YouTube videos where they all they talk about is, hey, like the video and buy my merch and, you know, subscribe to my channel and yada, yada. It's like, yeah, whatever. Talk about the content. And I'm with you guys. I'm with you on that. My only request is that we've made it four hours. So can you like the video, comment on the video. Also down below in the description, I do have a merch store where you can pick up shirts like this that say motherfucking Zod on it. If you're just a Halloween fan and not a fan of the channel, you have no idea what that means, but you could wear it to the gym anyways. Uh, also, I do have a Patreon if you want to support the channel on that deeper level. And I do have YouTube memberships turned on right now as well. So you can get exclusive videos and exclusive content and live streams and things like that on the channel if you want to. So all of that is available to you. I would really appreciate the support. But other than that, let's get back into the content that we are talking about, which is Halloween. And we are entering at last our fifth and final timeline. No, that's not it. This one's it. <laughs> this is, I see, I haven't had enough lattes, man. All right. So we are in the final timeline, which is the current Halloween timeline, which will take us back to the original Halloween film. We'll continue with Halloween 2018, Halloween Kills, and Halloween Ends, making four movies in that series. And first of all, how complicated is this? First, the first thing is like, this is the first time ever in like the history of all cinema that I can think that they actually went out and like scrapped the original run of the series, made a remake with Rob Zombie's Halloween and Halloween 2, and then went back to make a sequel to the original movie. Usually once they start making remakes, that's it. It's just the remakes, and then if that screws up, they just do another remake, or they do another prequel, or they do something else with that. Like, this is the first time, I know it's happened after this, because I know that uh, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre also has done this at this point, but the only reason they did that was because of the success of Halloween 2018. So Halloween was the first one to do that, where you had the end of the original series, you had the remakes, and then they were like, you know what, let's go back and make a sequel to the original series, or the original movie, rather. Uh, so that's basically what it is. It's also very complicated because <laughs> they, they decided to title the movie Halloween. Just Halloween. We say Halloween 2018 to try to differentiate it from the other movies because at this point, there are three movies called Halloween that are all completely different. There is the original Halloween from 1978. There is the Halloween remake from 2007. And then there is the Halloween from 2018, which is not a remake or the original film. It's actually acting as a sequel to the original film. So technically, Halloween 2018 is Halloween 2, which would make this the second, which would make this the third Halloween 2 because you have the original Halloween 2. You have Halloween 2 the remake to the Halloween remake and now you have Halloween 2 to the original Halloween 2 again except it's not called Halloween 2 it's called Halloween so the sequel to Halloween is Halloween but not the Halloween from 2007 it's the Halloween from 2018 which is a direct sequel to the Halloween movie from 2000 from 1978 but not a direct sequel in the sense that it comes right after it because that would be Halloween 2 from 1981 which is a direct sequel to the first Halloween and, and, and can you see why the timelines are confused? This is why I made the board! Anyways, uh, Halloween 2018, we are going to get into my review of this film, but a lot of people think that this is the best Halloween movie since the original. And there's a lot of precedents to understand why they are saying that. But let's talk about, like, conceptually how this movie came about. And, you know, I've been sort of dreading getting to Halloween 18 because uh, just I'll just say it, like, right off the bat. Like, right off rip. I think Halloween is a very, very well-made movie. I enjoy the movie. I think it's a good movie. Okay? There's that. However, I have a lot of points of contention with this film. And a lot of it is conceptual. And a lot of it is the execution of it as well. Um, I don't hate this movie. I like this movie. I am a fan of this movie. Before anyone kind of comes at me, I am a fan of this movie. I like this movie. However, I have a lot of problems with it. 
Um, and a lot of that comes from the initial creation of this movie. But let's go back in time a little bit. After Rob Zombie's Halloween, 2000, uh, Halloween 2 from 2009, how it ends with Laurie getting shot and then she has some strange vision of her in a hallway. Well, uh, people didn't really like that movie or that ending. It makes sense. I didn't like it either. But originally they were going to continue with that franchise because like I said, once you start making remakes, it's very, very rare that a studio or a franchise goes back to the original version after they've cut it off and started making remakes. So they were going to do Halloween 3 and this was during the time where 3D movies were huge. So they were going to do Halloween 3D. It's perfect, right? Friday the 13th did it in the 80s. Why not copy what they did? It's weird how also Halloween wound up copying a lot of Friday the 13th over the years, considering the fact that Friday the 13th is a Halloween copy. But we'll get to that maybe in a future video. Anyways, they decided to do Halloween 3D, but Rob Zombie was not coming back. Uh, Scout Taylor, what's her name, was not coming back to play Lori because they were going to change it where Lori wasn't actually dead seeing a vision. They were going to change it where Lori was in some insane asylum and that's why she was in the right white room and it was going to be like Michael Myers coming back after her a year later. They were going to combine that with the Halloween asylum script that never got made with Michael uh, escaping the insane asylum. So a lot of things were going to happen but they could never really get it together. They had a couple of ideas of where to take it but nothing really Really panned out. I think that one at one point Mike Flanagan was attached to the direct, and he's the guy that directed um, Doctor Sleep, which I think is a criminally underrated movie. Uh, he also did a sh series on Netflix that for some reason I can't remember the title of right now, but it's also really good. Haunted like Hill House. I don't want to say it and get it wrong. But anyways, so <laughs> they had a bunch of issues with it, and eventually uh, the time kind of ran out to where they had the rights to make the movie. Uh, and it reverted back to Miramax, which was now teamed up with the studio of Bloomhouse. And Bloomhouse is a very famous movie studio because they make a lot of horror movies for a very low budget. They give the directors an extreme amount of creative control to basically do whatever they want because they keep the budget so low that if the movie tanks, it's not going to bankrupt the company. And usually horror movies make a lot of bang for their buck because they can be produced very cheaply and make a lot of money because people love going seeing horror films, especially around... Uh, the fall season. So it makes a lot of sense to do that. And Bloomhouse, you know, they did uh, Insidious, Paranormal Activity, like they did a lot of movies to give them a lot of credentials. And apparently they got around to being able to be involved with creating a new Halloween movie, which was right up their alley. Makes total sense. It seems like a dream come true. So they were, uh, you know, finding the people to be able to do this. And somehow it got to where uh, David Gordon Green and Danny McBride, yeah, Eastbound and Down, Danny McBride got attached to do a Halloween movie. I'm not against this, man. I think that a lot of times comedy and horror kind of uh, ride that same line. It depends on wanting, where you want to take it. Maybe I just have a really dark sense of humor. But I feel like if you're really good at comedy, you'll probably be good at horror. And maybe not so much vice versa. But definitely if you're good at comedy, I think you might be pretty good at horror. Anyways, uh, they came up with this idea where they were going to go back to what made the original movie very good, that kind of slow, stalker, scary, uh, long shots, you know, having the epic music behind it and just making Michael Myers feel like the shape, just this strange thing that would be staring at you in the distance and slowly stalking you and just as this unstoppable monster, but not delve into any of the supernatural stuff that the other movies had. No cults and no visions of strange white horses. This is just a guy with a knife going around killing people. But where I get a little bit annoyed with it conceptually comes down to what they ultimately landed on, where they decided that they were just going to make it a sequel to the original Halloween and not include any of the other sequels. So you're going directly from 1978 to 2018, which is 40 years. Okay, Halloween H4O. That's what this movie is. This is literally 20 years since H2O. Um, and so it's... Uh, originally, like, it's strange to me to think, because if you think about it, Michael Myers' age, he would be 61 years old. So Michael Myers has not killed anybody for 40 years. He's been in an institution, uh, and now he's an old man. It's like, all right, I guess we're dealing with old man Michael. That's fine. That's fine. But it does kind of limit the legacy of Michael Myers, because in this universe, he would have only killed his sister back in the day. 
And then the day that he got out in 1978, he killed the mechanic. Uh, he killed uh, Linda, her boyfriend, Annie. I think that's it. He might have killed one more person. But um, yeah, I think that might be it. So it kind of limits the legacy of Michael Myers a little bit. That's still really scary. And that's still like, that would be like, um, you know, the haunted urban legend of your town for a very, very long time if some dude came out and killed like five people, you know. But this was 40 years ago. Most people, it wouldn't even really be in their consciousness other than just knowing it as a legend. It's not like he came back time and time again. This also cuts out a major plot point that has been a plot point since Halloween 2, the original one, uh, where Laurie Strode is Michael Myers' sister. Now, granted, when John Carpenter originally wrote that, it was because he didn't know what to do with the script. He didn't know where to take it. He didn't even really want to do Halloween 2. He was just kind of writing it. And that's just a twist that he threw in to kind of make it a little bit more interesting before he ended the series. But it's something that the Halloween franchise had attached to and ran with for its entire run up until this point. So Laurie Strode has always been known as Michael Myers' sister, especially in Halloween H2O. It's a big deal. It's a huge deal that they're siblings. Um, and uh, they even carried it over and did it in the remakes. You know, Michael Myers going after his family has always been a plot point. That's what Halloween 4, 5, and 6 focused on. Uh, and that's just what it's always been. And so taking that away, I feel I, I have confliction on it because I understand, like, I understand that the original film, that's not what it was about, right? The original film was a guy that gets uh, out of a mental institution and he stalks the babysitters and he and he kills them, right? He's going after young women, killing them, uh, hiding in the shadows, lurking in the shadows, seemingly unkillable. That's what makes it scary. I get it. It wasn't until the second movie where they introduced the sibling concept, but it's just been so engraved within the series that I find it a little strange. It just feels weird having Laurie not be his sister. It feels weird. It also means that there's no specific incentive for Michael Myers and Laurie Strode to ever meet up again. Because at this point, Laurie Strode is what? Like, uh, how old is she? She's like in her late 50s, like mid 50s or something like that. So he's 17, what, 20, 30, 40, 50. She's 57 years old, canonically. So Michael Myers is MO, killing his sister who was a teenager, killing the teenagers in... Uh, Halloween in the original film, no reason to go after her. So in the movie itself, they have to come up with this like, you know, kind of over-explained reason as to why Michael is being taken to Laurie Strode so that they can eventually have an encounter again. And, you know, I understand Laurie having this vendetta against him because she was, you know, attacked, you know, back in the day. They're still dealing with the trauma, still de dealing with the PTSD of it, and still basically doing what they did in Halloween H2O. But that's what bothers me about it is because I feel like this movie and H2O cover the same kind of subject matter. And I feel like H2O did it better. And I feel like H2O, because of the fact that they were siblings, actually added to it. I know I probably have like a lot of Halloween fans hating me right now. You're either hating me or loving me right now because a lot of people think 2018 is brilliant. And like I said, I still like the movie. It's just conceptually, these are the things that bug me. Is because I just feel like what this movie does, H2O did better 20 years ago. Also, it annoys me because of the unceremonious kill of Laurie Strode in Halloween Resurrection and how fucking stupid it was and how it was because of like a backwards uh, clause within the contract and everything and the fact that she was only in the movie for 10 minutes, just gets stabbed in the back and killed off. Like after all of that, after everything she went through in H2O, I'm attached to the character in H2O. I Everything she went through, her struggle, her, her battle with Michael, I, I thought it was important and I... I loved it. I enjoyed it. And that's why H, uh, Resurrection was such like a, a fucking like dildo in the ass to me. Like I just don't like it. Well, maybe if you like that, I don't know. But I, I wouldn't enjoy that I, personally. Uh, maybe a tongue, but like that's it. But anyways, I, I just thought that now if you're getting Jamie Lee Curtis to come back to the series, you have the perfect opportunity to redeem the mistake of Halloween Resurrection. You could say that she lived. You could say that something else happened. You could continue it from there. You could make up for that entire series. You could make it better. You could take what was bad about it and fix it and give her a true satisfying conclusion. But they don't because this is a different timeline and this is a different Laurie Strode. So the Laurie Strode from Halloween H2O and Resurrection still dies in the most ridiculous 
over the top dumb way. No, not even over the top. Just like mundane, just stupid way possible. And just completely negates everything that that character went through in H2O. And it just annoys the shit out of me that they would, instead of trying to fix that, they would just bring it back and just do H2O again. But take away one of the biggest components of H2O. Anyways, uh, so there's that. But then we also have what I've already complained about in this video is Jamie Lloyd. Michael Myers' uh, niece, Lori's daughter from 4, 5, and 6. And I get that that wasn't connected, but once again, you are re you are going into a new timeline now. This is a whole new realm of possibilities. And you decide to give Lori a daughter. And since it's 40 years, she not only has a daughter, she also has a granddaughter. And if you're giving her a daughter, I don't understand why they wouldn't get Daniel Harris to play Jamie. And you could have the two main leads... Other than Dr. Loomis, unfortunately, because Donald Pleasance passed away. But the, the two main leads, the two main victims of Michael Myers, you could have had Laurie Strode and uh, Jamie Lloyd in the same movie. Or Jamie Strode in, this, in Strode in this version. You could have had them in the same movie. You could have had this power team, this power duo of the two actresses that have carried this franchise. But instead, they, they don't. They give her a whole new daughter named Karen and cast Judy Greer and Judy Greer is fine you know I don't have a problem with the actress but like I just it like if you're if you're looking to like honor the legacy of Halloween I just don't understand why you would do that uh and and it just annoys me man so right from the get-go I just had a lot of issues with this movie but having said all of that I think the movie itself is good. I think it's good. I think it's a good movie. I think it does Michael Myers justice. I think Michael Myers himself in this movie is done really, really well. They also get um, Nick Castle, who was one of the actors that played Michael in the original version, to play him again. So he's age appropriate and he has the history with the character. Um, and it, obviously he does a great job. I think Michael looks great in this movie. I think they got the mask very, very good in this movie, you know, which is a, a rare thing. So... There are things about this movie I like, so I'm going to get into my review of it, but I just had to talk about and rant about my frustrations with it conceptually because it just is not the direction I would want to go with Halloween. But having said that, I have to accept this universe as is, so let's talk about the movie as it is, as a film, and talk about what I like and don't like about it. So Halloween 2018 picks up 40 years after the original, ignoring all of the sequels and explains that Michael Myers was caught on the night that he escaped and sent back to the sanitarium, where he has been for all of this time. Not really sure why he has never tried to escape again or who could keep him physically restrained, but here we are with him just kind of standing out in the open. We're introduced to Dr. Sartain, who is Michael's current psychiatrist, and through a bit of dialogue, he explains that Dr. Loomis has long since passed away. Which, I mean, does make sense, given the fact of what his age would be at this point, but it is a bummer nonetheless. There's a couple of characters that are making a podcast documentary on Michael Myers, and they come to the sanitarium to try to get an interview out of him, and of course, he doesn't want to speak. One of them has somehow gotten a hold of Michael's mask, showing it to him and riling up the other inmates, but... Ultimately, their visit is a bust. They then try to go to Lori Strode to get an interview out of her, and her home is obviously built like a bunker full of gates, locks, and various weaponry. In this universe, Lori has spent her entire life training and preparing for an oncoming attack someday. Again, since they are not siblings in this movie, there would be no direct motive for Michael to attack her specifically, but I also would admit that if I ever experienced a night like Lori did, I as well would make the most top-notch security measures I could possibly do, and get as much weapon training as possible. She gives the podcasters very little of her time before kicking them out, and this Lori, similar to the H2O version, is also extremely proactive with her time, very cautious of everyone around her, and continues to drown her sorrows in a lot of alcohol. And we have to talk about her family. Her daughter, named Karen, uh, and Karen's husband, Ray, and also they have a daughter named Allison. 
and I would say that the story kind of evenly splits between the three generations of Strodes. Karen was taken away from Laurie at an early age by the state due to her harsh upbringing, and Laurie's paranoia constantly bringing her an uncomfortable childhood, and now as an adult, they have a bit of a strange relationship with each other, where Karen is doing her best to keep Laurie away from her daughter, Allison. But Allison herself wants to rekindle her relationship with her grandmother, and they do have a few nice scenes together with Allison trying to understand the mindset and the lessons that Laurie wished to pass down to both of them. In this film, Michael is currently being transferred to a maximum security prison, and lo and behold, the bus that was carrying him crashes into a ditch and thus lets the 61-year-old Michael Myers free as he makes his way to Haddonfield for some classic Halloween fun. Shockingly enough, Michael's first kill in this movie is a child, which makes it feel pretty serious. The next thing that we see Michael do is stop at a gas station and kill a mechanic in order to get his classic suit on. He also brutally kills the podcasters, which I love, and takes his mask back, having it in the rightful hands that it should be. One detail I love is that when he puts the mask back on, you do hear the classic heavy breathing like from the original film. When Michael gets to Haddonfield, there is a great long tracking shot of him just walking through the neighborhood. It's trick-or-treat night, so nobody really questions the way that he looks with the mask on. Also, since it has been 40 years since he's been in town, it makes sense that most people would not instantly recognize him being dressed up as a serial killer, especially since most of the people out are children and trick-or-treaters. My absolute favorite bit in this movie, though, is when he goes into this lady's house with a hammer, kills her off-screen, and then walks in the frame, drops the hammer, and just picks up the knife. I don't know, the body language of the way that he does this is absolutely hilarious to me. It's like he's like, hammer bad, knife good. I love it, man. It also kind of reminds me of that scene in Pulp Fiction where Butch is going through weapon to weapon to try to find the best one. A butcher knife just feels natural in Michael's hand, way better than a hammer. But I gotta talk about something in this movie that does not work for me, and it is the humor. They did attempt to add a lot of humor within this film, and I feel like it falls flat a lot of the times for me. There's the kid being babysat, talking about clipping his toenails for a while, and then there's like this three-minute scene of two cops sitting in a car talking about sandwiches. I I'm just like, what? what is this? I know it's supposed to be funny, but it doesn't work for me, and I know the creators come from a comedy background, but all of these moments just totally missed the mark for me. But anyways, Michael is back to his old ways, killing babysitters and their boyfriends, which is great. And once Lori is aware of his escape, she straps up and is ready to go on the offensive, which is also fantastic. There's a new sheriff named Hawkins that is an older guy that remembers the night that Michael originally attacked and is very relatable and a proactive character too, trying to stop Michael before it's too late, but time and time again, he falls short. In a way, he kind of takes on the role of Dr. Loomis in this movie, just trying to stop Michael before it gets too bad. But if he's taking on the Loomis role, then what about Michael's actual psychiatrist character, Dr. Sartan? Well, <laughs> about him. Remember me saying there's no reason why Michael and Laurie would meet up again in this film if they're not siblings? Well, here is this film's twist. Dr. Sartain is kind of like the anti-Loomis, in that his obsession with Michael is trying to understand him and wants to see Michael thrive within his own element and try to truly understand his murderous ways by letting him murder. He is the one that caused Michael to be able to escape in the first place, and when him and the sheriff run Michael over, Dr. Sartain stabs the sheriff, and even in this moment, there's this uncomfortable sequence where he puts on Michael's mask himself. And at this point in the movie, because this is a new timeline, here you were thinking, well, maybe in this timeline, Michael is just a normal human. Maybe he died from getting hit by the car and the doctor is going to take on this place and continue the murders. I'm really glad they didn't go in that direction, but in the scene that it's happening, you kind of feel like it's a real possibility. But instead, he throws Michael into the back seat of the cop car next to Allison and he drives them to Laurie Strode's house in order to pit Michael up against his old school victim to see how Michael would respond in that situation. Which, okay, but see how without the doctor's involvement, Michael and Lori probably naturally would have never met again? When Michael comes to, there's a great moment where he breaks free from the car, throws the doctor on the ground, and as the doc is pleading to Michael to speak, to just say something, after all of these years, say anything, Michael just stomps his motherfucking head in, splattering his face like a melon, and it's fucking awesome. 
Also definitely confirms that Michael does have some super strength here as well, but I just love the pleading doctor and Michael being like, mm, nah, fuck you. <laughs> At least he didn't yell die right before he killed him. And another great thing about this movie is the score. The creepy horror synth and piano is on full display, and you want to know why the music is so good? Because of John motherfucking Carpenter. That's right. For the first time since Halloween 3 in 1982, John Carpenter was actively involved in the making of a Halloween film, and it was with the music and the score. Like the original, John Carpenter's score makes this movie, and everything that was good about it in the original film is amplified to 11. Honestly, the music in this movie is 10 out of 10. It's fantastic. The finale of the movie is this battle between Lori and Michael within Lori's bunker of a home. Michael does manage to kill a bunch of cops and kills Karen's husband, RIP, but then it's all a one-on-one -on -one with Lori, who has all kinds of weapons and traps throughout her house. She blows off some of Michael's fingers, which is awesome, and there's a moment that they kind of reverse the scene from the original movie where Lori falls off the balcony, and when Michael looks down, she's nowhere to be seen. And it all culminates to Michael being led to a secret underground room within Lori's kitchen. He hears the cries of Karen and Allison, and as Karen fakes her tears to lure Michael where she wants him, she then fires a rifle at him, and her and Lori make Michael fall down into the bunker. All of it was by design, as it was a trap designed for Michael himself. They lock him in, light up a flare, and Lori is willing to burn down her entire house to see Michael go up in flames. I think it might be alright though, because in the original her father was a realtor, so you know maybe she's got some more houses out there, I don't know. Also, this is the second Halloween 2 that ends with Michael on fire. Just saying. The film ends with the three girls being taken away as the house burns in the distance, but of course this is not the end. This was never intended to be a one and done type sequel. Instead, this is the first in a new trilogy, and come on, has Burning Michael Myers ever worked? It was all going to lead to the next two films no matter what, and that's what we're getting now. So overall, I can say I'm still going to have issues with this movie's conception, and I still think everything this movie does with Laurie H2O did better, and I still wish they would have kept the sibling idea and changed who her daughter was and all of that, and I'm also not a fan of the humor in this movie. But where this movie excels is with Michael Myers himself. They make Michael scary, imposing, I love the way he looks, they got the mask right, and the Carpenter score helps to amplify it all. The kills are great, it's a well-made movie, well-acted, well-directed. Overall, it is a solid entry within the franchise. You know, I realized while making this video this far in that all I've probably done is just made a bunch of Halloween fans upset with me on my takes about these movies. <laughs> the fact that I enjoy Halloween 5, that I thought Rob Zombie's Halloween was much better this time around that I watched it, that I put Halloween 6 so low, and that I'm pretty in the middle of the road with Halloween 2018. I know that a lot of people absolutely adore and love Halloween 2018 and they think it's the best since the original and they think that it rejuvenized the franchise and they think that this was the proper direction to go. They like the fact that Laurie and Michael aren't siblings. They, they like the series where it's at right now. And look, look, I like this movie. That's the thing too. It's like, it's really hard to say where you have a lot of criticisms about something, but at the same time, you also enjoy it. I can't deny that it's a good movie. It's a well-made movie. It's directed well. It's acted well. It looks good. The score is on point. John Carpenter, you know, motherfucking badass that he is. Like, it's a good movie. It just has a lot of things within it that I just find very frustrating and annoying, but that doesn't mean that I don't enjoy the film. But overall, as a Halloween movie, talking about it in the legacy of the Halloween franchise, I gotta be honest with all of my picks, and for me personally, I think I've decided I'm gonna put this in B tier. Uh, and I think I'm gonna put it just below the other Halloween 2, since this is technically Halloween 2. And I know this might be way too low for some people, and I understand that, but you just have to get where I'm coming from, where I just... 
enjoy the original run, the original lore of Michael Myers so much that I just feel like there was a lot of potential that this movie had. Like it, it could have done a lot more with kind of going back and just kind of retconning a bunch of things and changing things and even making it just a direct sequel to the original. Like the doors were wide open. There was so much you could have done, so many different roads you could have traveled, and they decided to travel one particular road that I find a like, okay. I find it okay. I like it. I enjoy it. I'm going to put it above Halloween 3 because, I mean, I prefer it being in the Michael Myers universe and I prefer it being, you know, Laurie Strode and, and everything they did with it. And I think Michael Myers himself is a badass. If I was judging it just on the Michael Myers persona and the way that they make him look and feel, I'd probably put this one uh, right next to H2O or above H2O. But dealing with the entire movie... To me, it's a B tier. It's a solid B tier. And that doesn't mean that I don't like it. That doesn't mean that I don't like it. It's just, for me, it's a B tier. But um, yeah, we've made it so far, man. I've made it so far. I've been working on this video for so long now. It's crazy. I like I, The fact that I'm going to go into Halloween Kills. And uh, just so you guys know, I actually have only seen Halloween Kills once. I've only seen it in the theater uh, last year. So this is only going to be my second rewatch ever of Halloween Kills. Um, so I'm excited for that, actually. Because I... I remember really liking this movie. I think I like it more than 2018, but I, I can't quite remember. So I'm excited to kind of go back. It's the one I have the least amount of memory of. Even Halloween 2, as few times as I've watched that movie, it, it left an impression of, of anger and hatred and putrid toxicity. But that's another story. But yeah, man, it's it's crazy. We've come so far, and I, I don't know. I don't know what to do with myself. I've been watching Michael Myers movies so much this last month. I've literally been having dreams of Michael Myers. I'll get up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom, and I'll be, like, looking in the shadows. It, it, it's bad, man. Like, I, <laughs> this is like Halloween has consumed my life the last three and a half, four weeks. So uh, may as well just continue that and, and keep going. All right, Halloween Kills, released in 2021, but originally planned for 2020, but we all know how that year went. The only thing scarier than the government locking us in our homes for a year is, well, Michael fucking Myers. And upon rewatch of this movie, I honestly have to say that not only do I like this more than Halloween 2018, but it very well may be one of my favorite Halloween films. I will say this though, the movie doesn't feel very much like a movie, and that is to say it doesn't have a three-act structure, it doesn't have a setup, action, and a climax, and all of that is because originally director David Gordon Green and co-creator Danny McBride pitched their Halloween sequels as two movies instead of three, that they were going to be shot back to back, kind of like one really long film similar to a Kill Bill Volume 1 and Volume 2, but they held back wanting to see how the reception of Halloween 2018 was going to be before they moved ahead with the sequel. And since most people seemed to like 2018, not only did they commit to making that sequel, but they also extended it into a trilogy. And because of that, you can kind of feel that this movie doesn't move a whole lot forward as far as its main plot or its main character, Laurie Strode, as she takes kind of more of a back seat in this movie just hanging out in the hospital pretty much the entire film but we still get more out of her than in the original Halloween 2 where she was also in the hospital the entire film but because of that the structure of this movie did annoy some fans and I understand that however with the main character out of commission that moves focus mostly to Michael Myers himself which personally I thought was great in this movie we get to see so much of Michael's rampage and destruction and it's fucking glorious the title of this film is very accurate because Michael just kills and kills and kills and has the highest body count than in any other Halloween film. In fact, on the Blu-ray that I watched, they have a kill counter that by the end of the movie, he kills, in fact, 31 people. Ironic since Halloween is the 31st day of the month, but also it's about six times his kill count in the original film. Alongside that, this is also probably the goriest Halloween film except for maybe Rob Zombie's first remake, but it's pretty close, I would have to say. In this movie, Michael is truly an unstoppable monster, and it has both a literal and a metaphoric message to it. So remember in this timeline, nothing about Michael has ever been discovered or understood. We don't know if he's just a very resilient,
sentient human who can't really feel pain or if he is indeed some supernatural boogeyman. And it's the fear of the unknown, that thing beyond human understanding and conception, that makes Michael so terrifying. This movie is filled with the repercussions of this lack of understanding and the terror that comes alongside it. Over the last 40 years, the legend of Michael Myers has infested the town of Haddonfield, giving nightmares and resolutions to its inhabitants. And this movie picks up right where 2018 left off, happening the same exact night, the town itself at this point, still unaware of Michael's return, until news starts circulating around, increasing the paranoia of those that live here. And each character that this movie focuses on has a personal history with Michael from that fateful night 40 years prior. It brings back seemingly small yet legacy characters in their own right. But first, let's start with Deputy Hawkins. Though not technically in the original Halloween, there is a flashback scene that's added that takes place right after Loomis shot Michael off of the balcony. A group of police officers are going around town and looking for him, and Hawkins is one of them. I love this flashback scene for so many reasons. First of all, I think they did a wonderful job making it look like 1978, and the thing that I'm most blown away about is that the Michael Myers house actually looks like the Michael Myers house from the first movie. It only took 12 films, but they finally got it right. It actually looks like the Myers house. Even Michael Myers' mask in the flashback, though not perfect, is pretty damn close to the original. Hawkins and his partner investigate the Myers house where Michael attacks the partner, and in a panic, Hawkins fires his gun but accidentally shoots his partner in the process. In his dying words, Hawkins tells him not to worry because they got Michael, which was a big old lie. And in this scene, we also get one of the most unexpected cameos of all time with Dr. Loomis. Finding an actor that looks remarkably like Donald Pleasance, we actually have a Dr. Loomis scene in this movie. The resemblance is uncanny, and along with the cinematography of the flashback, it really felt like a continuation of the first movie here, and part of me wanted to stay in this timeline. Hawkins not only shot his partner, but he also stopped Loomis from shooting Michael in the head and finishing the job. So this is why in the current timeline, where Hawkins is still alive, but bleeding out from being stabbed by Dr. Sartain in 2018, Hawkins believes that it is his duty to find and kill Michael in order to make amends for the mistakes of his youth. It's honestly a great character motivation, and I kind of wish they included it in 2018, but it works well here. But he winds up at the hospital next to Lori, and both of them are kind of stuck stagnant within that room for the duration of this movie. Meanwhile, at a bar, we have a reunion of many old characters. First, we have this timeline's version of Tommy Doyle, the little boy that Laurie was babysitting in the original, now a middle-aged man, and definitely not played by Paul Rudd. Instead, he's played by Anthony Michael Hall, and I definitely prefer this version of Tommy a lot more. This time, he still has been obsessed with Michael, but in a different way. Now, as a grown man, the memories of Michael that have haunted him uh, that first time around, where he was way too young and too scared to be able to do anything about it. He felt helpless. And here, as an adult, he carries around a baseball bat and is desperate for a chance to challenge and to kill Michael. Having his whole life an actual boogeyman that motivated him to become strong and proactive, as he has, but that desire for vengeance also leads to dozens of new problems. Alongside him, we also have Lindsay Wallace, which is the little girl that was also being babysat in 1978, and she's actually played by the same actress, which is crazy. It's awesome to see. Also returning is Dr. Loomis's nurse from the first film. She's back once more. She was killed off in Halloween H2O, but since this is a completely different timeline, she gets to be alive. Well, for a little bit anyway. And lastly, we have a guy named Lonnie. Now, Lonnie has a super small role in the original film, but he's one of the bullies at Tommy's school and one of the kids that was making fun of him. He's the one that said, the boogeyman is coming. That was Lonnie. But the flashback scene adds a scene where Lonnie is not only being picked on himself by other kids, but also has a brief run-in with Michael. And that shared experience probably led to Lonnie and Tommy eventually becoming friends, and now these four people are kind of the leads of this ragtag group of vigilantes 
that are out trying to hunt Michael down once they realize he's back in Haddonfield. Back at the hospital, Lori goes into surgery and rests as we get a few scenes with Karen and Allison, mourning the death of Karen's husband, which is a nice touch to add. And the reveal of the former Sheriff Brackett is also here in this movie, same actor from the first film, uh, very, very old now, but still kicking around, and he is working at the hospital as a security guard, but also, of course, wants vengeance on Michael for killing his daughter, Annie, back in 78. So the idea that's played with here in this movie that I enjoy is how fear and paranoia can control groups of people. Michael is mostly separated from the crowds of people, but that doesn't stop them from forming a mob and lashing out. There's a scene where they find another escaped mental patient that got out the same time that Michael did, and they swarm him trying to kill him, thinking that he is Michael himself, and that patient eventually jumps off of the hospital committing suicide in order to avoid them, showing how that collective fear causes regular people to ultimately murder an innocent man. Well, innocent to a degree. And as I said, Michael's kills in this movie are absolutely vicious. First, there is a scene where he escapes Lori's burning home and fucks up a dozen firefighters. Oh yeah, that also reminds me. When this movie came out, there was literally articles saying how it was a bad thing that Michael killed firefighters in this movie, or how later on in the movie he kills a gay couple. People were literally calling Michael Myers homophobic. If anything, Michael is the most equal rights person there is out there. He will kill man, woman, child, gay, straight, trans. He doesn't care. He just loves killing people. Or, well, we don't really know why he kills people. He just does it. But still, it's wild that we live in a world where evil characters can't be evil without somebody saying it's problematic. Yeah, Michael's problematic. Problematically gouging your motherfucking eyes out. <laughs> yeah, that's one of my favorite kills ever, man. This is great. Uh, when he's continuously stabbing the old man in the back with different knives, that's a great kill. When he stabs the woman with the fluorescent light, that's a great kill. There's so many good kills in this movie. There's a whole scene where not only does he get to kill Nurse Marion again, see you later, but there's also this great bit where this girl was talking earlier about how she can use a gun and she's shot before and she knows how to use it. And so she comes running up trying to shoot Michael, misses every shot. Then Michael knocks the car door at her, making her shoot herself. <laughs> And it is so fucking ridiculous that my dark humor funny bone was hit in all the best possible ways. I, I I love it, man. Eventually, Allison and her boyfriend, who she broke up with in 2018, but they kind of mutually decided to help each other and the vigilantes hunt for Michael. Also, her boyfriend is the son of Lonnie as well. But anyways, they go to the Myers house, which is owned by the gay couple that Michael killed earlier. Lonnie is then killed. The boyfriend gets it the worst. He's stabbed. His head is twisted around. It's crazy. One of the best kills in the movie also. Then Michael heads for Allison, who is saved at the last moment by Karen, which at first it seems odd because Karen takes off Michael's mask and runs away with it, but she was only leading him so that he would chase her bringing Michael right to the middle of the angry mob of victims all there to beat the ever-loving shit out of him. And they do for a while. But there's a great sequence where Laurie is overdubbing a monologue about the influence of Michael and how he gets stronger the more he kills and the more that he is feared. And this is why I say this can be looked at both metaphorically or literal. And the idea is that we don't know. That's what this movie gets right about Michael Myers, and that's why this movie works so well for me. It's not that fear literally makes Michael more powerful, but when you truly believe in something, it can strengthen or weaken you. These characters have had 40 years to build up the legend of Michael Myers, and they truly do not view him as a human. To them, he is the boogeyman, and the second that he fights back, that fear stifles all of them. One by one, Michael rips through the entire band, killing Brackett after 40 years, a bunch of other people, and eventually even Tommy Doyle, knocking him down and using his own baseball bat to bash his skull in. It is so ultimately brutal, and all it does is prove them all right about Michael being this larger-than-life monster. And after all of this, I will admit that the movie does end very abruptly. Karen goes into the Myers home to go to the same window Michael had looked out at as a child. It's a running theme in the movie that people wondered if he was looking out at Haddonfield or staring at his reflection and just wondering what he was thinking. But when Karen goes up there, Michael arrives and he kills her as well at the end of the movie. And when I was rewatching the film, the extended ending shows Laurie trying to call Karen. The phone picks up and we only hear Michael's iconic breathing on the other end with Lori then telling him that she's coming for him 
and with the film ending there. But here, Lori isn't much different than the rest of the townsfolk. Without the sibling connection, there is only that four decades of built-up trauma begging to be unleashed, and that's okay. I think Halloween Kills took what 2018 set up, and my initial criticisms with 2018 have all been melted away by the end of this movie now that I'm two movies deep in this timeline. I am ultimately ready for their final confrontation and to see how this version of Halloween ends. All right, you guys, this is it. This is technically the end of the tier list, which is crazy to think about. We've gone through 12 movies, and here we are. And upon rewatching Halloween Kills, I really, really fucking love this movie. I love the way that they did Michael Myers. I think he's absolutely terrifying. He's a fucking menace. He's, he's just the absolute myth and legend that he is built up to be, while at the same time, there is just that ambiguity of like, what the fuck is this guy? Like, is he immortal? Is he human? Is he not? Why does he kill people? Why does he kill the way he does? What's his motive? We don't know, which just adds to the terror. I thought the kills themselves are brutal. Uh, and I, I love what they did with the townsfolk and how they kind of uh, just dealt with this topic of how this group mob mentality can be formed and how you can do so much more harm than good when you're led by fear and because of that, I got to say, I definitely like it more than the remake. I think, man, I don't know, man. I Because I did just rewatch this last night for the first time in a year. But Jesus, I really, really love this movie. I think this is going to sound like recency bias. But I truly, truly, truly do think that I like this movie more. <sighs> do I like it more than four? And The question is if I like it more than four and five. Because I do love that era. I do love that Loomis is in those movies. I do like Jamie as a character. So it's really, really difficult. But fuck it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. Fuck it. Halloween Kills, my number three. My number three favorite Halloween film. So already I know I have like made the entire fandom mad at me. Because I know a lot of people don't like Halloween Kills. I know I put 2018 too low. I know I put the remake too high. I know that people are going to hate me and come at me. Hopefully no one comes at me for... Resurrection and Rob Zombie's Halloween 2. I think we can pretty much universally agree that they're the worst, I hope. Uh, but I think that's where I'm going to put it, which actually means that I have zero C-tier films. I'm trying to think. I, I shouldn't move Halloween 3 down because I do like that movie. C-tier for me is a movie that's like, okay. Like, it's all right. It's got some good moments. It's got bad moments. It's okay. B-tier is movies that I like that I think are flawed. A-tier are movies that I think are really great. And, of course, S-tier is iconic and, and legendary and, and can't be touched. And I don't think any Halloween movie is ever going to hit S-tier. We'll see. I haven't seen Halloween Ends yet. I'm seeing that uh, this Friday when it comes out. So we'll, we will see. And I'm hoping for the best. But uh, I don't know. But I think that's it, man. So right now, this is my definitive Halloween tier list. So in S tier, we have the original Halloween 1978. My second favorite, Halloween H2O. Third favorite, Halloween Kills. Then Halloween 5, Halloween 4. They're very close. They're they're right neck and neck. I kind of, you know, consider them like as one. So they're right there. Then Halloween 07, which I like for different reasons as a film. Uh, I think it's deserving of an A tier, even if it's not really how I enjoy Michael Myers. I enjoy what that film did. Down to B tier, Halloween 2, pretty solid film, good kills, just, eh, it's a little boring here and there. Halloween 2018, like I said, conceptually, I got a lot of issues with it. I think Halloween H2O does everything 2018 does, but better. Halloween 3, it's an enjoyable horror film. Uh, obviously, you know, lower on a Halloween tier list since it's not Michael Myers, but it's an enjoyable film. No C tiers, zero C tiers, so C tier is safe. D tier, uh, Halloween 6, not a good movie at all. I guess its only redeeming quality is that it's not as good as the two F tiers, which are, of course, Rob Zombie's Halloween 2, which only gets the edge because it was actually creative, whereas Halloween Resurrection comes in dead fucking last for being just a piece of shit paint-by-numbers movie that nobody cared about. Uh, and that's it, man. So we will see where Halloween Ends uh, goes on the tier list. There isn't a tier list made with Halloween Ends on it, or maybe there is now. I don't know. I looked this up like three weeks ago. We've been going off the same tier list. So maybe there is. But as of right now, this is it, man. This is the definitive list. So tell me what you think about it and make your own tier list down below too. So real quick, I thought it would be fun if I did a top 10 list within this video. That is my top 10 kills in the entire Halloween franchise. Just a list of my absolute favorite deaths in the series and to remember some of Michael's greatest hits. 
This is also, of course, without counting Halloween ends, and this is just my top 10 list. Yours would probably look completely different. Anyways, at number 10, I have Sarah's death from Halloween H2O. Mostly the reason why is because I just love the moment where she tries to escape in the dumbwaiter, and Michael cuts the rope, making it crash down, almost tearing her leg off. Then there's this crawl away that she tries to do, and we get this great upward angle shot of Michael Myers just coming down with the knife again and again and again, and it's an image and a shot that's been stuck in my head for decades now. My number nine pick is gonna be from the Halloween 2007 remake, and it's where child Michael duct tapes his stepfather to the chair and then slits his throat. I just think this is probably one of the most realistically brutal kills in the entire franchise, and just that the man wakes up can't do anything except look up and stare at the face of psychopath child Michael Myers in a clown mask. Well, he had it coming at least. My number eight pick is why I'm calling this my top 10 Halloween franchise kills and not my top Michael Myers kills because I'm gonna go with the child death from Halloween 3 when the silver shamrock broadcast activates and this jack-o'-lantern mask just eviscerates this kid's entire head, opens up some pocket dimension, letting loose all sorts of snakes, bugs, and whatever else. It's brutal, it's batshit, and I love it. My number seven pick is gonna be the eye gouge from Halloween Kills. Michael coming back home and killing the couple that is living there in the best way possible by jamming his thumbs into his eyes and ripping his eyes right out. I love that they went for the practical effects and it just looks so cool. My number six is from Halloween 4 and it's anti-gun Michael. Yes, Michael gets a hold of a rifle, but instead of shooting it like a normal person, he uses the gun like a piercing weapon and stabs the sheriff's daughter, pinning her to the wall with the gun. It's classic. My number five pick is from Halloween 2018, and it's the head crush of Dr. Sartain, the man that just wanted to know and understand why Michael did what he did, and laying there pleading for Michael to just say something to him, and instead, Michael just gives him the boot, cracking open his head like it's a melon falling into pieces. My number four pick is the gun kill from Halloween Kills. Michael, still remaining very anti-gun, kicks the fucking door of a car open, making this chick literally shoot herself in the face. How does the physics of this work? I have no idea, but it makes me laugh my ass off every time. My number three pick is from the original film itself, the iconic moment of Michael bursting out from seemingly nowhere, lifting Bob up off of his feet, and stabbing him to the wall. It's legendary, it's iconic, and we get that creepy, unnerving head turn of Michael admiring his handiwork, which is something that'll always stick with you. My number two pick is also from Halloween Kills. I know, Halloween Kills has three spots on my top 10 list, but the kills in it are really that good. And this one is the collection of kills that I'm including with Michael versus the entire mob that was attacking him. It's a montage sequence of Michael murdering everybody, beginning with Sheriff Brackett and ending with Tommy Doyle as this epic new John Carpenter theme plays in the background and we get an overdub monologue about Michael himself. And it's just a fantastic sequence overall. And my number one kill from the Halloween franchise is the death of Michael Myers himself being beheaded in Halloween H2O. Well, that would be my number one if it was actually Michael. It would be the most impactful and cathartic death if that were the case, but since it's not, I'm just gonna say that my number one kill is from Halloween 4, where Michael is on top of the truck, reaches through the window, digs his fingers into the driver's neck, and just rips his head off with his bare hands. That's metal as fuck. But... Anyways, guys, that is my quick top 10 list of my favorite kills in the entire franchise. Make sure you let me know what yours are down below in the comments as well, and moving right along to our final review. All right, so I'm gonna go see Halloween Ends right now. I've heard not good things about it, but we're gonna see how it is. I brought a date with me too. <laughs> it's my mom. Hello. Anyway, so we're gonna go see Halloween Ends and uh, let you know how it is afterwards but I don't know hoping for the best I'm hoping because people think it's bad I'll think it's good because I usually think the opposite of what most yeah. people think so I don't know we'll see taking me because I love horror movies there you go <laughs> so you all right all right so we just got out of Halloween ends and uh, what'd you think well I didn't think it was that bad but I didn't think it was that good either <laughs> I think it, I would rate it an 8 out of a 10 the 8 out of 10 is pretty good though yeah but that's like a tier it was more like oh, yeah, movies they made back 
in the 80s and 90s, <laughs> not like movies they make today. It needed more. I don't more, know what that means. More pizzazz. It needed yeah. More... Not what it was like not built up to be. Yeah, yeah, not what it was built up to be. There's like a whole new main character that comes out of nowhere and we follow him and he's he's all right. He's interesting, I guess, but takes up too much of the movie. Yeah. I think. Yes. I don't, I don't the think... The ending was the best part of the movie. The Yeah, the ending's the best, but... Because actual My Michael Myers is there. Yeah, but it, it took so long to get there. I mean, like... Because the story about the kid, I don't know. I was I was into it at first. Like, I like the opening, mm -hmm. the, the opening scene. Yeah. I was like, oh, that's, well, yeah. what's, what's going to happen with that? Yeah. But then, like, as it went, I didn't buy, like, the love story and stuff. No. Yeah. No. It, it didn't really work for me. So, I don't know, man. I got to gather my thoughts, and I'll give you guys another <laughs> a full review. But that's first yeah. initial out of the theater. I mean, I wouldn't say don't see it. But I wouldn't have high expectations. Would but, you say rather stream it? Because if it, yes. you can watch it on streaming. Yeah, stream watch it. Watch it there and don't go to the theater. Yeah. Yeah, I'd probably have to agree. Yeah. <laughs> All yeah. right. Yeah. But yeah, that's it for now. So, I I saw Halloween Ends. I still love you, buddy. I still love you. All right, well, that time has finally come, everybody. Uh, I have been making this video for going on four weeks now. This is probably the longest project that I've ever done, and I have finally gotten around to seeing Halloween Ends, which technically came out yesterday. It's in theaters right now. It's also streaming on Peacock if you want to watch it. Um, and, and I'm sure you could find it other ways if you really want to. This is the end of the trilogy created by David Gordon Green and uh, Danny McBride. And I got to say, uh, after watching um, Halloween Ends, I, I will say this. I will say this. I don't think it's the worst Halloween movie. I still think Halloween Resurrection is the worst. I still think Rob Zombie's Halloween 2 is is right there with it. However, this is pretty much tied for Halloween 6 for me as being the third worst. So if you're wondering about the tier list, it would definitely be in D tier. I was thinking, you know, somewhat during the movie, I was like, this might be the first C tier. And there was a moment I was like, okay, we might up it to B tier. And by the end of the movie, it's it's definitely down in D tier. Um, this is going to be a very divisive movie. Uh, this is one that fans are going to be arguing about back and forth for years. This is a movie where I feel like several years from now, it'll find its core audience and there will be like a whole group of people that think it's one of the best Halloween movies. Um, I think you might be smoking crack, but I think that there will be that group of people. Uh, and after watching Halloween Kills, the polar opposite direction that Halloween Kills was as opposed to this movie. Now, I think Halloween Kills gets a bad rap. I don't really understand why people hate that movie as much as they do. Uh, I like the implications that it shows that Michael Myers has on the entire town of Haddonfield and how it turns people into their darkest selves. And so maybe that was the leaping off point going into this movie. But after watching this movie and thinking about it, I was like, I, there's really no point for this movie to be made. When you think about the main story that 2018 and Halloween Kills was building up, because this movie goes in a completely different direction and begins an entire new storyline with an entire new character. And if you are introducing a new character in the third movie of your trilogy, technically this would be the fourth movie in this timeline of Halloween films, but third movie in the new trilogy that just came out, if you're introducing a new character in the final movie, and then deciding to basically make them the lead character, that is very, very tricky business because you've already built up a storyline, you've already established major players within the story, and to just kind of veer off and follow somebody completely new, only to, in the last 10 minutes of this movie, basically pick up where you left off in Halloween Kills, it really feels like the rest of this movie was just to fill time, like just to fill the runtime 
and not really important to the overall narrative other than just saying that yes this town uh, dark things happen here and how the town views you and how you're viewed by society can lead into that as well but again that wasn't really michael myers's backstory from the get-go he was a child that just all of a sudden just decided that he was going to kill people it wasn't because society was pushing him that way even though in rob zombies remake they tried to you know come up with reasons of a horrible upbringing but again the more you explain it the the less enjoyable it is the major flaw with this movie is this is not the movie that was marketed to us this is not the movie that people are going to think that they're going to get everything that was building up within the last two films to lead into this movie was bringing us to the final confrontation between Laurie and michael myers and in the last movie michael myers was essentially the main character throughout the entire film and he kills so many fucking people throughout that entire movie highest body count in the entire franchise whereas in this movie uh straight up michael myers is barely in this movie barely in this movie i think i counted he had five scenes and three of those five scenes he's in it for less than two minutes less than a minute maybe of screen time which is just absolutely insane considering where the last movie left off it left off with laurie's daughter being killed and Lori vowing vengeance against Michael that she was going to find him and she was going to kill him. This movie picks up four years later in present time, 2022. And the craziest thing to me, right from the get-go, is that Lori is still living in Haddonfield. Now keep in mind, Michael Myers was never caught when he escaped in 2018. The last two movies took place during the same night. Michael Myers was never caught. And Lori just decides to stay in Haddonfield, number one, and live with her granddaughter now, Allison. Uh, so that was strange enough. But then also the movie begins, this movie actually starts with a cold opening of a brand new character named Corey who is babysitting this bratty kid uh, on the uh, the first year anniversary of the last time Michael Myers attacked. So in, the, in Halloween 2019. So he's babysitting this kid and the kid's like a bit of a dickhole to him, you know, and there's this whole segment where um, he goes into the other room, the kid disappears, a lamp falls over, and so you're thinking maybe Michael Myers is in the house, maybe something happened to the kid. The kid screams from upstairs. Babysitter goes up to check it out. Uh, when he goes into the attic, the door closes behind him and he's locked in the attic, but turns out it was just the kid playing a prank on him because the kid didn't respect his babysitter and he locked him in the attic. And as the kid's parents are coming home, he's in the attic, he's scared, he's kicking the door, and... The second the parents walk in, he kicks the door of the basement open, it smacks the kid in the face, and he falls off the banister and smashes on the floor, fucking breaking his neck and dying, basically having this babysitter kill a little kid in the very beginning of the movie. Completely accidental, completely a sympathetic character, and if you ask me, the kid kind of had it coming. But that's how the movie opens, and to be honest... I enjoyed this opening scene. I, I thought it was a big what the fuck moment. It was uh, it was very intense, you know, to just see like a small child just splatter on the ground and die in the beginning of the movie. Also, you knew that this guy didn't do it on purpose. So there was this moment where the opening was like, oh, I have, okay, what's this? I, I don't know what this is. But that's the thing is that going into this film, I didn't know that this movie was going to focus on a brand new character because this movie was marketed as the final confrontation between Laurie and Michael. Now, it turns out as the movie goes on, this is the main character that we focus on. Uh, and he got out of going to prison for the murder because it was accidental, but now the entire entire town hates him. And he's an outcast and he's and he's picked on and people judge him and they whisper to each other about him. And they create this whole uh, narrative about who this guy is and what a psychopath he is and that he's a child killer and yada, yada, yada. Uh, there's a group of high schoolers that are picking on him and whatnot. So, And that leads him into getting hurt which because uh, they, kind of, they kind of fuck him up and he scratches up his hand. And so that leads him – well, he he like grabs a bottle really hard and it, and it smashes within his hand because he's pissed off. And uh, Lori meets him. And then takes him to the hospital and introduces her him to her granddaughter, Allison, which in this movie, I don't – this is the thing that I – there are a couple of things that I just don't understand the direction that they wanted to go. They wanted to create this love story between this guy, Corey, and Allison 
and Lori introducing them. I, I don't know why she thought that was a good idea. Also, when they do meet, there's virtually no chemistry whatsoever. I didn't feel anything for these two characters, and I don't even understand why Allison is interested him in him in the first place. Like, it's one of those, you see this in movies all the time where like the goony weird guy all of a sudden has like a super hot chick that's into him out of nowhere. And they don't have any chemistry with each other whatsoever. And all of their dialogue to get to know each other is super cheesy. It's cringy. It's, and it goes on for a while. Like the first like 25 to 30 minutes of this movie is trying to like build up their relationship. And you're watching it just thinking like, is this a Michael Myers movie? Sorry, camera fucked up. Anyways, so you're watching it and you're thinking, is this a Michael Myers movie? Is this a Halloween movie? Because what you're showing me right now is the struggle of this character that was wrongly accused of doing something horrible that he did do but was unintentional. It was like, you know, if you like ran over somebody on the road or something like that. You know, you have these things happen in life. And that might be an interesting concept and an interesting movie and an interesting subject to dive into to see the psychology of somebody that, you know, accidentally murdered someone or a child no less and then what is their life like beyond that? How are they viewed by society? Great idea, great concept, but why is it in a Halloween Michael Myers movie, especially in a movie called Halloween Ends, especially in the third movie of a trilogy? This has no place being here. This has nothing to do with anything that they were building up. And, okay, so then there's the moment where Corey is attacked again by the high schoolers. Fucking high schoolers. They knock him off a bridge and he's dragged into the sewer. And you're like, oh shit. And so he's in the sewer. He's wandering around. And then finally... In the movie, I don't know how far into the film this is, like 35, 40 minutes, Michael Myers finally shows up. He's in the sewer, and he reaches out his hand to grab and strangle Corey, but then they have this weird moment where they lock eyes, and I am trying to wrap my head around the intention of this scene, because it could be that Michael Myers instinctively saw something in him, saw maybe the potential of evil, of darkness within him and decided to let him go. Uh, maybe he saw a similarity with himself, even though it makes no sense because Michael started his killing when he was like six years old and, you know, didn't have all these attachments and didn't have accidental killings and whatever. Completely different scenario. But maybe he saw something within him and that led him to let him go. Or maybe, uh, and this is the road that I really hope they weren't going down, Michael Myers like transferred part of his evil inside of him because it's this whole big moment like he grabs them they lock eyes the new john carpenter synthesizer score edit pumps in and you, from here on out he changes as a character when he leaves the sewer you know he kills a homeless guy by accident sort of and, and then he starts getting this interest in killing that just kind of comes out of nowhere after this moment. And so I don't know if they were attempting something supernatural here, if they were trying to talk about if this movie should actually be called The Curse of Michael Myers. This should be the real curse of Michael Myers. I don't know what it was, but it, it, it just it felt very odd, man. And then it went into a couple different directions where I didn't know where it was going to go because at first the guy, uh, Corey, brings – some guy that was kind of harassing him and Allison down into the sewer and he has Michael Myers kill the guy. So at first I'm thinking, okay, so is he like bringing Michael Myers victims? Is that how this movie's going to go? He's going to be like Michael's little helper? Is Michael just like really weak and depleted? And does Michael get stronger by killing people? Because they implied that in the last movie as a metaphor, but maybe they're taking it literally in this movie. So maybe Michael actually literally does get stronger the more he kills people and this guy is sort of like feeding him victims. Victims. But then they don't go in that row. Then there's another time. I just cut my hand on that shit. Then there's another time where uh, he goes back down in the sewer again and wrestles Michael Myers for his mask. So how weak is Michael Myers in this universe now? Like how weak is Michael Myers that he's going to allow somebody else to take his mask? And then and that's the only thing that motivates Michael Myers to get out of the sewer. He's like, ah, somebody took my mask. I guess I got to fucking go get it back. I don't know. Then, this movie does what it should not do, where Corey becomes basically the killer of this movie for quite some time. And, oh, isn't it ironic that he actually works at a car mechanic repair shop, so he already has a jumpsuit to look just like Michael Myers. So he takes Michael Myers' mask, wears the jumpsuit that he wears at work, and then, boom, you have Michael Myers 2.0. And I hate this shit because... 
you don't – if you go to see a Halloween movie or a Michael Myers movie, the last thing that you want to see is somebody else doing the killing. Why is my video fucking up again? It, it senses my rage. This is the worst idea that you can do in a slasher movie is not have your slasher be the killer. You know, they did this in Friday the 13th Part 5. The whole movie was a copycat Jason, and it was stupid. And they tried doing this and attempting this in other movies also, and it's the worst idea. But not only that, the kill count isn't that high. The kills aren't even that good. The only one that was kind of all right was the one at the radio shop where he cuts off the guy's tongue, but even that wasn't that great. And also, I don't care about this new character going around killing people. I don't care. I don't want to copycat Michael Myers. I don't want a Michael Myers part two. I don't want Michael transferring his evil into someone else. I don't want Michael Myers the next generation. None of that shit is good. None of that shit is ever good, especially when you're dealing with the final movie and this is supposed to be, again, the conclusion. Now, if this was a one-off, you know, whatever, maybe that would have worked better. But the fact that you are continuing a storyline that you set up two movies ago and then completely divert and do something different for the finale makes the finale lose weight. And that's exactly what happened because by the end of this film where uh, finally Corey goes in to kill Laurie Strode and she, you know, shoots him. But he, he does wind up killing himself, you know. Then, only then, in the final 10 minutes, does Michael show up to get his mask back and then there's the confrontation between Laurie and Michael. But... It's not nearly as great as it could be because, number one, it only takes place in one room, a kitchen, and is maybe like a two-minute scene. And also, this whole movie was not building up towards this. This whole movie was focusing on a completely different main character. Laurie kept mostly in the background. Michael Myers 100% kept in the background. So when you get to the finale of this movie... And you have Laurie versus Michael, which was the selling point, which was the trailers, which was the posters, which was the entire fucking franchise for 40 years building up to this moment. It just doesn't have the amount of weight that it should because it wasn't the movie. So you just sat through an hour and 40 minutes of something else. And now in the last 10 minutes, now you want to wrap up the storyline that you built two movies ago. Uh, they also don't deliver on a lot of other things, like uh, Sheriff Hawkins that was in the last two movies. They gave him a great setup and a great motivation as to why he wants revenge on Michael Myers. They did that entire flashback in the 70s, how he was there the night Michael got caught, how he accidentally shot his partner. He promised his partner Michael would die. In this movie, he, he again, he's barely in it. He's at a grocery store, and then he shows up at the very end after Michael is essentially already incapacitated. He does nothing. They don't do anything with this character. They built him up for two movies and completely ignored him in this movie, which I thought was bullshit. Uh, Lori, I mean, Jamie Lee Curtis is fine in the role. You know, she's fine. She plays herself. But uh, again, like all of the weight, all of the tension, all of the drama was sucked out of the confrontation between her and Michael because that's not what this movie was building up. It built up a completely new character to be a new villain, to be a new murderer, uh, to take on this role of Michael. And I don't understand why they would go that direction. And I'm trying to understand. You know, I'm really trying to understand because I know that the creators of this film are big Halloween franchise fans. That was the whole reason why they did it. And I know because of the care and attention they put into the last two movies, even if I thought H2O did it better, which, by the way, even after three movies now, I still think H2O did it better. Um of what they were trying to do with Lori and, you know, her facing her demons and her trauma and her vengeance and stuff like that. All of that was done better in H2O. Um, what was I saying? Oh, yeah, so I can't see how fans of horror movies and fans of Halloween and fans of the slasher genre, as they say that they are, would create a movie where Michael Myers takes a back seat to a new character to become a new killer. Don't understand. And it's not even like they were setting him up for future movies because he he is killed in this movie. I mean, I guess you could bring him back. Maybe you could just say he resurrected somehow. Also, the final fight with Laurie, uh, though of course I want to see her fight Michael, but I also have to be like, the suspension of disbelief is a little bit tough because she is like a 60-year-old woman at this point. Also, Michael's super strength seems to fluctuate with these movies because in Halloween 2018, Michael was capable of literally crushing a man's skull with his foot. It was in my top 10 favorite kills of the entire franchise. I loved it. 
in this movie, he steps on Lori's neck and he can't even keep her pinned down before she like struggles and gets out. So he can literally crush the skull of a full grown man, but he can't hold a 60 year old woman down. I don't understand that. Um, so lots of inconsistencies there. And I don't even think the creators of this movie understood if they wanted Michael to be a human or if they wanted him to be something beyond human. Because it seemed like in Halloween Kills, they were going for the beyond human. And it seemed like in this movie, they wanted to backtrack. And now he's just kind of a feeble old man living in the sewer. Uh, yet he still has the strength to stab somebody and pin them to the wall. But he doesn't have the strength to keep Laurie Strode on the ground or like get off of the table once he's been stabbed on it. So, yeah, they do kill Michael Myers at the end of this movie also. They, uh, she, um, she stabs his hands, like, crucifies him to the kitchen table, slits his throat, cuts his wrist, and then they basically, like, strap him to a car. And I was, I was down for, like, the public execution thing. I thought that was a good idea. One of the, uh, one of the few things I enjoyed about this movie was I liked the idea of the entire town of Haddonfield coming to the execution of Michael. I thought that was very fitting, and they put him into this grinder, and literally he just, like, turns into mush. Like, he's dead. He's definitively dead. You know that rule that they had where you couldn't kill Michael Myers? Well, that's gone, all right? So in this movie, he is definitively dead. In this universe, he is dead. He is 100... By the end of this movie, he is 100% dead. You see it happen on screen. He becomes fucking like mincemeat like grounded up beef that's what he is at the end of this movie so uh if they try to continue it they have no choice but to go into the supernatural direction and, and have him be like a an entity or an evil or have somebody else get possessed but we don't want that we want michael myers and this movie barely gave us any michael myers the only reason i'm saying it's better than resurrection is because again that tried to do something creative and different i suppose uh, Michael, when he is on screen, is still cool. Like, Michael is still very imposing and, like, you know, he's Michael Myers, but he's just barely in the movie. Uh, and I think it's better than Rob Zombie's Halloween 2 because that movie was just batshit garbage that every, you know, minute of that movie was misery to watch, whereas I think Halloween Ends at least has a couple of good scenes, a couple of good moments, you know, the final confrontation is at least fun to watch. The opening scene without knowing where the movie's going to go is interesting. Um, the music is great. The music is still good. But beyond that, I I got to say that I am severely disappointed with the finale of this franchise. That's 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 what I have to say, man. And you know, I really hate to end like this because this is such a journey. And if you've watched this video from the beginning to now, especially if you've watched it in one sitting, I have nothing but gratitude to give you, man. Thank you so much for watching this video. This has been um, a project that I am taking a risk on. I really don't know how people are going to respond to this video. My main niche on this channel is talking about manga and anime. Uh, I do review movies all the time, but listen, I'll be honest, you guys, like, it's really, really difficult sometimes because there's so many different kinds of videos I want to make and so much different content I want to cover. And I really only get decent views on when I cover Berserk. And Berserk is my favorite fictional story and my favorite manga of all time. I have no problem talking about Berserk forever, but obviously like, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a full person with many interests and many desires and many uh, many niches that I love, many stories that I love, many types of fiction that I love. And so I want to talk about it all. And that's what I do on this channel. I talk about it all. But most of my videos don't get that kind of attention or that kind of views. And so sometimes it can feel like I can put a lot of work into something and it just kind of crashes and burns and nobody cares. And you know, Berserk video, like 20,000, 30,000 views. And then a video about anything else is 1,000, 2,000. So it can get uh, pretty discouraging sometimes, you know, when I want to talk about different things or do other videos, but I'm not going to let that stop me. You know, I'm always going to make the kind of content I want to make. And, uh, you know, some of my favorite content creators from back in the day, you know, obviously like James Rolfe, who did the, uh, you know, Angry Video Game Nerd and reviews a bunch of movies. And, uh, you know, uh, there's other reviewers out there I really enjoy also that do this kind of stuff, that do this kind of long form deep dive, you know, full series analysis style videos. And I wanted to do something like that. It's something that I enjoy watching. So I wanted to make it. 
And Halloween is a series that I've always wanted to do it for because I felt like I had so much to say. You know, I had so much to say about the original and Halloween 3 and Halloween 6 and Resurrection and Rob Zombie's Halloween and all of these movies that have such controversial opinions. Like, if you can say anything about the Halloween franchise, it's that nobody feels the same way about the whole franchise. Like, everyone has different favorites. Everyone has a different timeline that's their favorite. Everyone has a different version that they like of Michael Myers. And so it's really one of the funnest series to talk about because everyone's ranking is different. You know, even if you rank, like, Friday the 13th, most people will put, like, part six at the top. Makes sense. You know, even if you rank Nightmare on Elm Street, the original, New Nightmare, you know, a lot of people feel the same way about all, most of the films. But with Halloween, you ask any Halloween fan and their ranking of the movies is completely different. Uh, I am a horror fan at heart. You know, I always grew up watching horror movies. I love it. I love Michael Myers. He's my favorite slasher by far. And, uh, you know, I was very attached to this series, as I've said many times. And so this was the video I really, really wanted to make. So I wanted to take the time and do it and do it right, spend the time on it and uh, you know, whether or not it pays off at the end, you know, whether or not people watch it, people like it, or, you know, if I manage to make any money off of it, if I wasted the last four weeks of my life, it's fine because this is just something I really wanted to do. This is something I was passionate about and I wanted to try something different on this channel, do something different and do a video that truly I have been waiting to make for a long time. This is something I thought last year maybe I should make or the year before maybe I should make. And I thought, thought Halloween Ends comes out this, you know, it's the perfect time to do it. So I, I just decided to. So anyways, what I really want to say to wrap up this video is just that if you have watched this far or if you've watched the entire video or if you support me beyond just berserk content and, and uh, you like the other stuff that I do or you like the other things that I have to say, I just really, truly, 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 thank, truly do thank you and, and really appreciate it from the bottom of my heart. You know, I, uh, I've been doing YouTube full-time for uh, six months now, you know. My light just <laughs> fell. Um, and it's been okay. You know, I've been, managed to stay afloat. I've managed to keep paying my mortgage month to month. But, you know, I, I'm not going to lie that it's difficult and stressful. And I never know, you know, what I'm going to make month to month. I never know how a video is going to do. You know, when I see the views start to tank over and over, it does make me nervous. Um, it's definitely not a job that's... For, uh, what do I want to say? Like the faint of heart, like, you know, it, like I can't just punch in, you know, half ass it for eight hours, go home and know exactly how much money I'm going to make. No, I, I mean, I could, <laughs> I could work <laughs> so hard on a video and have it just not matter. You know, uh, the amount of time and attention and, and passion I put into something literally does not matter. All that matters is like the views as far as like keeping me afloat and like having it be a job. But what matters, um, you know, artistically or just like from what I enjoy doing is this, it is trying these experimental things, it is doing something a little bit different. So it's a tricky thing that you got to balance. Um, you know, you got to balance being able to stay afloat and keep money in the bank and pay your bills, you know, as an adult. It's just the most important thing. But then you also have to keep yourself creative and free. And my thing is like, I just want to just be able to do stuff like this at, at times if I want to. Just just create a fucking super long video about a horror franchise and then have people like it. You know, that would be amazing to me uh, alongside just the regular content I do. So, yeah, so thank you guys so much. I don't need this to go on any longer, I suppose. And, you know, someday there will be another Halloween film. And when that day comes... You can be guaranteed that I will review it and that it will be better than Halloween ends. <laughs> Maybe. I don't want to say that. I don't want to jinx it and then actually have something come out worse. Uh, I love you guys, man. Listen, uh, if you want to support the channel in any other way, you know I have a Patreon link down below. I also do have channel memberships of the channel turned on now that you can subscribe to for some exclusive content. So you can check that out. Um, I have a merch store as well. I have a couple of different shirts in there if you'd like to buy some. And uh, other than that, I keep dr I keep like dragging this on, don't I? Oh man, it's just so hard to end a video this long. I'm like, fuck. I've been working on this for weeks. I don't know what to do with myself now. I might have to do the Hellraiser series. I'm just, I'm not fucking doing that. Um, I love you guys. Peace out. Thank you so much for the support. And happy Halloween.
trick or treat, motherfucker.